Hey. Welcome back to Medball Grand. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. It is March 26, 2024, another Tuesday stream. The week after Rebellion Without Rehearsal, it's been out for a week and a day. We've solved the meta. It is Thunderbolt Armaments the whole time. How's everyone doing? We're starting a bit early today. Uh, we have a GNK at 5.30 p.m. Apparently, that's a legal time. You can start an event 5.30 p.m. When I'm meant to eat dinner, Nick. When, Nick? Um, I'm excited. I haven't played in person play in a long time, so what well, the stream's gonna end about four so I can get dinner and build a deck or sleeve a deck. And I'm hoping by the end of today I'll know what to bring. Because I don't know what to bring to the event, and it gives me consternation. I always get worried. It hurt it like I feel it. I feel it. Whenever it's like you gotta bring the right deck, man, you bring the wrong deck, you're gonna F it up. You're gonna have a terrible time. So um, please give me your uh, advice. It won't be Thunderbolt, I don't think. Probably not. But that's what today is about. Let me catch up on chat. Firstly, Lucille, in chat, like, way before the stream, sneaking in before the stream to wonder if you found secret Thunderbolt tech. No, I haven't. I've been, uh, I tr I've, I've tried to record a whole bunch of Thunderbolt yesterday to get a video together because we're not going to be here on Thursday. We're going to pop out for a bit, so there's no stream on Thursday. I thought we'd get a video up. And I recorded for, like, four hours, maybe, of Thunderbolt gameplay. I'm winning more than I'm losing, but let me tell you, Thunderbolt seems like the worst thing you can possibly do to yourself. It is aggressively bad. And today we're going to talk about why we're going to explore it together, and we're going to come up with some potentially some ideas of how to and not to play Thunderbolt. Are you missing both Corp and Runner or just one side? Technically, yo, Gus, this how's it going? I'm technically missing both sides. I'm probably going to play a Seb list, the one that I played on stream. I made one change. I think I dropped one card and added another copy of... Uh, I do think you probably do want to play three copies of Hannah just because she's one of your best on-tempo like cards in the sort of more fast matchups. Or like when you play against PD, dropping Hannah turn one in and checking the remote server is like one of the best things you can do because even if you get the tag, you're pretty happy. Uh, so I think that's okay. Mind you, shout out. This is uh, Jai's list, right? Yeah. Um, 0 0.11. I like that there's some honest... Only two games. We're going to publish the list. Okay, Jai. I guess you can do that. You're allowed to do that. No one stops you from doing that. Uh, but yeah, this sub list is different than what I was playing in some ways. It's playing one class act, which like Jai goes out the way to say you should do it, which I don't want to play a five influence card. I don't, Jai. I'm going to be really, really aggressive today it seems oh boy hey stab tabby woo metro time cinder and has is going as well my sick thunderbolt tech is mirage magnus the robot how's it going hey did we play yesterday that i that icon looks kind of similar to somebody played with a different name maybe it's not how's it going by the way mirage i looked at because i looked at all the cards i res and derez and like mirage is it's really frustrating right now okay so mirage seems like a bit of a joke of a card mirage like doesn't seem very good. And it says, uh, if the runner breaks a printed Sabertina Mirage, they, okay, let's not read that. Uh, they are now running archives instead of passing the ice. So if you break it, whoop, you're out. However, they may jack out on archives. And after they break the Sabertina, you de-res the Mirage. So you're forced to res the Mirage over and over and over again. Now, Mirage is just a code gate. It has no strength. It's very easy to break. Most icebreakers break it for one. And if Sabertina says you may draw one card, then shuffle one card from HQ into R&D. Mirage actually was a tech card for like a minor point in time. It actually saw consistent play in a bunch of decks. And that's because one of the strongest win conditions for a while was indexing. And indexing was this idea of run R&D, rearrange the top five, right? Like it's mostly the same text on the top of Cataloger, except it's a run event. And you look at five instead of four. But the thing to me with the design of Cataloger that's been a bit frustrating is there's not a lot of counterplay, it seems to it. With indexing, you'd actually not res the Mirage until they ran back, and then you'd run the, res the Mirage. And unless they could bypass the Mirage, if they let the subroutine fire, you shuffled the deck. And if they broke it, they'd have to run back and immediately get to res the Mirage again. But it was a, like a neat card because it had interactions with like a stacked deck. And there were small amounts of decks in which that mattered. Mind you, Insight top hat combos also, but those weren't that popular. Uh, right now, Cataloger, I don't think there's a lot of counterplay to it. I don't think there's a lot of intelligent counterplay to Cataloger. Once a Cataloger comes down, besides like having a Jackson Howard on the table, or sorry, Spin Doctor, I think you're cooked, which is upsetting. There's just a lot harder, it's way harder to play around this thing I'm finding than indexing. And indexing, there's a way more angles of approach. That's genuinely annoying with Vovo. Hey, H-Bar. Yeah, Vovo's nice. Vovo's like the best Thunderbolt card by a country mile that I'm playing three of. I don't see how you can play Thunderbolt without 3x Vovo. Hey, Eric, I am too a deck choice consternation haver. Oh man, it's rough, isn't it? I don't feel like we're in the worst meta where if you pick the like the wrong deck, you're going to have a bad time. But like, 
you want to pick the fun deck. You want to pick the right deck. You know what I mean? Like, you still want to nail it. But it's not. There are some metas where you pick the wrong deck. You just lost before the game started. We're lucky. I don't think we're at that point. Hey, Andrea, how's it going? Hey, hey. Seems kind of rough and standard, but from what I have seen, it seems a lot better and started with no turbine. Also, hello, Andre. Hey, turbine is definitely a thing. Uh, turbine is still out there. I don't know if so far what corpse are doing is addressing turbine in any meaningful way. I think startups in a weird spot. I haven't like actualized what the, the card pool is because obviously it's changed. Startup just had a rotation, but I'm pretty excited to see uh, what startup looks like. Hey, Taddy gritted up on a Tuesday afternoon. Look at us. Just a classic Tuesday stream. Two hand is wild to me, especially for RT lists. In the most common DJ target, it would play six if I could. Yeah, I agree. I was only on two Hannah because I thought it was a bit niche. But like using Hannah is just like a tempo bump and like admittedly a pretty slow deck uh, is not bad. Like if you can install her clicklessly, use her ability, get a tag, install something clicklessly, and then just remove one tag the same turn. Like, yeah, she seems fine. Like she actually is comparable to friend of a friend. So we'll see. I'm going to meet Pycat. She was NPC. Yeah, I saw. So NPC had the first event this weekend. There was like 30, 40 players. I don't want to dive too deep into it because we're probably going to have some of the gameplay stuff on this channel in the near future. So I don't want to spoil the results. You can look if you want. It's all on Always Be Running. It was like cut to top eight single elimination, which I've never seen before. Was that because of like time restraints? Because it was always it was a single day event, mind you. It's hard to do a top cut top eight in the single day after Swiss. Like that is a lot of Netrunner. Um, speaking of PyCat, PyCat joined the Montreal also, the Montreal Discord server, and I got to share with them a picture of Nanako and with the, with the PyCat art, the bird art behind it. And, uh, I was really happy to be able to share that. Corpse side play R plus with Lotus Field just to mess with Sevs. Hey guy, how's it going? Um, yeah, Lotus Field is like the, one of the few cards in this, in the whole game right now that beats Ahusera's crew. I think it's Ahusera's crew. Pronunciation guide still not out yet, but I've seen some like preliminary ones that were given out for like AMT casters. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'm happy to play Lotus Field though, but I guess you can. You definitely can. You just break it with Leech. No, you can't. <laughs> hey, Alroth, it's going well. How are you doing? Consider Basalt Monolith. Pretty fun to set, let them stack the deck, then just kill the agenda they put on top. Yes, there's some weird ones like Basalt Spireworks stab. You're totally right. Obviously, Spin Doctor works, Alice Counter works. The thing is, like, there's even interesting ways that you can beat those, right? Like, I, I played against an opponent that I thought did this. Say you look at four, and you know there's a spin doctor on the table, or you think there's a spin doctor, you should put the agenda on card three. So when they res the spin doctor, they draw two cards, and then you pretend you fake them out, but then still there, the, right? Like, check this out. This is so wild to me. So say that you see there's a spin doctor you think on the table, and you see four cards. You see one agenda. Where do you put the agenda? If you put it on the top, after you finish the catalog, you say action. And they should res a spin doctor, draw the agenda into hand, and shuffle. That's, like, not great for you because now they have agenda, especially if they're jamming in a remote server because you're trying to lock R&D. But they could think you're bluffing and not. But I think with a spin doctor, you probably can't allow the bluff, especially when it's game point. Like, I think you just shuffle with the spin doctor. So then is the right play to put it on the third card? So when they res a spin doctor, they draw card one and two and it leaves the agenda on top of the deck. Now you can pretend, and if you're an actor, you could be like, ha ha ha, I joked. There was nothing there. I forced you to res a spin doctor. But they still have to shuffle the spin doctor because now there's threat that the agenda is the now the top card of the deck and you can just click to access it. So like the right play against Cataloger, unless like we're really deep into Yomi spaces, res spin doctor shuffle, almost regardless of what the runner does, the runner just should not put the agenda in the top two cards. That would be strictly wrong unless they don't know you have a spin doctor. And you're right, Basalt Spire. If you're playing around Basalt Spire though, you just put a one card down and you ask, do you want to do something? They Basalt Spire, so they trash the top card of the deck and then you just access it anyways, right? Like it comes down to like this like very direct bluff double bluff game where it's like, if I know they have a Basalt Spire, I won't put it on card one, I'll put it on card two. And I'll say accent, action, and then they'll basalt spire, and then I'll just hit this button. Right? Like, it's hard to beat that. Now, you could bluff. If you put it on top, though, now it's in archives. They have to add it to hand. So it's still in HQ. You just run HQ if you can. Like, it's really difficult. It's genuinely kind of difficult to deal with it. Uh, I don't feel like there's a lot of counterplay compared to indexing. Hey, it's really Tuesday. Kata, how's it going? So watching last Tuesday slash Friday's stream. PAX East made it hard to keep up. Yo, how was PAX East? Did you have a good time? Did you go out? I know uh, Pat, Pat is... Is still maybe in the area i think he was out there 32 players single limb just for time yeah that's what i thought it's pretty hardcore single elimination top cuts are very very difficult uh i appreciate double elimination you can just get one bad beat and you're out of it but eight players down to like four players after a single round is pretty wild to beat catalogers simply score a flower sermon it couldn't be easier it doesn't even work jua for sebs jua is not bad I was unfortunately catching up on Jua and didn't realize it says two cards if able. So if they don't have two cards. The text on this doesn't actually do anything besides this text is good. But Jua is a bit better than it looks. 
there's a lot of installed based runners um even like hitting this with arasana is cool because then arasana has to do something before she goes past this and that can make it awkward uh obviously quite quite not too bad with some of the new advancement tokens hey matt but not advancing corp cards are there going to be some cool iswak decks i don't think so i think okay there could be if you ask me, my um, when I look at things, it's generally how I look at things from competitive Netrunner. Very specifically, when it comes to competitive Netrunner, Isawak doesn't make a lot of sense. And that's because it's like a game state thing, sort of. If I have multiple cards on the table that all have advancements on it, and then we've used some of the other cards that add advancements, and some of them are actually pretty tricky, right? Like Hearts and Minds is very trashable, and there's no real good way to protect it. In fact, you can't protect it. Like, that's not great. Now, you have business as usual, of course. That's, like, not bad. And that's a good Isawak card, for sure. Uh, but it's kind of hard. A lot of the, like, advancement moving cards are, like, one-twos that don't protect themselves that you can't ice up. So it's tricky to make those work. But the way that I always look at Isawak to me, which is a problem with Isawak, is that generally with Isawak, you want to have multiple cards on the table with advancements on them. And then the payoff for that is that you can win on two agenda scores. So if you're playing just like shell game trap Jinteki, having two advanced cards on the table, the risk of that being lethal for the runner and through lethality you win the game is much more consistent than the lethality of Isawak getting to seven points. Now you might be able to say, right, like I can build an Isawak deck that can like threaten getting to seven points but can also threaten having some sort of you know clearing houses on the table and at the end of the day pe just doing incidental damage on every central server access where they steal agendas the fact that like when you steal the uh the quad advanced uh what's it called what's the one that hurts you fuji does an additional damage so you can kill with a single neuro spike like making your traps more lethal on the table is generally a better payoff to me where i'd rather have my traps have a higher high than to be able to have a couple traps survive just so I can get to points basically just getting to points is like generally not the most direct win condition for any deck now yeah Holloman Holloman's a good shout out house how's it going by the way like Holloman is a card that places advancements and so there's abstractly a world where Holloman Iswak makes more sense and a glacier build like a Lacosta Holloman Iswak my guess is that those sort of decks are faster and need to keep you out of their mode server enough and aren't looking so much like trap decks that it is hard for Isawak's ability, which is potentially pretty strong, like score one fewer agenda kind of makes sense, but only if you're scoring two three pointers, like if you're specifically scoring two three pointers, Isawak's makes sense. As soon as you add two pointers to that list, it's not very good. Um, but I would be surprised if like playing Ag Infusion or Atea or anything that just makes, you know, ice and the board state more difficult is more impactful than this. Getting a free agenda point is good. But it doesn't help you get the free agenda point. You know what I mean? There are a few Iswak players in Fight Club. They did pretty well. Yeah, cool. I saw some some Iswak. I think I saw some Islak lists. I'm pretty sure I did. For what it's worth, Fight Club is actually like really different. Now, that doesn't mean that Iswak is terrible, but Fight Club is uh, a known meta, right? Like you kind of go into Fight Club understanding what you think people are going to bring. And it's it's a bit different than like when you're going to a meta where you know, you know, 90% of the meta can be Imp Lu. And I'm not saying Imp Lu is a bad match to Iswak specifically, but Fight Club is its own environment that it's hard to like take ideas you see from Fight Club and extract them generally to the like JNet casual meta or whatever. It did beat Imp Lu. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So mixed bag. It's mixed bag. I definitely think there's support for Iswak, but I don't think out of like all the Gentechis available, Iswak would be the one of the last ones I would be excited to try out. That doesn't mean that you can't win games with it. It's just like, I think a Tay is going to be more interesting. I always played Isawak with one big scoring server that I throw a 5-3 into and cheat out next turn. Hey, Doodle Light, how's it going? And if the runner dares to run it and try to steal it, you punitive them? I think punitive is really bad right now. Like, incredibly bad. Now, admittedly, when you play punitive in Isawak, we saw as the Canadian Nationals. Shout out to Sven, who's playing punitive Isawak. He killed a lot of people because nobody expects punitive in Isawak, and I think that's totally fine. Are you going to get a problem once you get to the top cut and, like, there's open deck lists? Yes, but a lot of people just like to get to the top cut. That's enough. But if you ask me right now, I think punitive is in a really bad spot, just generally, on the fact that like disruption is incredibly common. There's a lot of imp blue decks, burners now the new hotness, of course. I don't think people are actually playing that many copies of Cupulation, but Stone Ship Chart Room is seeing more play across a lot of decks because of charge synergy, let alone it's a good card. Obviously, Steel Skin Scarring is as popular as it ever has been. Audrey is a problem. It's really hard to kill someone with Audrey because they can just play their Steel Skin clicklessly. It's um it's really hard to punitive, but I do think if you play punitive in Iswak, yeah, you'd get me. I'm definitely not playing around punitive in Iswak. That's for sure. One X Swordsman was pretty. Putting in a huge amount of work. Yeah, Swordsman's good. I think Swordsman's pretty good. Pax was fun. Saw lots of VGs and almost convinced multiple fab players to check out Netrunner. Demoed a game called Compile that's threatening to outtake Radlands as my go-to fast 1v1 game. 
compile. 1v1 card game. I don't know if it, this is it. This one has a really high score. It's probably this one, Cattle, right? 2024 comes in a box. Looks like Netrunner. It's probably this one. Take a look at it. Looks like it's made by a small team. Yeah, that one. Cool. Cattle, why is it cool? Competing AI stack themed ideas to complete three protocols quickly. Okay. I've never seen a BGG write up with different font that's pretty fun all right but today today we talk about thunderbolt and uh let's actually talk about the hp cards i think we have to start here because i think i've i've i'll want to show you i spent a bunch of time playing thunderbolt yesterday um i think our stats are not correct how many games did i play five or six yeah technically we won four one of them did not complete so we played six games with thunderbolt we learned a bit about thunderbolt so i can tell you some stuff about thunderbolt i'll show you the deck that we ended up playing which i don't think is particularly stellar and it has some issues but i think fundamentally thunderbolt has some issues is a nice way of putting it that we have to tackle together so this is the thunderbolt list that it came down to and i don't think i did the best job uh so together we can talk about what we can do to change the list and what we can do to move things around so in short we are playing a generalist hb deck you coming to GNK? Yo, Steven, yeah, I'm coming to the GNK. I don't know what to play, though. I need to sort it out during this stream. It's probably not Thunderbolt, but this is where we're starting. So, okay, let's let's jump between the idea and what we're playing here. Actually, I think we can do this. This actually might be easier. Hold on. So if I do this, I go here, and then I go, hold on. I've got a couple buttons to hit. Hold on. We're going to hit all the buttons in the right order. Okay, animation failed, but that's good. This is Thunderbolt, right? Has anyone played it? It's so a 4515, so pretty generalist. It says, whenever you res a piece of AP or destroyer ice during a run, that ice gets plus one strength and gains end the run unless the runner trashes one of their installed cards after its other subroutines for the remainder of that run. At least one tributary should be in a Thunderbolt. Diogen, I had a tributary. I felt bad about it. We'll talk about it. Because I think in some ways tributary is good, but in other ways tributary is really bad. Because tributary has the issue that you don't want Thunderbolt to have. I think you on the NPC Discord the best to get the footage to you. Oh, yo, Cinderin, I missed that. I must check that. Thank you. Okay. So, Thunderbolt. What does it do? It says when you res AP or Destroyer Ice, and without going out the way, there's some pretty good AP and or Destroyer Ice, mostly Destroyer Ice, in the HP faction. Now, that means you're probably going to be spending influence on Ice. You'll notice that I barely do. In fact, Stavka is really important for this list. We probably should be playing three. But inherently, there's enough Ice in faction, but most decks are not defined by AP or Destroyer Ice. The sort of decks are defined by AP Ice or generally Jinteki decks because it's hard to make damage matter unless damage is a big part of your game plan. It's a sort of issue that I know I've been bringing up with Jinteki decks where it's like most Jinteki Ice does net damage. And unless is your game plan actually cares about net damage, it's hard to put incidental net damage into your deck because at the end of the day, while it's still a good tempo proposition, you're taking cards out of the runner's hand, their cards are probably good. They put them in their deck for some reason. It's hard to make that a win condition. So putting a bunch of AP Ice into the deck could work, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really. Now, notice this says whenever you res a piece of AP or destroyer ice, then it gets a buff. It gets a plus one strength buff. I've talked about how I don't love the strength buffs. And it gives another subroutine, which is not bad. On average, that means that the runner is going to play at least two credits to break it, something like that. That's interesting. Uh, but how often do you res ice? This is a really big problem. How often do you res ice in an HP game plan? There's a lot of HP games in which you inherently just res six pieces of ice, maybe seven, right? six pieces of ice you res in a game. So your ability will fire maybe six times. Now, that being said, its existence changes how the runner plays in a way that's not very obvious. Uh, so the fact that they might not want to face check because they're worried about an eight strength Stavka, like there's some truth to that. But at the end of the day, you only end up resing like six pieces of ice through most games. And so having that be relevant text, you really have to build into it. If you build a generalist HB deck and only res six ice, you should play anything else possible. And that's okay. That means we have to build into this thing, but that inherently means we have to be de-resing our ice. Now, HB has a lot of de-res synergy throughout the set, or through not, not specifically this set, but throughout most sets for the last little while. But a lot of the HB de-res synergy that we've been seeing, specifically when it comes to like the mid Borealis cycle, is not AP or Destroyer. When we look at the harmonics ice, we have Bloop, which is not a good ice to be de-resing. That is the only AP, or I think it's both AP and Destroyer ice, and that's a good AP or Destroyer ice. But Bloop requires you to be playing things like Echo, Wave, and Pulse. Let's talk about those. Echo, Wave, and Pulse, mind you, the harmonic ice, are good, and they work really well with de-res. But you also notice that they're kind of anti-synergistic as a whole with RID. 
Because while de-resing an Echo is good, it has no ability, it has no interaction with Thunderbolt as a whole. So we end up in this really weird spot where there's a lot of good ice that you do want to de-res. And you'll notice the deck list, which I've now closed, you'll see it again. There's a lot of good things in HP to be de-resing. De-resing a Gatekeeper is good. De-resing a Magnet is good. There's reasons you want to de-res stuff. One of the best de-res targets, especially in the late game, is an Ablative Barrier. But as you'll notice, none of this stuff is AP or Destroyer. None of it. And that's a problem. <laughs> that is a real big problem. Let's look at the AP or Destroyer ice that we have access to. So let's do S Destroyer. Uh, let's just do F Faction HB Z Standard. So let's not spend influence at all so far. Would Stego help you? Yes. Stego would help you here. And Diogen, this is a bit of a spoiler of the reveal we're getting to here, but I think the best Thunderbolt deck is not in Thunderbolt. It is just play Stegodon in another HB faction. Because inherently, nothing that we're doing with the good ice that is worth de-resing interacts with Thunderbolt in any meaningful way. I figured this out of a fair bit of testing. We'll see if we're wrong here, but my hypothesis is the best Thunderbolt deck doesn't play Thunderbolt because it's really, really bad. Because this is what AP and Destroyer Ice looks like. Uh, I don't think we can search both. This is Destroyer Ice. And you notice Destroyer Ice inherently is actually incredibly expensive. The cheapest Destroyer Ice in faction is Lycian Mun Multi Munitions, which also seems like a shoe in for a Thunderbolt deck. And I'd argue it's still pretty bad in there for reasons we'll talk about in a second, mostly because of, unfortunately, it doesn't do anything really good when it comes to, uh, uh, to uh, Stegadon. But all of these ice are incredibly expensive. So you're right, Ansel is nice. Ansel for one turn being five strength with a different extra additional subroutine on it is not bad. It means that the runner can't straight click through it. There's another subroutine they have to deal with, but that's not bad. But now ask yourself, how often can you de-res an Ansel? And you realize the answer is zero times. You cannot de-res any of this ice because all this ice is incredibly expensive. It is super expensive. You cannot, firstly, you can consider playing like tier because obviously that's fun, but Kamali is similar to Ancel, but a bit worse. The subroutines are not as good. Same thing with uh, Z 2.0, it's it's okay. Bloop is hard thing to de-res because you have to play other harmonics and then Thunderbolt doesn't make that much sense. But none of this ice is worth de-resing because paying eight credits to res two Sorakaman blades for an extra strength and an extra pseudo and the run subroutine is not good. Now let's look at AP, because AP and HB, I don't think we have anything. I did that wrong. Let me catch up on chat in a second. Oh, I really did this bad. So this is AP ice, same issue. You notice all of it is incredibly expensive. The cheapest is four on Jaguar Rundi. We have no real reason to de-res a Jaguar Rundi. Mind you, Bloop is a good target. Carl at five. You cannot res this twice. None of this stuff is worth de-resing, period. It's just unfortunate. <laughs> None of this stuff is worth de-resing. We have no ice that has an on-res effect on AP or Destroyer besides Hakarl. And arguably Bloop, as much as Bloop, you have to build into her harmonics. Bloop is brutal if you have a Stegadon scored. Yes, Bloop is brutal. But this is the point, is that if you have a Stegadon scored, why are we playing Thunderbolt? Because we probably should just be playing an HB identity that gives us some sort of passive value to forward the fact that we're playing harmonics and we have to generally build wide. Because Stegadon, mind you, is also good with building wide. We'll get to this in a second, but it doesn't really work. Hey, AP Destroyer gets both. Yeah, that does work. However, you get some false positives here because you start hitting Trap because Trap has AP in it. I wonder if there's a way to like play around that. This is now all the AP ice. Now, some of this stuff is banned and there's false positives here, but these are the AP and destroyer ice. And we're going to highlight the ice in which is worth de-resing. And you'll notice that the count is tiny. It's minute. There are some high highs, but some of these are minute. Like Anansi. You could play Anansi for four influence in your deck, but you res it once. So do we need to make Anansi six strength with an additional subroutine for one encounter? No, it's probably not a good reason to play Thunderbolt. Let's look at some of the other stuff. Sisenton. Sisenton, should we de-res Sisenton? Almost never. But again, the fact that you can face check and die to a Sisenton HB, like, that's a nice little, I guess, wrinkle to this conversation. And then things that are genuinely interesting, Anemone. Anemone is one of the few APIs that's worth de-resing because obviously it's toxic. Now, can you make an HB deck that wins by constantly spamming damage? Probably. You probably can. I'd argue that if it works, it's pretty unhealthy, uh, but you probably could. So keep that in mind. This is one of the very few ice that is actually worth de-resing. Ivik? No. As much as if you have 700 code gates, it's pretty cheap to de-res, but there's no good reason to do it. Stavka is one of the best reasons. De-resing Stavka actually matters. And this is what I mean when we're looking at Thunderbolt. We have to find actually matters cases because de-resing a Stavka and re-resing it gives you plus six strength. Having a 3 17 8 strength sentry that can be game winning against certain boards is actually really important. And these are the sort of cards that make Thunderbolt make more sense. But again, I'd argue 
the power of D-Res and Gustavka is not attached to Thunderbolt, giving it plus one strength and one subroutine. The power of D-Res and Gustavka is just good enough on its own. And this is the issue, is that I think if you play Stegadon in another HB deck, you'll have a more consistent and better deck in general because you don't need to add another strength, another subroutine to Stavka. It's still a Stavka, right? Like, that's really quite good. Lycian, Sorakabin, not very good. Boto, you can just play Brand and Faction. I don't know why you'd have to spend influence on that. It's like Brand. And then you'll notice that none of these are worth derezzing. They're all incredibly expensive. Some of these are false positives. Like this technically is a trap and AP, but I think trap ice shows up. Diviner is the closest we have it to it, to something that you could cheaply derez, but at the end of the day, it's still Diviner. Uh, making it have one more strength doesn't really do anything. Ballista is like okay, but you can't really afford to derez a Ballista. And when you have Ancel in faction, it really doesn't make sense. There's no reason to derez Swordsman. Tithe. Tithe is a standout. Tithe is very uniquely a card that is worth derezzing. Cloud Eater is worth derezzing? Hey, Tron. Yeah, sort of, but good luck affording it twice. Um, Tithe is kind of cool, and Tithe is in some ways one of the coolest ice and Thunderbolts, because when you res it, it being two strength and having three subroutines is kind of mean. However, you run into other issues, where by the time that you have a Tithe on the table, and by the time you're able to derez a Tithe because you have a Brasilia grid set up or you've scored a Stegodon, that is the point in time where the runner can break this. So you're right, it makes it annoying, but for most breaker suites, you break Tithe for one additional credit if you feel like you need to break that last subroutine, if at all. So that's the problem with Tithe. It's so um, dependent on board state and time, because you're right, as the early face check, it's, it's annoying. It's not good to put on HQ, it's good to put an R&D in the early game, but by the time that you're consistently able to derez the Tithe, is about the point in the game where the runner can break it somewhat trivially. So keep that in mind. And mind you, sometimes it's worth just having a cheap D-Res and a cheap Res to power up some of your other stuff. Like you need to D-Res things if you're playing Stegadon. But by the time that Tithe actually does something and is a bit more weaponized, it's the point in the time where people can break it. So it's like not stellar, but it's 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 good. Like it's okay. It's okay. It's just like it's not necessarily a three of in the deck. All this other stuff is terrible to D-Res. It's really bad. Winchester, mind you, would be nice. It's four influence, but putting Winchester in your HB ice that you're not going to derez as ever, there's just no real point to give Winchester a fourth subroutine. And this is the biggest thing, is looking at the whole card pool, it's very hard to understand why you should Thunderbolt. Because specifically, if it wants you to res or derez AP or destroyers, there's almost no payoff, barring like maybe two and a half cards. That's very strange. Yet there's good payoffs on all the other cards that you want to derez that, but they're not AP or destroyer. Like we talked about them, all the harmonic size, things like magnet, things like gatekeeper. Like these things are actually really good to res and derez. A blade of barrier, ping, right? All these sort of stuff that you get more value from just don't make sense that often inside a Thunderbolt deck. And this is my thesis that the best derez deck in the format by a mile is not Thunderbolt because Thunderbolt just doesn't make sense. I'm going to catch them on chat, then we're going to go deeper into it to show you some of the support cards that do and don't make sense. I'm really behind on chat. 3x traffic analyzer, <laughs> you'll not regret it. I don't know if I said, hey, Sophie, how's it going? It's a three lane race to 10 power. We can only play cards. This, mind you, is for compile the game in lanes that match their suit. And if the text of an ever revealed is triggered again, some text gets covered when you play a new card in the same lane. Oh, Kato, it sounds a bit like Airland and C, right? Relatedly, what I bought is my Dark Horse for the most quietly necessary Jinteki card. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about Bado yet, Steven. I haven't played it yet in Kentucky. I hope you have a lot of fun playing Thunderbolt despite not being a fan of the ID. I tried it, and, like, it's frustrating. Because the ability that, like, the dream that it promises is, like, so obviously just better in every HB identity. It's almost impossible. The card pool just does not support it, which is so surprising. I called all of this very early on. Thunderbolt decks aren't D-Res. Their PD, like, Rush decks are slightly worse than PD. Yeah, like, Augustus, I think that's a really good way of looking at it, is, like, if you can make that additional subroutine matter and you can go fast enough for it to matter, then Thunderbolt can matter. But just there's a massive dissynergy between Thunderbolt's AP and Destroyer tribal deck and D-Res. So unless you're building a D-Res deck, this is going to fire, again, five or six times. Is that worth your ID ability? Definitely not. Mind you, we saw assets with a text kind of like this, right? Like, I don't remember her name. It's not Malia. There was another uh, character that was like, every Byroid gets another subroutine on the end. And obviously, Byroids are a bit more tricky, but those cards just didn't see a lot of play because ice buffing is like... What's also really surprising, too, is that the more you play Thunderbolt, you realize the more often you run into things that just eat you, right? Like, this is okay, but when they're playing Banhar, right? Like, one other subroutine can matter. They have to play around that, but, like, it doesn't matter. If Lobby Somu comes down... The extra subroutine the extra, it doesn't honestly matter, right? Like so much of the format is is entirely like cards that just make your ID text not matter. 
Having ID techs right now in Netrunner that cares about making your ice better is almost the worst time to do it. I genuinely think right now there might be a problem in Netrunner where ice doesn't feel like it matters that much anymore because every faction has like 300 ways to break through the ice uh, in a way that doesn't require face checking with any sort of risk. It's a problem. You're right. Maybe another subroutine matters with Boomerang, but at the end of the day, right, like I wouldn't pull an ID that's slightly better into Boomerang. Lysheen is a mythic card of the runner unless the runner trashes a card if you choose no subtypes. Yeah, they have to choose one. Yeah. Flip, how's it going? What if we secretly add credits to our credit pool when the runner isn't looking? Even then, like even if we had infinite money, I'm not sure the idea would be good. And Sully isn't even that great. It's expensive as hell and a face check is usually just a click tax. Yes, and I agree. I'd rather have MIC most of the times as the face check for six credits than on sell. Because on sell, they have ways to deal with it. But MIC, they have to figure out a breaker and then it still has additional tax. Right? Like we don't see a lot of on sell right now in the modern meta. And I don't think on sell is even better than MIC, which of course is not an AP or destroyer. I don't know if an NRB has a negative. I think it used to have an negata operator. It probably still does X-Ren. I couldn't figure it out. Imported Cloud Eater is expensive, but hilariously cruel. Yeah. But like you're not de-racing it really. So yeah. We make it five string with Brasilia. <laughs> Mouse is at home. Isn't it still a powerful ability if it makes it more likely that you'll fire the subs of those destroyers and ice? Archer, Stavka, Tier Size Attack can win games if they fire even once. Yes and no. Like the amount of times in which I'm running into an ice. And I can break Sysenton on two strength, but I can't break Sysenton on three strength. That's on me. That's on the runner. Right? I, I know I just said that right now, currently in the meta, I feel like having ice face check is actually incredibly difficult. Specifically, what Thunderbolt does to your opponent, it does slow them down a bit, right? Like they might want to not face check because they're worried you have a Sysenton. They're worried you have a Cloud Eater. But the amount of times in which having plus one strength on the Sysenton is the difference between the runner being able to break and not being able to break in a lethal way is incredibly rare incredibly rare to the point would be like if that was the case we would all just be playing you know um the hellheim servers decks and just killing people on face checks but unfortunately making your ice to be relevant and the scariest part of your game plan is a very hard thing to do netrunner right now s exclamation mark removes traps oh that's cool that's how i built thunderbolt i haven't played many games but the goal wasn't core damage to fire it was the end of line I have the weird feeling that NSG is releasing corp cards in a lagging fashion. The harmonics seem to work well with the new cards. Yeah, harmonics definitely got better, but like not in Thunderbolt. Like, I don't think at all in Thunderbolt. I don't think there's a reason to play them in Thunderbolt. I, I don't know why Thunderbolt exists. Right? Like, it was probably some sort of design thing where like, you know, you ended up here and <laughs> this is what we have. But like, it genuinely doesn't make any sense with the support cards. Like, I would argue Lycians, Munitions... Multi-munition, which seems to be like the marquee Thunderbolt card, is really bad in Thunderbolt. Having the additional strength and additional subroutine on this is nice, but inherently you cannot afford this. And we'll get to this because we have to start talking about like a Stegadon, which is still a very good card. Is with Stegadon, it's actually really important that you have ice permanently resed on the board. Because when the runner runs R&D, you need to be able to de-res an ice on the remote server. You need to be able to de-res an ice on HQ. It's one of the most important things of the game. And I think Stegadon is incredibly unhealthy because what it does to the runner, it forces them to tunnel certain servers. And I'll show you footage about this. We have some good replays we captured yesterday in which one run on HQ, which allowed us to de-res and ablative barrier on R&D, was the game losing play. And there's not much you can do about that besides play Hush or just only run R&D if you're playing a cataloger deck. And unfortunately, having an ice that's not permanently resed, obviously the financial ramifications of this nightmare, uh, just having res dice is one of the most important things you can do with Stegadon, which is like I was even going out of the way to play, and this is not correct, but why I was actually going out of the way to play Tukana is because I just needed more resed ice in more spots so Stegadon can fire more consistently. De-resing your ice is a terrible thing to do to yourself unless you're in control of it. And even then, obviously, financially, it's ruinous. Vovo or no Vovo? No Vovo. I never played Land Air Sea. But you're the second person to make the comparison. Unsure how much lane switching and card movement happens in that game. It seems central to compile. Uh, not too much, but a bit. Cattle. Uh, Airline and Sea is like, it's a precursor. Apparently, it's very similar to an old German card game from what I've been told. And also like Marvel Snap. But that's a, it's a fun uh, card game zone for sure. I'll definitely try and check it out if I can. I think it's less there's a lag on cards and more energy building at the color pie for some of the corpse. Like D-Res for HB and Swap for Jinteki. Yeah. So like this is the thing. We've said this many times before. We saw this with too late too. It's hard to design for HB. So I have some sympathy there. So we've seen the last two HB identities to be different than the core conceit of HB just being the efficiency based faction. Because like that's my thing is I do think most Thunderbolt decks would be strictly better being Asa group because 
firstly, it supports all these weird assets that you can't really afford to play. Things like uh, Thumbs Up Guy and Cyber Sand Harvester and stuff like that. You just can't really play because you have to protect them and you don't have the time to put them out in remote servers. And that's the sort of issues like it's hard to build economy. It's hard to build efficiency that isn't just cracked in the HP efficiency decks. So it's like it's a mixed bag. I think generally right now we do have Thule decks that are very, very different than HP efficiency decks that are strictly at home in Thule. I don't think a lot of people enjoy playing against them, but like it's a hard thing to design for where you want to pull HP away from efficiency. Uh, so it's tricky. It's really hard to build an HP ID. With Orca being so popular right now, makes the extra subroutine relevant to any of those decks? Yeah, there's so many reasons. Love is Omen. Again, the extra subroutine, the extra strength is nearly irrelevant. Specifically with Orca, entirely irrelevant. Um, and these decks are very popular. Feels really bad right now as we seem to enter a no ice matters meta. Now my local meta is all Neo, not standard, but ice seems really bad. I think ice does feel pretty bad right now. Well, okay, I think ice can matter, but if your whole shtick is my ice is going to be slightly better at some points in the game, that's a mistake. Like, you cannot have ice being the most important part of your game plan. There is still good ice, and you should have ice, and there's relevant ice. It's just, like, not like that. My argument for Boda is that the reasonably strong normally and Threat 4 is uniquely easy to get to in a lot of Jinteki archetypes. I think Threat 4 is hard to get to in Jinteki. I think we're seeing a lot more of the Ag Glacier decks actually pay two-pointers, though, so maybe not. Gank Helheim does work, though. Well, yeah, Gank Helheim works in anything. I don't think you need to play Thunderbolt for Gank Helheim. Like, in theory, you should play it anywhere else. Because they're not going to expect an Asa group, but they'll probably be a bit scared of Thunderbolt. For what it's worth, too, Ganked Helheim is the worst it's ever been. Because one of the quintessential tech cards right now, another Thunderbolt problem, is Flip Switch. Like, most meta cognizant players are playing copies of Flip Switch for other reasons. And having your game plan to be, like, Ganked Helheim into a Flip Switch meta is, like, just not the right time to do it. Let alone probably the wrong idea. So, I hear you. But also, it's not a great time. I can't afford multi mission, but I'm built different. Worth noting that any AP slash destroyer ice that have an end the run is detrimental to Thunderbolt as well. It adds an extra sub to break, but if they can't break the last sub, it just gets eaten. I guess that's right, CB, right? So you're saying that the fact that it has an end the run means that the next ice behind it doesn't matter, I guess? It's like genuinely cool to have like something that, right? So the idea. Maybe this is a good use case. Is Ballista, you have to choose between Mean Thing and End the Run. And in theory, when it comes to Thunderbolt, you can have Mean Thing and a Soft End the Run. Like, that's unique. Mind you, End the Run on Sentries is something that actually increases the price of the ice on my design by budget idea. Where, like, having an End the Run Sentry actually increases the cost of it. Like, Ballista should cost less. It would significantly cost a fair bit less if it did not have this clause on it. Because End the Run classically in the budget of what ice is built to pay for and the run cost of credit on the century. Hey, that was my run. I'm an object lesson. Hey, yeah, good game. I have the replay. Like we should show it because like, I generally don't think it, it's the least sexy thing about Stegadon where like running HQ is, is game losing, unfortunately. So we're learning that Tithe is pretty decent Thunderbolt because it's cheap re-res to use other common Thunderbolt cards. Yo, Abbreviator, it totally is. Your name is always very funny, but it's also not the best. I agree. And I had two in the deck. I did want three. Because by the time that you can derez this and you can weaponize it is about the time where the runner can break it. It's really good in the early game, but by the mid game where they have their sentry breaker down, adding an additional one credit to the break cost of this is not worth having three bad ice in your deck. That's what I've seen so far. It's nice as a cheap thing to derez and to stag it on. It's good that you have those, but it's really hard to have like three of your ice beat tithes in a matchup where net damage doesn't matter. It's hard to make it matter. I've seen a lot of Agateas with four twos. Yeah, Steven, I have too. I liked your uh, your kickflip idea, mind you, in the rules chat. I think that's really, really cute. Atea loves four twos. Hey, Ma. Yo, Rohit. I don't know if I said. I think I probably did. Thank you for supporting the channel. Example being Rototurd and Archer? Yeah, sort of. Okay, I've caught up on chat. Know that any ADP destroyer that already has end the run, the extra Thunderbolt sub doesn't matter as existing end the run fires and you get kicked out. But I suppose the runner probably getting kicked out anyways. You're probably happy. Yeah, maybe you're okay. So let's look at some of the cards for Thunderbolt. Because again... I don't know if we're just railing on Thunderbolt, which doesn't need this. I don't think I don't I don't know if people are expecting Thunderbolt to be good. But unfortunately, a lot of the Thunderbolt cards from my scene just don't work well with Thunderbolt. So let's start here. This seems like an obvious shoe in for Thunderbolt. Lightning Laboratory it says when you score this, you get a counter. The counter allows you to res two ice, de-res two ice. Now they could be different ice. So the question is, in how many board states have you scored out of four two? You have massive expensive ice where resing it once, like say a Cloud Eater, say a tier is worth it. But then you have like three to four ice on the server in which you're making an interesting decision. 
you see the issue here, right? Like Thunderbolt financially is an anti-tempo, an anti-economy ability. We're playing this in the spot of an off-world office. You already probably have to play Stegodons anyways, so you probably want to play more 5-3s than 4-2s. I think Lightning Laboratory is nearly unplayable, even in uh, Thunderbolt. Because having a board state when you want to score this out, and then having massive brick expensive ice that you don't want to res because you're waiting for your laboratory, right? Like, how do you score this out? So it ends up in this weird situation where, like, you maybe you have to play Ginger City Grid, but then you're not playing the other grid that's meant to be a Thunderbolt deck. It's like, it's kind of nonsense. This card is really hard to make sense in Thunderbolt as much as it is one of the easiest to res, de res package cards. I can see legit Lightning Laboratory and PD to reset Gatekeepers and Resabron. I think that use case is not worth the inconsistency of this card when you can just play things like, uh, you know, Architect Deployment Test or anything else, really. Lightning Lab wants to be in a Jinja deck, I think, but T-Bolt doesn't want to play Jinja. Yeah, exactly. T-Bolt doesn't want to play Jinja. This card, I, I cut from my Thunderbolt deck because it was incredibly underperforming consistently because it's not good with the cheap D-Res targets. And it, it, so, like, this card is saying that there's a Thunderbolt deck that's running massive sentries, but then why are you playing massive sentries in Thunderbolt? Because they're the worst target to D-Res. So it's quintessentially one of the decks where, like, your ID fires four times and you're hoping it's good enough. This card is definitely combo with Jinja, not Brasilia. Yeah, exactly. It's Jinja, not Brasilia, which maybe there is a Thunderbolt deck with Jinja, not Brasilia, but those Jinja decks are not often challenged. Maybe they're challenged on one big run, so having the Thunderbolt extra matters on that. But to me, just fundamentally does not make a lot of sense. Six damage combo with Anemone? Yeah, there's some like combo decks, mind you. Brasilia Anemone is also really rude, and Anemone is one of the few targets, so keep that in mind. But that being said, if there's a good Anemone spam deck and it's an HB, are we happy? I don't know. I don't know. Really weird. The fire order on a hard end and a soft end, the run doesn't really matter. Oh, like the subroutine order and a single ice, yes, doesn't really matter. Uh, because they have to break both or none. ADT is one of the most fun agendas of all time. Love knowing the top of the deck. Yeah, ADT is just good. Warm reception. This card also is very confusing. When your turn begins, you may install a card from HQ. Now, this is there's a lot of ice or sorry, assets in the deck or in, in the set that are one twos. One twos is not a good ratio. It's just cheap enough for a runner to have to deal with it with not a huge impact on the game if they think they need to deal with it. Now, this card's not bad. I just, it's, it seems to be more at home in a deck that has a lot of card draw that wants to spam out a lot of assets because this is not ignoring all costs. So it's hard to make this to be like a Jinja where you're putting a lot of ice on a server. You also need a lot of card draw. So this makes more sense in something that's going horizontal. One of the best use cases, again, like unfortunately most of the Thunderball cards is an Asa group. Because with Asa group, when you install a card with this, you get to install two cards. So if this fires or in near earth hub, you get to draw a card or install two cards. And that's really quite good. Now, what's so puzzling about this card is the additional text. If this server is not protected by ice, which is a hard thing to do in Thunderbolt, where ice is the thing you do, you may derez this asset to derez another installed card. So now we're derezing two cards and then having to pay a premium for it if we want this to fire again. This would only be good if there are cards that benefit off of you derezing or resing your own cards in a way that can back offset how expensive and how slow this is. Now, I'd say there's a, kind of enough ways to derez. The problem is actually right now in Thunderbolt and HB and, and specifically in Stegadon is not that you're lacking ways to derez. The problem right now in HB is you're lacking ways to res. I'm so surprised that we did not see something like Executive Bootcamp, which if Executive Bootcamp existed, I think Harmonix Ice would be good. I think I'd be playing more Stegadon decks than I am right now. But the problem with Stegadon is, so once you have a Stegadon scored, right? When the runner runs R&D, to get Stegadon to fire, you need to derez an ice on any other server. But unfortunately, the best play pattern a lot of times into Stegadon decks is just tunnel the same server so Stegadon never does anything so you don't have to do math. And if that's the case, one of the best things an HP could do is actually choose to res their ice, let alone their assets, actually their ice, that's what we want, on a different server to ensure that Stegadon is doing something. It's also another like, really good reason why you want to play Asa Group with a Stegadon deck is because you're very good at making new servers to force the runner to a different direction, so you're constantly resing and de-resing. Obviously, Forma Carry got banned. That was an important card in Stegadon decks. That's okay. But I'm surprised that we saw a card like this because what HB is missing is not the ability to de-res cards, which they have, in fact, too many ways to do, but they're missing ways to res their own cards under their control. That is the biggest issue right now with playing Stegadon is your opponent has entirety of control of when and where you're going to res your ice, which means you're not in control of Stegadon. Stegadon's still good. What I learned yesterday is there's still matches where they get down their turbine and all their fixed strength breakers and three catalogers and you're like, I'm cooked. And Stegadon still pulls through somehow because it's easy to make one mistake and the game is over. Um, but they just don't have ways, right? Like uh, Restore. Is this it? No, not Restore. What's the other one called? Uh, the one that you divert power, right? Like, I thought we would see more cards like this that make sense. 
And maybe secretly deferred power is really important in a Thunderbolt deck. So you can afford to play very big expensive sentries. But then the issue with Thunderbolt is if you divert power to res a sentry on your turn, the Thunderbolt ID box is blank because it didn't happen during a run. So again, very, very weird that there's so many cards that seem to be synergistic, but kind of at their core, they're actually incredibly anti-synergistic. Where like, I'd rather have the ability to res stuff than de-res stuff. It's so strange. It's so strange. I will de-res <laughs> Sorry, it's bet everywhere. I will de-res the runners, Carmen. Hey, Pouch, how's it going? Just join. I hope I'm not repeating stuff. I think the best use of Thunderbolt is for a rushy mid-range deck with lots of cheap ice and some chunky ice. You're right. And Pouch, our thesis is look at that ice and you realize only one in every five is an AP or destroyer. Just play Asa. I agree with you. There's a deck here. It's just not in Thunderbolt. It is play the good D-Res HB ice and play it in Asa. It doesn't make any sense. No Stegano. Oh, Stegano's really good. And of the Liberation cards, probably only Brazilian Lycian make it in. If you're not playing Stegadon, Lycian's a bit more um, defensible, but I, I think Lycian is not very good. Getting something exec booty-ish in Dawn would be sweet. Yeah, executive bootcamp is incredibly problem. Is executive bootcamp an op a problem? Uh, I wouldn't say if it's a problem. I would say it's good. Op, resing their ice is important. Mind you, you do have control when you're playing against op where you run, so where they can res, so where they can extract, stuff like that. You're right. Uh, but I don't think it's the most important thing because op generally is like getting their control off of their upgrades and assets. Resing a 9 strength gatekeeper or two on their scoring remote every turn seems okay. Yeah, until they like boomerang it or whatever. But I hear you. I hear you. Warm Reception is wild in Prison Acid decks with Working Prototype and things like Trias Model Byrides, but it doesn't work well with Ice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This, to me, is a deck that's running 25 Assets. It's not running Ice, you're derezzing to get Thunderbolt. Fast Boot cards, card like Boot Camp, Divert Power, Oversight, are very dicey to print, so I think NSG is avoiding them. That's fine that they're avoiding them, right? Like, I imagine there's ways to print them that are more healthy. It's just like this clause, to me, it seems like these two clauses, in terms of power level, should have been swapped. Obviously, that make this card unplayable, but to me, this doesn't seem like the kicker. This seems like the kicker, right? Like this seems so nonsense. If this didn't say ice, obviously it'd be good. But like this card is so confusing. Like it's good enough with just this text. And then this text is just so strange. I'm with you. There aren't enough cheap, compelling AP destroyers. Hard to leverage. Yeah, exactly. Very hard to leverage tithe. There isn't real any asset spam HP deck right now. Asa can try, but it, yeah, I think Asa can be really good right now. Now this card. This card is one of the few cards that I think could make Thunderbolt, or actually, again, I think D-Res compelling, because it is an econ source attached to D-Resing, or specifically to Resing. Mind you, still, the problem is runners have control of Resing, so that's kind of an issue. Uh, but you can click this for three credits, so it is a regolith, and you do need just regoliths and Thunderbolt decks because you just don't got money. HB just doesn't got money unless you're playing Acids. Now, the issue, again, is the one-two. So where are you putting this thing? Because in Thunderbolt, you don't want to stretch yourself too thin. You only have so much time and economy that, like, this is the exact sort of quintessential card where if you see this anywhere, you see this in an Asa group deck. It works when you res assets. Yeah, yeah, no. You see this in an asset spam deck. I think that's really good with an Asa. It works on itself, which is cute. The one thing that this card does that's worth talking about is that it slows the game down. Once you res this working prototype, the runner generally doesn't want to face check into anything anymore because they understand every face check saves you three credits. It's not dissimilar, and obviously it works well with Vovo. Once you have a Vovo resed on the remote server three ice, a lot of runners don't want to run the Vovo remote server because they realize they're giving you six credits, right? Like, that's true. And it's definitely worth keeping in mind that just the ability to res this has an impact on how people play the game. That's a hard thing to quantify. Uh, so that's cool. It works with assets, I agree. I think you'll probably see this in asset decks. And is Thunderbolt secretly an asset deck? Is that what we're trying to get here? And then you just play four or five AP or Destroyer Ice. You play annoying tithes that are... You know, you can still run back, mind you. Very important to know, Thunderbolt's only for the run, not for the th turn. So, like, even if they end the run on the, the tithe, they can just go back. They don't want to trash one of their cards. Is Thunderbolt somehow secretly an asset spam deck? I don't know. Um, but this card is, like, kind of what you want in a Thunderbolt deck. The same way that Cyber Sand feels like it's the thing that you want in a Thunderbolt deck. Until you realize you cannot afford to build a second remote server and ice it up. Which is a problem. Which is, again, why I think out of anything, you'd probably want to play this in Asa Group, where icing up a Cyber Sand Harvester for a single click, let alone after you fire a Tributary, which, again, does make more sense out of Asa than it does in Thunderbolt, is very, very good. I feel like Andre repeating that Asa Group is a more competitive ID than Thunderbolt at some point is going to lose all me. Like, it, yeah, of course it is. But, like, it's just, I find it really frustrating that all the key cards don't work together. Like, I'd argue most of the cards inside the Thunderbolt set are actually non-synergistic with one another. It's so weird. Isaac, I don't believe in Isaac. I don't think Isaac is any better than like just playing Managarm. 
It's much more clumsy. It's much more slow. Uh, Isaac is... I don't care for Isaac. Obviously, we don't care about advancements, um, but Isaac is just a bad mana garm unless you're playing Glacier, in which it's on like three ice. And then hopefully, the mind you, the advancements matter. For those who don't know, Isaac is fine. It's just like Isaac's a Glacier card, unless you care about the advancements. Yeah, I don't know. Weird. Honestly, I'm a lot more interested in playing all the Thunderbolt support and Architects and getting even more access to Res on support Stegadon. Yeah, I agree. I even, I mind you, I don't consider Architects because I never want to play Architects, but even Architects of Tomorrow is a better home for a lot of the D-Res stuff as much as you're only playing Stegadon and only playing Byrides because you're not playing a Blade of, you're probably playing Magnet, maybe Gatekeeper, I don't know. After careful consideration, I agree with 99% of the points you're making. It's really frustrating. I thought we would get something cool, but like none of these HP cards make any sense in context. It's really strange. Working Prototype is just good overall. It's better than Asa than T-Bold. Working Prototype is just like Alex from back in the day. Comparing yourself to Alex is probably not the first thing you want to do, Abbreviator, if you want to say, like, it's a good card. I would rather play Regolith over this. The question is if I'm playing a fourth Regolith in Asa group. And is that fourth Regolith better to be a Marilyn or a Nico campaign, which is less click intensive? And that's what I worry about Working Prototype. I think I saw a bit of it see play and, like, I tuned into a bit of the AMT this weekend. Shout out to the people who, uh, who um we're playing in the AMT, but like, I'm dubious whether this is better than reg like regolith is just better than this. I'd, I'd assume like it's one credit shorter. It's one credit harder to trash. This pays you faster because you res you click for two clicks for two credits. It's a regolith, which is two clicks for one credit. But at the end of the day, it's a regolith. So I don't know. Working P is nice in mirror morph. Yeah. But the same way that like nano etching is probably better in mirror morph and regolith is probably better in mirror morph. Right? Like, if I'm playing Mirror Morph, I'd play Nano Etching over Working Prototype. And that's the hard thing about Working Prototype. Like, again, to me, it makes more sense in a horizontal asset deck, which, like, doesn't seem to be where we're going with any of these cards. Isaac in green instead of purple, but that means the thing that he has over Skunk Works for Wayland, that and the fact that he moves around. Yeah, Isaac is good. I'd also argue that, like, man, I'm glad I'm not the only person to think this. I was really excited to listen to the podcast po po process podcast. Uh, apologies that this is a Doomer stream, but it's a Thunderbolt stream, so it's going to be. Uh, and they were talking about, like, wow, everyone thought Advanceable Ice was really interesting. And then, like, people started playing it, and Worlds was won by Advanceable Ice, and everyone realizes, wait, this kind of sucks, actually. It's a slog. And that's where I'm kind of feeling with Isaac, right? Like, I actually genuinely, at this point in the time, and I used to love Wayland, don't like Advanceable Ice. I think the fact that you can just, like, sit back, do nothing, and triple advance your, um, your Aket on HQ against a criminal, like, kind of has a way bigger impact on the game in a not interesting way uh, than anything else. So I don't know. I don't like cards like this. Like I, I did not like Kayambe. I think this card is playable. It's a bit slow. It's a bit clumsy. It also only places one advancement token. So like there's a limit to this. This is not going to get your tree line out of, of out of whack. I think people forget that a fair bit. This doesn't just give you advancements. You only places one ever. That being said, if you play with like Mess and Chesfo and stuff where you take the advancement off, it's, it's definitely something. Thunderbolt might be catered to startup. So far, it seems OK there. Yeah, I can't tell you much about startup because I don't know. But even in startup, there's just like the pool of AP or destroyers is even smaller. But that in startup, it's like, do you want to play PD or do you want to play Thunderbolt? Yeah, Thunderbolt's probably more interesting to, than PD. Vovo working prototype and Cybersand Harvester start printing money for you. Are there's convoluted combo where they're even worth doing it? Uh, Turdock, I think there might be, but then like you should be playing Asa Group because you have to protect all of these cards. So how are you spending six clicks installing all these cards before they do anything? Because I agree, Cybersand, Vovo, all this stuff seems like it would work together, and then you realize you just can't functionally get it all together because it's way too much stuff. And then your deck is nonsense. I don't care for Isaac, God, to Abraham. <laughs> Sad of the situations right now, maybe we'll see more support for Thunderbolt in future sets. The weird thing is, like, I kind of hope we don't. Like, I, I don't want Thunderbolt to be good. Like, this is fine, no matter how we do. It's a fixed Alex is what I really meant, but you're right. Yeah, Alex is like a card that I know I've tried to make work before. Uh, it got power counters whenever you res a card, installed a card, and then you could trash it for a click. Fine, funny enough, do you know what Alex became? A Cell Moon. Like, this is what Alex actually became, and obviously, Cell Moon is busted. A Cell Moon is heavily banned. Uh, it's one of the highest pointed cards in Eternal. Uh, Cell Moon is buck wild. But yeah, Alex was like, became a Cell Moon in other ways. This fact that this cost a click is obviously like kind of ugly. It's not always hard to get five counters and then you can clown on fresh casts. I think clowning on cast Solomir, how's it going? This is the thing that like I'm also not entirely sure when it comes to this card. To me, this seems bad. Like in context, what does five hosted power counters cost you? 15 credits. <laughs> okay, not 15, nine credits. This ability costs you nine credits. 
Now, obviously, the thing to say here is that if there's five hosted power counters on this, it's because you're not needing them. So you don't want to spend like two and a half turns taking nine credits off of it or whatever, right? You don't want to do it. So you're saying in the situation where this is so out of control, which I'd matter, I'd imagine at that point in the game, you already won the game pretty heavily as a corporation. This text box is so punishing to the runner where the runner really needs you not to do this. That makes it a good card, but it makes it the sort of card where I feel bad. Like, it's the sort of thing where you have 15 assets. They had to zoom out on the AMT to the point where it's, like, totally unwatchable. And then you're like, oh, you installed daily cast and the twinning. Oh, no, I'm going to return those to your hand, right? Like, it's by the time this happens, the game's already so messed up that I feel like doing this to someone just is rude. It's just rude. There's a lot of cards in this set that I think are just rude that actually make me uncomfortable doing them to people. Like, I don't want to Amelia someone. Is it how does this come up in playtesting? I don't want to Amelia someone. I would feel bad doing it. If I go to the GNK in like four hours and Amelia someone, I will have to apologize. I feel like this is an apology button too. What's with that? Like, why do I not feel bad like MC austerity people, which is again, a pretty ugly card. People felt strongly about this when it came out. It feels mean, but I would feel way worse doing this to someone than MC austerity pulsing to score a 5-3. I think there's a constant thing across the liberation design for runners is cards that work well with the IDs and design for corp cards is kind of work, but really go with other IDs. Is that intentional? The fact is a five power can just bounces to the top of stack. All right, I'll redraw and reinstall it. It's really bad though. Redraw and reinstalling is terrible. Putting a card on top of the stack is actually really bad because they lose like three clicks. They lost the install. They lost the money. They lost the draw. They lost the reinstall. Like this is so demoralizing. So demoralizing. Working prototype seems good if you can fire the second daily consistently. So only an asset pim. Yeah. And at that point, like if this is out of control, it's cool. Maybe it paints a, paints a target on it. So like you have to deal with it. I'd argue you have to anyways. Hey, Joshua, there's probably a version of Nuvum. I think Nuvum is actually pronounced Nuva. I think I learned that on the weekend. Glacier, exploring Isaac and Slash and Burn Agriculture to very quickly advance ice on one remote server. Yeah. And hope you don't get hushed or something, I guess. How's it going, Joshua? Yeah, I don't know. I'm just not excited about advanceable ice anymore. I think the five power counter version is pretty big deal. You just have to enough reses for that to matter. Yeah, you could fire it in one turn. You could. It's not impossible. Hey, Coke, when Automata came out, I tried a Thule deck with Steg, trying to get core damage with Carl and Bloop and using the rest of the harmonic suite. It didn't quite work. It might work better now, but I think that's the problem. It's like playing Stegadon in a non-financial identity is a bit tricky. Uh, hopefully you had Vovo in there. I think Vovo wasn't out. You need Vovo in there, right? Oh, if Stegadon was out, Vovo was out. The best advanceable ice is stuff like Mess and Chesso that actually wants to do stuff with advancements. Plus strength is boring. I agree. Plus strength is boring. Advanceable, having the advanceability be part of board state that has to be reevaluated. I think that's kind of more interesting. But just saying strength goes up, boring. Because there's going to be decks that are just going to put like a hollow man on central servers and then just like continue to advance their log jam or whatever. I don't know if we want that. <laughs> like that's probably not a thing you want. Hollow Man is Mari just being like, okay, on this turn, I'll spend six credits to put more counters on my log jam. And then, like, I don't know. Like, I, I just don't see how that is going to be a healthy play pattern. Seems like we're missing a couple of tech cards against Advanced Ice. Maybe Hermes is one. Yeah, but as soon as they res them, Hermes isn't, right? So if the game plan against Advanceable Ices don't run, I almost never predict Cyber Sand. Runners always never trash it. I feel like it's on the runner, though. Because that's like the other thing, ugly thing with Cyber Sand is like, you're not expected to actually have to trash it. You just have to run it with at least four credits. And sometimes you are going to be forced to trash it and you have to understand that. But like, you just should run it. Probably. Oh, Noma virus and started let the loop pop off. Yeah, that could be a problem. We should bring that card card for each advanced card gain two credits back. That makes Isaac good enough. Oh, the banned one that nobody wants. <laughs> it's interesting how many mechanics in the base game turn out to not be fun. It's not that bad. I think advanceable. But the thing is, like back in the day, advancing your ice wall was not tenable. Like in core set, advancing your ice wall, let alone rezzing a Hadrian's wall, was barely tenable as a corporation. So it didn't seem to be an issue. And then Advanceable Ice constantly got pushed as much as it got worse first. It got better. And now we're at the point where like you can just afford to take a turn off to unfortunately triple click your Aket, let alone play Prop Devost. And once Aket has five advancements on it, a lot of times the right plays don't run into it. Uh, because let alone Kurapira will never charge off of it and you break it for like 17 credits or something. Starcraft Space Marine. Yeah, it kind of does look like one, right, Ravage? Ignoring the click cost of clicking it for four more times so it's more akin to losing five credits? Yeah, yeah, for sure, Lord. Like, there's no way that you end up actually clicking this that many times. Uh, where's my tab I'm working on? 
I can't remember the name of this card. This one to me is like calibration testing where the name just like goes through my head and won't come back. Apologies when doing a rude thing in card gamers can be fun though. I don't like it. <laughs> Canadian politeness, I think. Hey, Koga, how's it going? Looking at HB today. Yeah, we're going to be playing some HB. I tested Amelia. It's not good. Doof is much worse. I think Amelia, I was surprised. I didn't realize Amelia was turn to turn. But this is the other thing, right? Like, and I feel like we see this across the set is there's a bunch of cards that are balanced around being bad, right? Like, I don't think Amelia is bad. I think you can make Amelia work if you work into it. I think you probably play Arasana with flex capacitor. Like, you can do something rude. You can charge this in a single turn. It's, it's totally doable. You have to build your deck around it. Is it better than diversion funds? Arguably. But to me, there's a lot of cards in this set that seem to be balanced around the fact that if this is good, it's really bad for the game, but don't worry, it's not good. Which to me is like such a weird cross section. I don't get it. PD is the best card because it's completely above board. I don't even think so. I think there's a chance Asa can be better. I think PD is consistent. Asa, you have to like make a bit more imaginative plays with no disrespect to PD players. They're very good. Uh, but Asa is like a bit more fragile, but I think the highs are higher. I think that's a more polite way of putting it. I think in Asa, the highs are much higher. Uh, but it's much trickier and it's a bit more inconsistent. So I get it. Toxics on the scale from zero to Coco Urtica. Pretty. <laughs> oh, Vovo isn't there. Okay, good. Like if Praxis and reinstall an Aru crew, I'm going to apologize for the hell the corp is going through. <laughs> hey, Jai, how's it going? Congratulations on the deck of the week. Then RPC. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure Toronto. It only takes working prototype, warm reception, and another asset to get the five counters at the start of your turn. It's like doable. It's definitely doable. It's like, that's a big number. Mind you, like what this card reminds me of, and I liked this archetype back in the day, was Lakshmi Smart Fabrics. Hey, Izzy, how's it going? This card got power cannons when you res things and then protected agendas, but it protected agendas in HQ. And so this card is actually important because it was your win condition. So you tried to get an agenda in hand, an agenda on the table. You had to res enough stuff. It was very good. It could be by things like Film Critic and Imp, which were not uncommon, but like this is the way that HB Asset Spam kind of made sense for a while, and I know I was playing that deck uh, sooner than it was in mode, uh, which was fun. So it reminds me of this card. This card is like obviously a bit toxic, but um, it was fun. Do you feel bad about using Aura Crew? Seems to moralize and delete ice. Sort of do. But it's not dissimilar to something we've had before. Like this is the thing to me that I think gets me in a way, is like Amelia is inherently... I think the way Amelia is going to see play is actually not going to be interaction based. It's going to be like one leg work and then they're going to do like, maybe this is considered interaction, like Flux Flux or Stone Chip Dig, something like that. As opposed to Hyrosaurus Crew, which I don't know, at least I made a run. This is a personal thing, right? Like I could see some people feeling a bit very bad about playing Hyrosaurus Crew. I get it. Uh, but losing an ice doesn't cost the corporation the game. Losing 10 credits puts them at a board state where their next couple turns are just click for credits. And so they're functionally not playing the game. I, we did play against a hard stairs crew. We played against Nichan's uh, girl, if I'm not mistaken, last week. She was the first person I saw playing in a hard stairs crew deck that we first experienced it. And I was upset playing against it. As much as we didn't lose that much ice because we had to like play against it with all our might. Got to advance the woodcutter. Flatline the runner. <laughs> the most long one. You can't actually advance it till it's I don't think. If only they print an ID with the current credits advance ice would be so busted. They did better than that pouch. They did better with built the last, huh? Doof feels terrible compared to Amelia. Doof feels good in Shaper. Crim doesn't feel like the place for Amelia. I don't think it's in Criminal. Of course, Jonas designed Amelia. He loves his MPE cards. I didn't know that that was uh, one of Jonas's birds. I probably didn't read the full thing, um, but that's very, very cute. Even if you charge it in a single turn, the corp gets a turn to react with it. It's such a big difference from Doof. Yes, but most corporations cannot react to it. Like, you're right, they won't push out an agenda, but like, they can't, unless they're playing assets, like, they're going to lose probably 10 credits. It's not like they can res their ice. PD gets eaten hard by kit deck right now? Yep. PD, I mean lost because it's not mean to the runner. Oh, yeah. Mila's difficulty is not getting to three counters to put the first counter on it because it requires doing a three card multi axis. It slows down so much. I don't think it sounds that difficult if you just do like slap vandal, leg work, turn one, which just turns out to be a really good play. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But yeah, it's not the easiest to play, but I don't think you play three in a deck. I think you play two. Normally games have the unfun strategies be bad to minimize annoyance from them, but it's just RWR seems to have them higher than normal amount of them. Yeah, I think that's it, Lord. Like, that's what gets me is like this set seems to have the biggest concentration of like, if this is good, it's bad. Way more than any other set we've ever seen. I really underestimated working prototype until I played it. It gets set up fast enough. It really means the runner can't install resources anymore. Yeah, it, it will snowball. It definitely will snowball. And it's like it is a pinhole target. 
the thing is like you can't get the setup and you can't this is where we're talking about jai is like we're talking about in thunderbolt you cannot get the setup and then inherently because you're playing thunderbolt so you're playing like 16 or 17 ice you cannot get this to fire consistently you have to wait for the runner to interact with you and that is not a good spot to be in thunderbolt where like a card like this inherently works way better in asset spam which is so strange because you got thunderbolt and then you got asset spam support and nothing for thunderbolt Stop HP asset spam. I always don't have a long enough table to play. Oh, you got to put in play in portrait mode. Working prototype is such a blast to play because it's good counters to much faster than you think. Yeah, I could believe it. Huge shout out to Solomir for invaluable help in NPC this weekend. Let's go. Not only Amelia is a you may, so into assets, you can res all the stuff and you just hold it. Yes, I was surprised that Amelia was start a turn. I thought she was whenever, which would make her a lot better. But Amelia is a may. So you can just sit on her. You can be like, oh, so you're down to three credits. I'm good. Like, it's such a difference. Hey, bopped out back now. Are we talking about Amelia? Daijin and I worked out a Padma Amelia deck last night. I didn't end up having success and it feels like a bit of a trap, but it's fun. I don't think you play this in Padma. I think Padma is a sort of deck where they're going to ice up RNG to the point that it's hard to get Padma's ability. That's unfortunately a thing with Padma is they see you coming. So I think if I'm going to play Amelia in Shaper, I'm going to be playing it with Flux in Ari. Flux in Ari means it's actually trivial to like get off a legwork turn one with a Slap Vandal. You can get this down as relatively quickly. Um, and then from that point on, it's very easy to do a flux and charge this uh, stone ship char room if you really need to. But I don't think I'd play Padma because like that, this is the problem with Padma. We're seeing a lot of people play Padma and Padma got so much support in the set. But generally with Padma, you want to be charging one card. And it's hard to imagine Amelia is the best card you're charging because Amelia does not win you the game. And the thing that you want to do with Amelia is actually never run R&D. This is actually really important. The thing you want to do with Amelia is never, ever run R&D. You want to just fo focus on the remote server and HQ, which is why I like legwork. Because once they've lost 10 credits and they have no money, that's when specifically when you're playing Ari, you drop Cuban, you drop Peach Chan, they can't res their ice. Next turn, they click for three credits and you just ruin the game with Conduit. So I think it's actually super important that like Amelia doesn't do anything if their ice is rezzed besides buys you time. So I think one of the most important things you can do in the abstract deck uh, that I haven't built or tested yet is play Amelia with HQ pressure and wait and never, ever run R&D and then until they're bankrupt and then you win off of R&D because inherently not being able to res ice into Ari is a game loss. It's so bad if you can't res ice into Ari. That's my thing. Again, if I'm playing Padma, I'd rather charge, honestly, this. Like there's a lot of things you can charge in Padma that are better than Amelia. I think that's true. My issue with Amelia is that while it's charged on the board, the corp has a hard time pushing agendas. So the runner doesn't have to pop it for a while. Yeah, it slows the game down. Like, I think that's another ugly thing with Amelia is when Amelia is on the table with three charges, is the corporation ever going to push into a remote server? No. So what happens to the game? The game just stalls. It stalls out. It sounds ugly. I'll use working prototype second ability as a litmus test for human kindness. <laughs> If I give you five counters, do you click for 15 or do you hurt someone for nine or six? It's six, right? That's very funny. Anyways, it's weird. It's strange. It's very strange. I just went back to another Amelia. Where are we trying to go? I still can't remember the name of this card. Lichen. Okay. Yeah. Working prototype is an asset spam card. Exactly. Cyber Sand is an asset you want a Thunderbolt. I don't, I think it's hard. I, I don't know if people are trashing it or not. Would you consider Ashen Epilogue a feel bad card, especially like a corp trying to play grinder? Yes, I think Ashen Epilogue, when you feel like you have a window because the runners got to the bottom of your deck and then they Ashen Epilogue you, it feels bad. It generally feels bad. And the tempo hit of playing five to draw a new hand at that point is usually like three credits because they have two, uh, what's it called, prepaid. I think it doesn't feel good. It's not something I wouldn't do to a corporation, but like, you know, once the runner gets to the bottom of the deck, you think you survived the events and then obviously they just reset the button and you have to do the whole thing again. So it's like survive again. Horde mode round two. Now their deck is more concentrated. It doesn't feel good as a corporation. That's for sure. Yeah, weird. Let me catch my chat. I talked with a friend about this, that some of the cards feel very NPE like Mumbad. And then he told me Mumbad was also about liberation suffrage. Yes, for what is worth, Mumbad has a very similar theme. Uh, mind you, Mumbed's theme was more about like HB pushing for clone uh, suffrage and uh, clone rights, while Jintagi was pushing for Byroid suffrage and Byroid rights, because if you destabilize, you know, the main product of the competitor, the market messes up in your direction. So it was it was also uh, an interesting story. I think you spend your influence on Maladrigam and Fadma. Yeah. Hey, Lagurga, how's it going? Yes. Um, I think uh, Maladrigam is another card we should talk about.
Amelia's a companion. Friends bring you shinies. Friends do bring you shinies. Charging with Orca is a thing too. Yeah, charging with Orca is a thing. This is also something we haven't seen yet. I'm convinced you can play Lava Somu not in kit and without Spark. I think Lava Somu is so good. You can play two to three copies in your Shaper deck and just install it with Rigging Up and then still play Turbine and Hush and Clot and all the other good stuff. I think this card is so good that it's not necessarily worth playing Spark of Inspiration and only playing Lava Somu Orca. I think you can probably build a Shaper deck that plays Lava Sumo Orca, but then still has program slots for other stuff like Turbine, uh, which I think is important. Hush is really important. Um, maybe it's not necessary, but I think we're going to see more innovation with this card than just like spark it out. We probably already did it in NPC. I haven't seen the deck list yet. Burn a Legwork's a good synergy with Ari deck could work well with Amelia. Yep, yep. There's there's reasons to play Legwork in, in Shaper. There's always been, but now there's more than others. I built a janky deck with Pudma, Lob, Orca, Turbine, Catalogger. Only played with friends, but it's been fun. Uh, Rousseau, this is the thing. How's it going? It's not a janky deck. It's probably a very, very good deck. Uh, I, I think Lobby Somu is the sort of card that people are going to see be like, hey, Kosh, this must be for, for, you know, for like jank players who want to do weird stuff. No, this is like, this is on our ban me please tier in our tier list. Uh, Jeff and I recorded the runner side. It'll be out next week. A bit of a spoiler, but like this card is messed up. Can I get a shout out to Fizarum? The card is super nutty. Uh, speaking of the tier list, I think I ranked Fizarum. Jeff and I ranked Fizarum a bit too low. I'm surprised to see how much play it's seeing in Shaper. I'd argue that it's still not probably correct. I think in that slot, a lot of times you can just play Slap Vandal. I think the instances where having the Fizarum over the Slap Vandal be that much worth three influence is hard to say. But I think right now the biggest thing is in Shaper, influence is kind of like nonsense space. You can do whatever you want in influence and it doesn't really matter. So like maybe that means it's okay for Fizarum. But I know Jeff and I when we record on Saturday, we weren't that high in Fizarum and we're probably going to be wrong about it. And that, like that's a change of my mind in like 48 hours, which is kind of the cool Netrunner thing. Uh, so I agree, but I'd argue that it might be comparable to things like Slap. I think right now people are like playing less Maviruses, which is like obviously the big reason you don't want to rely on this as much as like, oh my God, how Doomer is he going to get today? Shaper has six clone chips. How is that not going to be a problem? How is that not going to be a problem that Shaper has six clone chips? Right? Like I know I asked for like a cash, but Shaper now has six clone chips. You install a Muse with a Simul chip with a DZMZ to reinstall the same like coalescence. It's like an eight credit play for a single click. What? Yeah. What are you meant to do against a shaper that has six on tempo clone chips? Pawn Shop is back. Pawn Shop is goddamn on ending. How do you beat Pawn Shop? Like, I don't get it. Like, what are we doing? Shaper spends a click to install eight credits for a single click, and then you're meant to like put down ice that they break cheaply with like turbine. Nine credits? It can be nine credits. It's usually not nine credits because you have to pay for the for the you, the muse is usually free free, but you have to pay for the coalescence, right? Did I do my math wrong? Probably play cupellations that legwork. I wouldn't. I think you need the the you don't want to attach additional gates to your multi-axis if you're playing Amelia. You need it to be as consistent as possible. Walk through a two final server for two credits on a simul chip in the AMT final. Still lost, by the way. Oh man. Oh yeah, plus one to Melander J and Padma. Melander J seems messed up. Melander J on being one per turn makes it hard to use though, for sure. Is it actually once per turn? I don't think I realized that. I think Melander J is a problem in criminal. We'll go back to it. I have a replay to talk about. It. Today, unfortunately, is going to be a bit of a Doomer, Doomer stream again. But um, I have some replays to show you, like, the absolute thing that I was afraid of, of, like, Inside Jobs, Central's Mercury. I got bodied by it so hard. A very nice player. This is nothing to be, like, a criticism against a player we played against. But a player did exactly every, played basically the very, very obvious signposted criminal Mercury list. Not a Jaichinho deck, from my understanding. But just, like, Inside Job HQ turn one. Put down Melander J, and I genuinely don't know as a corporation what you're supposed to do about it because it doesn't feel like there's counterplay. And I have a replay to show because like we, we should talk about it. But like the sort of idea of like an inside job R&D to see three cards with like pretty Mary De Silva, I don't know what the counterplay is to that because I don't think there is a counterplay to it. Hey, Michael, it works on ice and upgrades, I think. If you don't have NGO, this would take its slot. What does, Michael? Grinder Corp's feeling bad because of Ashen Epilogue is akin to Wall Street investment firms having to do things. But I'm not talking about Grinder Corp's. Like, Eric, when I'm playing, like, HB, and I get to the end of the deck, and I was like, wow, I survived, you know, three trick shots, and then they just redo it? Like, that's what I'm worried about. I don't I don't have sympathy for Grinder Corp's. 
Is Lobby Somi bannable? Yeah, I think it's bannable. I like playing cards that surprise my friends. Yeah. I went with the no innovation, just spark deck building. I think a lot of people did, and rightfully so, it works. Like, no disrespect to that. But I think there's ways to make... Labisoma is worth not having to build around. Like, it's that good, if you know what I mean. No Labisoma in top four in NPC, clearly not an overpowered card. Oh, cool. Kit was doing really well. After round two, I think Kit only dropped one game, and it was against Rongi. Like, Kit was like eight and one going into round two. Mind you, runners at an NPC in Swiss had a 42% win rate. Which, like, if you ask me, I, I think runners are just crushing on JNet. I'm surprised they gave Shaper Burner. I'm like not surprised they gave Shaper some sort of relevant HQ pressure. It's just wild to me that it seems like the best HQ pressure in the whole game. Muse is an instant speed though. Uh, well, no, but you can simul chip the Muse, which is like using a simul chip for a simul chip. So not exactly, but okay, that's correct. When you give Shapers this many clone chips, what do you want to do is let the Shaper players get so pleased with themselves they get the combos they forget to actually win the game works every time. I don't know. It's like, it's very, very hard to play against someone that has six simul chips, I think. What are you meant to do against Shaper on Burner and Cataloger and Turbine? Uh, you have to play fast. Defensive upgrades have to matter. Playing traps helps, but that's not good. I argue that we might have a problem. I think a lot of the tier one decks, and like, I haven't looked at the NPC because I'm waiting for the footage. I think a lot of the tier one decks have alternate win conditions that are a bit more surprising. I'd agree that you have to probably rush. You have to probably rush. It kind of feels like sort of rezeki ish right now, where it's like you cannot let the game go to turn 14 because heaven forbid they ash an epilogue on you. Uh, but I do think it's probably going to be an issue to a lot of archetypes. That like, and my thesis right now is that there's probably the biggest gap there's been in a long time between a tier two deck and a tier one deck. And that's because we have decks that can actually capitalize on things like six simul chips and HQ pressure and shaper. Or like you can get bodied on every angle now. Something I kind of like about the runner side at the moment is that two out of the three factions are so self-contained that they don't need to spend influence on anything. Only Krim needs not to do on draw. Uh, yeah, that actually seems about accurate. Yeah, I think that's not incorrect. Trick is to convert UAV credits to real credits during the install. I don't even think you need to do that, right? Like, you can play DZ. Uh, that's the best, but the next thing, DZ. The fact that this draws cards, people can rejig coalescences, rejig muses, right? Like, there's so many ways to get value from it, right? Like, if you're playing rejig and you're playing, like, Lilypad, it's nonsense. Hey, Deja Vu, and before Lad Efficiency wins Worlds again. I'm not even sure if Lad's the best version of it, but Lad's pretty good. I was orgling for the King with a sports deck and played into 3x MSC, 3x Muse, 3x Clot Padma, and eventually just had to concede with Clots all over. Yeah. That's the thing that I worry about. It's like playing around simul chip, playing around clone chip was a thing that people did. And at this point, the amount of raw bin recursion for Shaper seems nearly unbeatable. Right, like I, I think the thing I want to play in Shaper right now is just put Imp in Shaper because you can reinstall that damn Imp like 15 times. <laughs> like you could just keep reinstalling that same Imp. Now, why wouldn't I just play Anarch? Lou? Probably should. But I agree. If you're playing against Claude, good game. They have so many angles to make sure there's a Claude constantly. The fact that this is from hand too, like this card is absurd from stack. I think it would be stack and I'd be like, okay, that makes sense. But then Heap and Grip is so wild. You need to try Praxis Envy testing Muse Coalescence. It's a hell of a power trip. Oh my god, Jai. <laughs> That's wild. I might argue that Shaper didn't have enough clone chips before, at least allowed a pawn shop to exist. Who was playing pawn shop before? Also, El Problema is at third bind. Okay, so it's like a weird thing because we didn't have cash. It's strange how like getting a cash back with Coalescence makes you feel that the recursion spam is a bit worse because now there's a way to use a recursion spam as on tempo. Like that's the strange thing is now with Coalescence, you can take any excess re uh, recursion that you haven't used yet and generate tempo and generate forward momentum from it. Maybe it's one thing if people are using Muse to like play Propeller over and over again, which like this card got better or that you can play Euler and Gauss and you can do the things that like admittedly if these are overbearing, it probably feels rough. But these are the sort of things that like Shaper gives you the creativity. I feel like maybe the monkey paw curled here a bit with when I asked for cash is that like, yeah, now we have cash. So now all this extra recursion in most of the matchups I've seen is just just being generated into raw brute force economic engine. Like, again, think about this. This requires a bit of setup. But on your turn, the runner installs a, with a simul chip. They install a muse. That muse installs a coalescence from the bin. So the muse came in for free. The simul chip came in for so coalescence, mind you, came in for two credits. They drew a card because they have a lily pad. They charged an environmental testing, whatever. They got four credits from this, of which they paid two. So they got two credits. So that's a click for five with a card draw. They can do that consistently on most turns. And then next turn, they sell the thing. It's a click for three because they sell the muse itself. 
So obviously there was some setup involved with that. They had to fill the bin. They had to play the NV testing. They had to like install the simul chip and stuff like that. But these sort of like siege engines, it's really hard to play specifically Thunderbolt yesterday where the runner is getting five credits and drawing a card clicklessly at the start of turn. And like, you're lucky if you have a regolith. And then at the end of the day, your strength is ice, which like turbine, you know? Should we get remove heap from effect? I'm not sure. I don't think I like remove heap from heap. It's not as poisonous as it used to be where your breakers were in there though. Oh, working prototype. Thank you, Michael. Let's doom him here for dooming as well. Doom is just a move <laughs> backwards. It did go undefeated in Swiss by Eric. Yeah, it's hard to look at Eric and be like, should we, you know, make ban list based off of Eric? Because Eric can bring anything probably and do pretty well. No, disrespect to everyone else. Anyone know if Sokka's again Glacier played against Shaper and NPC? I don't know. You can check. Uh, all the pairings are up on, on Aesop's tables. You can see actually who played everyone. Uh, anyways. There's a round in NPC that was 90% 90, 90 corp wins. Had to recheck the match slips. Yes, I saw. I checked. There was one round that was like two tables were won by corp. So like for all my dooming, this might be totally wrong. This is just how what I've been feeling playing Thunderbolt yesterday, which admittedly is like I shouldn't have done that to myself if I wanted to be excited about the game. Sorry about that. All right, where we are? Where are we? Back to the Thunderbolt talk. I'm so sorry. Okay, we'll finish this up really quickly because I just want to talk about the Thunderbolt cards that don't make sense and they do make sense. And then we'll talk about what we ended up playing. Okay, firstly, Lycian Multimunition is like meant to be the Thunderbolt payout. The problem with ice and Netrunner is when you res your ice, you expect the ice to be resed. <laughs> so if you spend a Lycian to res it twice for six credits, is that a good ice? I'd argue no. So you can ideally are resing this with Vova for cheap. Maybe you're getting your working prototype credit. It's so hard for that to line up. Cybersand Harvester, so hard for that to line up. But my biggest problem with Lycian is while it is one of the few destroyers that's worth resing and de-resing, because technically it is, at the end of the day, having res dice is very important on the table for your most important res de-res card in the whole set, Stegadon. So the fact that my remote ice has de itself means I can no longer Stegadon where they're running R&D. And that made me so genuinely upset with Lycian is that the Stegadon synergy was literally anti-synergistic. Um, and so I actually want to cut this from my from my, my current Thunderball deck, which should be an Asa deck. So keep that in mind. The subroutines are okay. They're not bad. But three credits reses you. Like this is, again, the, the perennial problem. It reses you drafter. It reses you a magnet. Reses you a gatekeeper. And then that card is res for the rest of the game. That is the issue. It's hard to make this a lasting tax because the face check on it is not that bad because runners should not be running. It's like the deck says I'm playing destroyers. Why are you running without a century breaker? So at worst, they pay two credits. You lose a click and a credit and then they don't have an ice. Doesn't seem very good. They take my sweet baby Rococo. They better take clearing house and ambushes with it. They're not going to do it. Socket three matches and kit with Swiss won all three. Let's go. This is why the title is Thunderbust. Yeah. If Lysian said choose up to three instead of choose one or more, it would be a reason to play Thunderbolt. Well, you'd pick zero. If you pick zero, this card would be busted. It wouldn't be busted. It'd be very good. Yeah. I don't want to turn this into tech arms race, but on the other hand, I don't like to call ban so early. No, I don't like to call ban so early. It's just like right now, this is how I feel. And then it's up to us to understand how we feel, what we're seeing, and to build around it. So when I go to GNK this Tuesday, admittedly, it's a casual GNK. Just keep that in mind. Striking the blade. It's just not a good piece of ice, I don't think. Uh, I've seen people install resources and then run. It doesn't happen that often. Generally, you run first in the turn, then install resources. You're expecting the ice to hurt you. Like, that's the part is like, how often do you face check without an icebreaker, especially without a killer into Thunderbolt, assuming that they could just kill you with Sice and Ton. So far, people have been running. <laughs> that's not a knife. Uh, but this is just unfortunate. You have to break all subroutines on most board states if you have things installed as much as only one's going to fire. Uh, but like, again, you can play Drafter. Is Drafter better in your D-Res deck? Unfortunately, yes. Drafter is just kind of better. It is a thing. Active Policing has no inherent synergy with the set. Corporate Hospitality has no in inherent synergy with Thunderbolt as much as it's nice to get back your Vovos. I'd actually rather pay Restore. Uh, Brazilian Government Grid is the interesting one. The good things about Brazilian Government Grid is that plus three strength can matter. It can matter. It's not very good on turn one because you need to have another piece of ice res. So you need to have two ice on the remote server. This is one of the nicest ways to get value from your tithes into the mid to late game. But I'd argue by that time that the mid to late game, they generally break your tithe. The difference between two and three credits is not worth building your whole deck around. Uh, but this could be pretty mean. I used to have three of them in the deck, which was too many because it's a dead draw early. This is also really big cost because you can't play things like Tranquility Home Grid, which I played for a moment there and it was okay. Uh, but yeah, the problem also, it's like hard to put this in a deck and defensive upgrades because this is meant to be your defensive upgrade, but I'd rather have a mana garma most board states. Again, it's really hard to de your AP and destroy your ice because they're all very, very expensive, uh, unless you have Stegadon. 
Cool card with the cool thing with this card in Stegadon though is whenever you res a piece of ice during a run against the server, you may derez another installed piece of ice. Stegadon doesn't care how the ice was derezzed. It'll just give you the minus two strength as long as a piece of ice has been derezzed. So this is whenever each time. So in theory, while it doesn't stack, the idea is you can stag it on an R&D and then you can Brazil on the remote server. So that's kind of cool. This also can go in central servers. This card's probably not bad. It's just like getting to be high strength drafter. I don't know if that's worth derezzing something, something it is. And then there's inherently still synergy where like one of the best cards you have in your whole deck is still Stegadon and derezzing your cards means Stegadon has less reach. So you need to be a bit careful about it. This is the other thing. It's like one of the best derez targets I thought when I was going to build a, 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 uh, a Thunderbolt deck is harmonics. It's really good to derez harmonics. Wave is a sick derez. Echo obviously is a sick derez. You can afford to re-res them and they get a bit better. They get a fair bit better once they scale up. But the problem is, again, if you're playing a Brasilia home grid, sorry, Brasilia government grid, and you're playing harmonics, you're probably not playing Thunderbolt because then at least 60 to 50% of your deck is not AP or Destroyer, which I'd argue the Thunderbolt deck I'm playing is not AP or Destroyer at all. But this is a sort of weird thing. It's like the best D-Res targets, the best D-Res support, just doesn't align with Thunderbolt at all. And that leaves us where we are. At Tithe for easy D-Res, yeah, Tithe is one of the best payoffs here. As much as you can D-Res, you know, a Gatekeeper, you can D-Res a, a Magnet. Sometimes that really matters. Brazil is fun with Lycian, outermost, since it'll be derezzed anyways at the end of turn. Unless they have to run back, right? You're right, it's like a free derez, but like setting that up, like that's a, another big problem with like Lycian. Is like at the late game when they have all their breakers down, and mind you, they're playing Buzzsaw, right? Or they're playing Cleaver. Is you kind of want to pick all of them, because if you pick all of them, they have to break all of them, because you just want to break the subroutines. But then they almost always break this thing for three credits. Or two credits, right? Like if they have Buzzsaw, they have Cleaver, they break this for two credits. So having to pay three constantly that they break for two once they're set up obviously is a losing fight. So it's pretty bad. Would Thunderbolt be too strong if it worked on all ice? Uh, Honestly, I don't know. I think if Thunderbolt worked and didn't give a strength boost, but just added one like weird pseudo end the run subroutine on all ice, I do not know if it would be busted. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into this. But I talked about how I don't like Thunderbolt and I don't like a lot of Thunderbolt support because it just makes the math of breaking harder and attached to AP or Destroyer Ice. That is like a really hard thing to mess up where if you do the math wrong, right? Mind you, we did talk about one of the best cards in this deck, unfortunately, eight strength Stavka. If you do the math wrong, it can cost you the damn game. I don't like that. That being said, how do you make this like what would I want Thunderbolt to be an identity to make me excited to play the other cards that come into this set? I think it's as simple as whenever you derez an ice gain two credits. Whenever you res an ice, first time a turn you res an ice, gain a credit. First time you de -res a turn an ice, gain two credits. That genuinely might be enough for me to play the deck. Would it be busted? Probably. Would probably need some tuning. But that's exactly what I want. Not so much this. I just want a reason to res or de -res my ice that makes me make any sense on tempo. All I want. When you de -res an ice, gain two credits. That means I can afford to de -res my ice. That's all I need. That could be the idea ability. Because inherently that's the problem. de your ice is incredibly expensive. The anti -los, yeah. Like she is nurse early game and it's never nice. I don't even think it's a nice early game. Paying three credits for a non-permanent piece of ice in the early game where you need permanent ice is really, really hard. I've heard design really would rather not have IDs that gain credits or draw cards. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. As much as like it's that's a hard right turn after a lot of this stuff. But like, unfortunately, that's how it works for me. Or every time you derez a card, put a power counter on here. You can use the power counter to do something. Like, it's it, something has to happen that makes the rest of the... Because, like, unfortunately, Thunderbolt just doesn't work with a lot of the derez cards in the set. Because all the best derez cards in Netrunner are not AP or Destroyer, period. Uh, it's just that simple. That idea would wreck Netrunner? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Maybe two credits is too much. Maybe it could be a credit. Like, mind you, ETF exists, existed. Not that it was healthy. Uh, but just something like that. Maybe you have to make it slower, where you get power counters, and you can click it to spend the power counter to get something. Something like that, so you actually plan your turn a bit more. I don't know. There's no right ice res enablers. No. Yeah, not being able to res your ice is a downside for the for the deck as a whole. Rongi, how does it go? By the way, how's your NPC event? So I'll show you the deck that I worked on, and you'll see some of the problems. I think there's a six influence hole that I don't know what to do with. It's called Thunderbolt is trash. Don't read into that. So this is the version I looked at before. Maybe power counter, and then you can click the power counter to gain three. Yeah, you just need something like that. Something that slows you down, but gives you enough money where derezzing makes sense. I scrub 10 10 would do, go again. Hell yeah. Do you stay for more than the weekend? I don't know if you're still there. So, this is the deck list, and this is what it came down to. Firstly, you largely don't play Lightning Laboratory because it doesn't make sense, but you do play Stegadon because Stegadon is the most important card in the whole deck. I'm playing three of them because you need to, and uh, that means we're playing three Ikawa, so we hit an even amount of points, and then we're playing Luminal Offworld. No surprise. 
consistency economy. Our assets, Rashida, regular spin doctor. You could argue a relish shouldn't be in the deck. I don't think a relish should be in the deck. I was looking for something that was high influence, low on slots, that gave us forward momentum because scoring Stegadon sucks. It's just hard to score three ones. So the idea that you can score a Stegadon while setting up your board state while pushing the off world office they can score next turn seemed pretty good. The modern version, I cut a relic for Tukana. Tukana also seemed pretty good because one of the big things with Stegadon is you need other res dice on other servers, and so it allowed us to force to res ice. That being said, obviously Tukana is pretty anti-synergistic with Thunderbolt, but you also look at how little AP or Destroyer Ice we're playing. Hagen is a Destroyer. It's really good in the deck. It is quite good, um, but that's almost it. It's like Hagen, the one Lycian, which I don't like, two Stavka, two Tithe, and Uncell. So it's not even half the ice in our deck, which again, maybe this version of the deck, but I think most Thunderbolt decks are probably better outside of Thunderbolt. That's unfortunate. What else are we playing? Two Greasing, not playing Seamless Launch. Actually feels pretty bad. Maybe we should play Seamless Launch because scoring on off-world offices, we have to show that we're advancing the card. That's not great. We're a single attitude adjustment because we're holding three Ikwas and we never want to score Ikwa early. So we're trying to bury them when they matter. But generally, you try not to score out Ikwas in most games because if you score a Stegadon, scoring a three-pointer doesn't often help you unless you score three st uh, Stegadons. Or sorry, three. Yeah, three Stegadons, I guess. In a lot of my matches, I end up scoring to eight points. It's just an issue. It happens with Stegadon. It's an unfortunate reality of it, but Stegadon has still been pretty good. How about adding Ivik? Ivik is also really hard in the deck, right? Like Ivik is so strange because it seems to be the intersection, but Ivik inherently gets cheaper the more code gates you have rezzed. We res our, we try to derez our code gates. Like we're derezzing magnets. We're derezzing gatekeepers. So it's like really funny how much text is like actively anti-synergistic with our ID ability. Like I'd play Braun over the Ivik, right? Bodo, I think Bodo is like in faction where you have Braun. Bodo is nonsense. Like, we don't care about two net damage. Obviously, they can click through Brawn, but that's whatever. Threat four is kind of ugly for us because we generally score a one into a two. Uh, that's how we go. We generally try and score a Luminal into Stegadon or the other way around, Off-World Office. And then this, we can't really afford to do. We also have Brawn. So I, I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. This Arella, don't know what to do. Probably we could play three copies of like Cyber Sand and hope for the best. Volvo is really important. I think the modern one on JNet is running two Brasilia government grids because you don't need one in your opening hand as much as this card has weirder board states than you think it would. Uh, Jaguarundi didn't make the cut. No, we don't care about core damage. We just don't care about core damage. We're not even playing Drafter. But like the problem with a lot of the core damage cards are for core damage to be an active punishment for the runner, we have to play core damage payoff cards, which is mostly ontological dependence. But like, you're right, this is annoying, but none of our, the deck is synergistic with this. And the runner eventually breaks it for one credit. We have no reason to derez Jaguarundi for four, but face checking to give the runner a tag and a core damage has no ability with our game plan, where if they're not breaking this, Drafter would be better for us. Like if the litmus test is Drafter is better for you, we should be playing Drafter, but Drafter is better for us on more board states. Then we have Ablative, which is sick. Ablative is really good. It feels like the only one, one of the few ways that you can beat uh, sort of, and not really, but you can technically, if you have an Ablative on R&D, you can beat Cataloger. You want to keep a Spin Doctor in the bin. You don't want to shuffle it back. A teeny, that's a, there's so much AP ice, but all of it's incredibly expensive. The Sabertines have nothing to do with their game plan. So if I wanted to have an Atini that for one run was slightly higher strength, right? It's like, I would rather just in faction play MIC. This is a really hard thing. It's like, it's hard to make AP ice make sense with your game plan unless you're building into it. And at the end of the day, we have a teeny not at home. In fact, a teeny is MIC at home, right? Like we would just play this. Charlotte, she's too influenced, but she's very slow. Like, I'd rather play NGO Friend over Charlotte, probably. Click the tier twice and they click for credits with the two extra clicks. Yeah, yeah, tier you could play. Play against Thunderbolt with Bodo and I noticed that zero of the res dice actually end the run. Yes, that's a problem. As soon as you play too much AP ice, nothing ends the run. And then you really have to build around, like, playing Snare or, like, playing, uh, and, uh what's it called? Uh, f f Anemone, right? Like, you have to build into making net damage matter. Sarevna is actually neat. Forgot to mention it. Yeah, but how do we ever afford to re de res a Sarevna? This is, it's like... No oh, man, there's so much ice that like seems okay, but you have to remember your ability works with this once. We don't care about tags. This is whatever. We have to pay the runner. Like this being three strength for a single run is not worth two influence. Is this better than drafter for a game plan? No, drafter is just better. It's like, it's really, really unfortunate. There's so many like interesting things you could do that just come down to like, doesn't make a lot of sense. This is our deck. So I played a slightly different version. Mind you, we were we played six games. We tend to won four of them. Um, we played against, I think, some newer players. We had some like really hard fought games, a lot of like big rig shaper stuff, which is pretty difficult. Uh, that's not what I wanted. The changes I made since, and I don't know where we stand on them so far, but I honestly 
It's like this deck, if you don't score uh, the Stegadon, you don't do anything. Things that I've changed since, we're on two Tukana. So that is our like tempo forward thing. And then we're playing one copy Restore. We're playing Restore specifically because Vovo is one of our most important economic cards and we want Restore. What are we not playing? We're not playing any real defensive upgrades. So we don't have Managarm. So basically our ice is as good as the runner is scared of it and as good as our ice is taxing. That's not a great place to be right now in standard format. That's a, maybe a different thing, but it's just not a good place to be in. You definitely want Managarm. You definitely want Anoetic. We could play in the Tukana slot. We probably should. We can try out Cybersand Harvester. Maybe we should. We can try it. If you have any influence decisions, please let me know as much as I'm harsh on AP or Destroyer Ice. Please, hopefully I, that's not discouraging for suggestions. I'm so sorry. Um, we're also not playing Seamless Launch, which I think we should. But this is inherently the issue is our resin and de-resin gear ice is expensive. So as much as we have Vovo, Regolith, Rashida, and Hedge Fund greasing the palm, we need more money in the deck if we can. So it's hard to find slots because 16 ice is already not a lot. What is your game plan out of Thunderbolt and why you're not doing it out of PDA? So Chenchling, that's my hypothesis is that this deck, and I think most D-Rays decks are just strictly better at PD or Asa, which to me is like a damning spot, unfortunately, for Thunderbolt. So let's make this slightly more consistent. Let's try Cybersend. I feel like T-Bolt may really like one or two bifurcation. Yeah, I had bifurcation in for a minute. Like we played one less Iqua and one bifurcation. It made more sense with like uh, Arella and Tucana. But again, that's the big thing with bifurcation is you actually don't want more D-Res, you want more res, right? Because like, in terms of Thunderbolt, what sentries are worth paying the res cost again to get an extra strength and an extra subroutine? The answer is nearly zero besides Stavka. The reality of the matter is there's almost nothing worth de-resing that has AP or Destroyer on it in the card pool, period. So you're right, bifurcation makes sense because de-resing like an ablative is really good, but that's why we play Stegodon. You'd actually want a card that says res one of your ice sooner than you want a card that says de-res one of your ice because once you score Stegodon, the second is the issue. Attitude, yeah, attitude makes money. Why not sprint? Because attitude makes money. And it's uh, better on tempo card uh, to find more cards, but it makes money. We need money. You consider ADT instead of Offworld? We really need money. Offworld also is like a bit ugly because, you know, admittedly, it's a bit of circular logic, but if we res our, our, our on sell, our, we really don't have a text box at that point. Yeah, ADT turns off Thunderbolt. It's like not great. I think we could easily do like. Another Stavka might make sense. Like, I think Stavka is that good. Unfortunately, six clone chip shaper is real, so it's not that great. So we could try like two Cybersand Harvesters. We'll see if people will trash them or not. And then we have one influence spend somewhere, or two influence actually. So we can cut something for a third Cybersand. And I think Cybersands you need as soon as you can on the table. I'm just pretty sure people are going to trash these. Turns off T-Bolt, but gives you res dice to then de-res. Yeah, but I'd rather just have seven credits, I think. If we weren't playing Stegadon, yeah, we would play it. But it's there's it's very hard to imagine it's better than seven credits because you need a lot to res and de-res. What about Hammer? Hammer is hard. Giving Hammer an extra strength doesn't really matter. It's not bad. It costs a lot. It would be the most expensive card in our deck. Uh, we don't care about the tag. Trash a resource or hardware is fine. Trash the Decode Refractor Killer is a subroutine we already have on three copies of Hagen. So we don't really need to go out of the way to play more copies of Hagen. It doesn't consistently end the run. Like, unfortunately, this deck, Hagen, seems to be just strictly better than Hammer, as much as this has cool uh, text on the top. I feel like you're forcing yourself to use this idea. I am. But I'd argue that this is probably one of the most consistent ways to value this idea, is to play Stegan on D-Res. But we'll try it in something else. Anemone, again, we don't care about damage, so it's like value Anemone. I don't like it. Half run to get more likely blowout. It's really hard because you have to set it up. And we don't actually have that many blowouts. Right, like Afro and Uncells are only blowout because all of the other stuff just ends the run. Like, like this is an Andre complaining about making a Thunderbolt deck and he puts the least amount of AP or Destroy in his Thunderbolt deck, but like just inherently, D res and, and AP or Destroy doesn't seem to overlap. So maybe the idea is you play a Thunderbolt deck, you just res six ice and you're just happy with it. Why do we not have 3x Tithe? Because it's not that good. Tithe is okay in the early game. In the mid game, once it becomes a legitimate target to derez, it's often not better than derezing your other stuff. And by the time the runner, like you can derez this, is about the time that the runner can break this. And adding additional one cost to break tithe doesn't matter. It's weird. It's like good enough on centrals early, as much as heaven forbid you play against Mercury. But in the mid game, it's a really bad draw. And then as a derez target, once you have Stegadon, it's not even your best option. Like you're much rather derez ablative, obviously, a gatekeeper, magnet. It's just Stavka. It's like, Usually the worst D-Res target, as much as the cheapest thing to D-Res for like Brasilia. It's really strange. 
I enjoy playing Haverns and Weird Border Control. Yeah, Haverns not bad. Haverns not bad. Let's just play 13 Influence, I guess. I don't know what else to do. Is there like a 2 Influence card that seems exciting? Like, there's an argument to maybe play a Swordsman, but I feel like just getting an 8 Strength Stavka is pretty good. It's probably a bit more consistent than Swordsman. 8 Strength Stavka seems good. Like, maybe it's the best thing we can do. What is the tier list video coming out? So we recorded the runner side with Jeff on Saturday. I'm recording the corpse side with Jeff on Wednesday. His is going to come out first. So probably next week. Can restore for another attitude adjustment? I like restore a lot. Because getting Vovo on the table is important. Let's just try like this and see. I feel like you're spreading the deck too thin and trying to do reg HP deck, which isn't what Thunderbolt feels like excels in. I'd argue that Thunderbolt doesn't excel in anything. Doesn't Diviner get decent numbers on res? For one turn, having a four strength Diviner is not a reason to write home for. Like, it's one turn, Koga, right? One turn to get a, a Diviner that sometimes ends the run. Just play a third Cybersend, cut a Rego. Yeah, F it. That's a good idea. We'll just try Cybersend. Like, this is the, 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 the appeal of Thunderbolt, and I get it. It's like, wow, the Diviner can be a meaner res, right? But it's four strength for one run. And then if you ask me in the HB deck, are you going to derez your Diviner or are you going to derez the five other cards that actually have good derez energy? You're never going to derez the Diviner. Games are one and lost. What happens during one turn, though? I agree with Diviner. What do you agree with Diviner? About having it in the deck? Like, do you ever put this on your mode server? Probably not. You put it on your central. It's really hard. It's like one turn, but like Gatekeeper, you need one or two runs. Yeah, but the difference is Gatekeeper is six strength. This being four strength and only sometimes ending the run is a very big difference than Gatekeeper. Right? Like, it, it's really tricky. Does it seem like I have a good strength for res cost? Do you know what it does? Tributary. Should the deck just play Tributary? Probably. But then people aren't running and we don't res our ice. Is Hakarl too expensive? Yeah, Hakarl is too expensive. We can never afford to de-res Hakarl. Also, we don't care about core damage. We unbanned Engram Flash, but only for Thunderbolt. It'd be pretty good. Be pretty good. A crawl being five is rough. And she's been trying to make timing of ice reds and position of ice matters. So sure, Tithe and Diviner don't have lasting presence, but the turn the runner pushes a conduit dig or deep dive, the extra cost for Thunderbolt can throw off the runner's plan. Yeah, but then the question is where we're putting it, right? Like, are we disrupting legworks? No. Are we disrupting catalogers? It probably doesn't, and you don't really have a, a big opportunity cost of playing cataloger. So does it disrupt the remote server run? Probably not. It's like people are not playing finality, they're playing cataloger. So check this out. This hand obviously is not good. This is where Lyshen is an issue. Is that if we put Lyshen on HQ, we're forced to res it, and we have now bankrupted ourselves. It costs us two credits. In fact, it could be free with Vovo, but obviously we don't keep this hand. Criminal's not a good matchup when you're playing HB Fundamentalists stuff. Hey, thanks, you too. Because it's really hard to play around all the tech that HB has. Or sorry, Criminal has, right? I'll show you a replay yesterday that really caught me off guard. But like, we're weak to Inside Job, Boomerang, uh, Window of Opportunity, Facerum Entangler. Like, you cannot push out behind a single ice. On that note, all those cards, well, not all those cards, but half those cards too, means we have to play around Diversion. So here we probably open with Spin Doctor. Gatekeeper on HQ is not great once the Amaku comes down, but we can't let HQ open into Zaya, especially with this hand. So this is where like Tithe is really awkward. It's nice in the early game, but if we put a Tithe on HQ, who's laughing? Them or us? I think it's them. Right? Like this on HQ is not what you want against Criminal. This on R&D is fine though, but only for one good run. After that, it's like up to them whether they want to take the damage or not. Cyber Sand Harvester worth considering. Zombie, yeah, we just had to three to the deck. I'd argue it's hard to protect. Gatekeeper and HQ isn't much better. No, it's not much better, but at least we'll fix our hand if they hit it. I think we probably want to have the hedge fund here because if the Gatekeeper gets rezzed, we're out of the game. We can leave R&D open for one. we we'll just hit a breaker and win the game. Yeah. <laughs> All right, maybe we should ice R&D. Who knows? All right, we lost the Stegadon. Yeah, we're in 3x now. Gatekeeper and HQ makes the target for D-Res. It does, but like for D-Res to matter, we have to score one of these, which is hard against Criminal. You need two ice on a remote survey. All right, Gatekeeper is not exactly cooked because this is pretty expensive. So Stavka is good. You want to have it on the outermost, but you also don't want to have it on the outermost. Isn't Gatekeeper getting boomeranged? Yes, but everything is, right? Like there's nothing you put on HQ that's not getting boomeranged in this deck. But sorry, maybe MIC. So this is where things get really hard. It's like we're not sure what they're capable of. They know we have a Stavka. 
We need to put them in remote server, but their hand likely has some combination of like bypass tricks. So scoring behind a single ice is like not a thing you want to do. This is again where Tithe is really bad, is that Tithe is not great on many board states where we cannot consistently score out behind a Tithe, right? So like this is an ugly card. This quintessentially goes on R&D, that's fine. The more we draw, the more pressure on centrals. Attitude adjustment with this hand, not exactly it. If we draw another one, we'll be maybe there. So what do we put on remote server? Stop on the innermost is okay. Push off world behind Tithe, okay. Stop on the outermost, like it has eight strength. I think we have to put it there and hopefully we trade the Shibboleth for a Stavka and we just put a regolith in there or something. It's hard. It's really hard. I think scoring out behind H into a criminal right now is, is nearly impossible to tell what they're capable of because criminal has like seven different cards that are all playable that all cheat around one to two ice. Chesva. Okay. So now running HQ is very possible. Uh, we did not draw another ice. We probably attitude this because we're not looking for an off world office score soon. Ico in hand. Well, we don't want to score that. So that's going to go. So that takes pressure off HQ, which is nice. I wish we had a second ice here. This is where, again, where Brasilia is a three of doesn't feel that great because the runner is in control of you resing your cards. So Brasilia is totally blank unless, again, we get a, another piece of ice here. We have to res that one, res this one, de res the first one. It could work. It could work. But I'm pretty sure if we put a Vovo here, they inside job this before they face check. Because, again, we're full of destroyers. We're going to get cheated around. Hogan's pretty good. Here, if you ask me, we have to ice up centrals. But if we ice up centrals, we'll never push in a remote server. So gatekeeper in front of HQ is probably, sorry, Hog in front of the gatekeeper on HQ is probably correct. But like the question is, how do we score out? <laughs> like it's so hard unless you have a really good tempo ability, which our ability hasn't mattered yet. It kind of changes how they run that we can't push in a remote server that soon. Maybe we have to understand that the runner thinks we have scary ice so they don't face check like Sice and Tons a problem that we could just be a more rushy PD deck. Restore gets us nothing. We might need a cycle spin doctors here. I think we do. I always want to keep one spin doctor in the bin because of a blade of barrier. That was terrible. I still consider putting the Vova in the remote server and drawing out the bypass. Yeah, we're going to do it sooner than later. I just wanted another ice to draw out the bypass plus a tool. Wolf 2 says push the off off behind the Stavka. Yeah, but we have to advance it. Like, we don't even have seamless. Like, they know it's an agenda. We advanced it. And even at the end of the day, the Stavka doesn't end the run. Like, they just trash their two credit daily cast. So we have to go for this. Vova's probably better on HQ. Sizenton seems pretty great in here. Yeah, it does until like flip switch or people don't run into their breakers. It's hard to tell, like if you don't know your opponent, how careful they are. Like they're not running. This could have been a seamless agenda. It's the best we got. Ordering there is pretty bad. Let's just get some money. Here there should be agendas in HQ. Aku, how's it going? Twinning's down. Sure gamble. Siege engine, right? Great. All right, we just got to go. I wish we had a Stegadon. That would be the best score we have here. I wonder if it's worth getting a DRM to grab Stegadons because it is that important to the, the game plan of the deck. The longer you take the push agenda, the more install they have to trash the Thunderbolt bonus subs instead of needing to break it. Yep. Oh, we're not playing with virus, by the way. Oops. Oops. That being said, Thunderbolt's plus one strength is like somewhat impactful to Amakua. Where did they spend the two credits? Oh, to boost the Shibboleth. Yeah, right, right, right. All right, no Hermes yet. In fact, no Hermes at all. That's good. We're not on threat three for a Blade, which is a really important breakpoint. Uh, I don't think we need the restore here. It's not bad, though. I think we just throw out Ikua. The problem is they're going to check archives every turn because of Amakua. So throwing out agendas is like kind of rough. Hagen's really good into Amakua if they biff it because it comes in at plus one strength. Uh, and it eats turtles for dinner. I think hoping the Stavka connects is the best plan we have. Maybe the deck should be on three Stavka. Like, it's just that rude. I'll throw out the restore. I just, I don't know. Maybe keeping this many agendas in hand is really bad. They drop a sneak door. I don't think they will. They're using too much of their MU for other stuff. Via archives. Yeah, this is why we don't throw out an agenda. So the thing is, like, the way that they deal with Stavka is probably... A boomerang or something that I'm not sure we need to put the Brazilian here. Docklands? Okay, we should get the agendas out of hand. Hoping something connects doesn't seem like a good strategy. No, it's not a good strategy modernly in the meta. So this looks like a defensive upgrade. Obviously, they put a Docklands pass. We want to keep the... The thing is, like, they're not running because they're probably scared of not having their, their killer yet because we say destroyer all over our D ability. But boomerang? Tithe? That's just fine. 
Brazilian Grid's probably a discard. It's not bad into Amakua. It's actually okay. But now they're going to lock the top of the deck. We have a Spin Doctor. You generally want to trash the Spin Doctor before you go for this lock. We're going to res the Tithe here. They really chewed through the deck? Yes, because we haven't made them do anything. This has three subroutines on it. So this costs them nothing. We got credit. So this is where like Tithe, by the time that you're generally resing the Tithe, it doesn't matter. So like while Tithe seems really good in Thunderbolt, I'd actively argue it doesn't do anything. They're also accessing here with, oh, they do have enough credits on Chesva. You want to access with two credits there. But they had enough. You want to respect Aquas. But I don't think they're doing the remote server. Now they lock the deck. Well, with Spin Doctor, they haven't locked their deck. Restore has more options. Yeah, I agree. Restore probably has more options. Well, we're on game point for some reason. It's easier to get a game point where they just ignore the remote server. But maybe they're scared of like, I don't know, Cloud Eaters or Anansi's or something. Crip here. Okay, the gang's almost all here. Killers somewhere. Jailbreak HQ. Let's go. Okay. This is where like having the Brasilia on the Hagen actually really matters. Because if we had the Brasilia here, the Hagen comes in at six, seven, four. It would be eight strength. It would actually eat the Amakua. So Hagen has one more strength. Enjoy the math. So they break it for two. Uh, Gatekeeper, I don't think they can break it. So I feel about Stegadon deck with Winslow. We're just on game point by not scoring Stegadon. I've scored Stegadon on every game I played so far, I think, with this deck, and it's been sick. This is Cyber Sand issues too. Like it's it's unfortunate having an economy card that is like not very good in the late game, and we're not really able to put these out uniced because of Almakua. That being said, they still have archives open. This is also where like Lycian is like really rough because Amakua beats it. So putting that back in R and D is not great. We shuffled R and D. Five man's R and D. Oh, I think they'd go R and D there to see two cards. We just shuffled. This Krim plays like a Shaper, but rightfully so, right? Like, we're not going to do anything quickly. All our abilities about resing Ice, if they ignore us and just set up, like, they likely can lock the game out. Because now they're locking R&D again. We don't have a reason to shuffle. They have a click and two credits at a minimum. Cyber Santa is really good late game. Only if you score an early Thunderbolt. Oh, I, I'm not, we're not even playing Thunderbolt. David, how's it going? Just get lucky in R&D. It's that easy. They're on two credits. <laughs> they have more money here. How do you feel about going pure FA and not having a remote, focusing on icing? Pycat, how's it going? I think with Shaper being the way Shaper is right now with all the recursion, it's hard to be clawed. How is your name PC? But I also don't like, like I inherently avoid uh, fast advance waiting room decks. We have to double it. Whoa. We have to double advance this because we don't have seamless. Whoops. With Stegadon, I could see it if we fast advance that Stegadon. They have 11 credits. They can probably beat this. But even if they do, maybe we should have kept a Nico on hand. Uh, because jamming the second eco would be really important. Now, like, if we can't de the Stavka, things are pretty bad. But they're going to have a lot of money to charge this remote server. All right, they're charging it. So a Blade of Barrier will fire. This is why we go to the way to keep a Spin Doctor in the bin. We can also get a Rashida. But they have 15 credits, so it's going to be hard for the 8-strength Stavka to matter. That being said, we can de something. NPC was incredible. 11 to 10, I had such a great time. Got to hear. Hell yeah. We'll res the Ablative. So we can install something from HQ or from the bin. It has to be in another server, so we can't rescue the Ikoa, which looks like it's going to be eaten by them. So the question is, Rashida or Spin Doctor? Rashida costs them a click, not a credit if they Debbie it, as much as that still is a credit. So you can make it 11 strength Stravka. Yeah, they can still beat it, though. They have enough money. Like, it's good, but it's not amazing. Oh, we should have res Vovo first. Also, res your Vovo. Arguably, we shouldn't have. Like, maybe we should. But it shows them it's not a defensive upgrade. They play differently. Like, the Vovo here saves us, like, four credits. Three credits. And them playing around a defensive upgrade, I think, is much more important for us. Like, I'd argue that not raising the Vovo is correct sometimes. Cybersand bucks? Okay. Two credits from Cybersand? Like, they have to play around this being a Managarm or Anoetic. I think that's more important than saving three credits on this run. When all our ice is rezzed. So we res Brasilia. We res Stavka. Want to resing Brasilia? It matters only on this one. It's only once per turn or once per run. Yeah. So we'll res Brasilia. We'll trash. We can trash the Ikwa, actually. That's pretty fun. Wow, Stavka's sick. Wait, Stavka Brasilia is sick.
<laughs> Wait, they can't steal these items in the remote server ever. They have to charge the Brazilian here. Wait a second, have we found prison? Because every run through this, we get a spin doctor on the table. We have to figure out how to derez a Stavka. Oh, this is really funny. This is really funny. So they still have to trash all this stuff. Great, we bankrupt them. The very few destroyers that actually cares about derez. And we have to derez this now. Uh, so they have a click and two credits, so we have to spin this. We should have got another spin on the table, not Rashida. I, I didn't realize how good that combination was. So we'll keep one spin in the bin for sure. Uh, I think next up is a Brasilia or a Restore. Probably Brasilia. Why well, no Vovarez? Them playing around a defensive upgrade was more important than us saving two credits on that interaction when all our aces rezzed. That's my guess. Did I slightly forget? Yes. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of times where you don't res the thing because the way that they have to consider playing around stuff, right? Like if they realize that we have to break the Stavka, which they do anyways, maybe you don't break the end of the red subroutine. Maybe you do. When did Aqua hit the bin? Uh, we trashed it with Stavka. It's sick. But now, unfortunately, all our ice is broken by credits. We just have to purge. But purging while archives is not iced up is a mistake. Yeah, that interaction was actually kind of sick, let's be honest. Just keep them busy. Just keep them busy. As soon as we res this, though, they don't have to run it. That's not good for us. But they probably are going to avoid running this because of Ablative. Icing up archives and purging like doesn't really make sense with our Ice Suite and them having Chesva. So I just don't think we can afford to purge. The problem is once Amakua gets to like 11 strength, it's not very good uh, for us. And this is where like Thunderbolt ceases to be relevant. This is what I mean, like the good stuff criminal decks, right? Like this deck is very, very similar to the deck that came in second at Worlds. I think there's a huge gulf between uh, tier two decks and tier one decks more than I feel like it's ever been. Maybe that's because people are playing some janky decks and figuring out the new cards. I think that's a big part of it. But like, it's hard to see this, which is like the most efficient runner deck you can probably build in the criminal side versus like playing Thunderbolt. It feels like we're playing two different games. All right, they're not running last click. That's good for them. So we can guess a spin doctor here. So we res the cyber sand. It breaks even. We res the ablative. We get a spin doctor on the table. Seems fine. In fact, we could get, <laughs> we can get the, what's it called? The, oh no, we shuffled it back. The, um, the thing. Yeah, fire all. See, maybe raising that was actually wrong. It turned off our win condition. And now we showed the cyber sand, they don't have to run it. That actually might have been a very, very big strategic mistake. Oh, Brazilian's back though. We just need to figure out how to derez the blade of. Oh, we did mess up. We shouldn't have res the blade of. So we have to purge, I think. I think we have to purge. You have to purge at some point. Anyways, how are you game winning the game without? Yeah, you're right. I don't know how. And this is the problem when your deck is ice. It's like you have to purge at some point. So we can put a Brasilia in here. What's the most taxing thing we can put on archives? Like Hagen, they break for free. They run R&D relatively cheaply. We have four credits. We have six credits, technically. Do we do this? Do we just keep them busy? Actually, this shouldn't be that. Just keep them busy. They have 15 credits. Their economy's unending. Like these are the sort of games where the end of match screen is like really, really funny. The difference in economies. Okay. So we have Vovo. We can res Vovo to make a big Stavka, which they have to break. It's the best we got. Res, res, we'll make it eight strength. Take that Amakua. And I'm going to trash the Vovo. So they have to boost. So that's the best we got. We made them to pay five from pocket one time. It's a tithe. Again. Is this better than having a drafter in the slot for the one situation where Tithe got rezzed and has an extra subroutine? No, I would argue it's not. 
They should twinning. Yeah, they are. They're going to see three cards here. Offworld. Nice. Okay. Okay, cool. Just forcing him to run stuff. Ablative is a bit of a bummer to Kurapira, but we, this is the most taxing barrier. We have a Hagen, which comes in at like four strength or something, so it's not that bad. Economic power, Crim Companions is disgusting. It is. This is gross. Alarm clock. The game is over. <laughs> like, they have ignored us for long enough that they can set up the siege, and the game is over. So how do we derez? Uh, I don't know. Uh, step one was score a, 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 a Stegadon, and we can't do that. We cannot score out a Stegadon. Like, we just didn't draw a Stegadon. If we had a Stegadon here, the game gets interesting. <laughs> you see the problem? I forgot step one, score three, one, yeah. And again, this is where, like, Thunderball gets really rough, because in the mid to late game, where you arguably need your ID ability the most, it doesn't it doesn't have you. Uh, this is where Lyshen is bad. We'll purge. It doesn't really do anything because running R&D only costs them like a credit. We should concede, right? Ask them to window of opportunity to blade a barrier nicely and decline the res. You know how sick that would be? We can even res it. We don't have to decline. Yeah, Alarm Clock's also like really good because you can't lock out Amakua decks that hard anyways anymore. Not that like you can lock this out. A second Cheswick coming down would be like a big issue, but they're, no, they're MU is full. I'd argue they could discard the Amakua, but they shouldn't. It cost us a turn. They're not trashing the Brasilia. A bit surprised. But again, we have to de our stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so what gets me is like when the power level mismatches this bad, you just start stop making decisions. Like, we're not making any decisions anymore in this game. Uh, it's just like, how do you want to lose? When do you want to put the thing in the remote server? We didn't build a good deck, so it's not on us. Like, it's 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 on us. Paladin, Mystic left, okay. Oh, we haven't got Diversion yet. Do you think they're on Diversion? I think they might not be on Diversion. It seems like a slots issue. I think they would have Diversioned us on four credits if they had Diversion. Thunderbolt seems like a jammy rush deck with the extra tax idea ability. Grants is meant to lean on the Neron's early economy stop you to rush. Yes, but I think rush remote decks right now are really, really bad. Because you cannot rush into Burner, you cannot rush into Criminal. Yeah, I don't think they're on Diversion. Yeah. Are you winning, son? Yeah, we're winning. Look at that, two offworlds is pretty good. We're just going to big deal out there, uh, or 5-3, and we have it. Just got to get to that 18. Second Chesva, oh my god. They did overinstall their Amakua. I honestly don't know if that's right. I think the amount that Amakua saves you, but that being said, everything here is low strength, so yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, now they're clicking for credits. They should hit R&D every turn, but I guess they lock the top of the deck. All right, good game. Thanks for the game. Yeah, anyways. It's like, it's a bit, you know, you need the Stegadon to fire. You need the Brazilians. The Brazilians actually felt a bit good. But like, yeah, look at that. 110 credits to 56. Again, we're playing our, you know, not very good Thunderbolt deck against this. It's going to happen. It's just like, this doesn't make an interesting game. Here's like a big problem with Thunderbolt. If you don't get Stegadon, the deck sucks. And even when you do, do you ever win? I have been winning consistently when scoring Stegadon. And I think Stegadon, though, is like, it's an easy thing to misplay into. Uh, and you have to hope that your the runner makes a mistake into it. Because uh, say we score to Stegadon, all our opponent does is only lock R&D. Like, they just only run R&D, so Stegadon is, eventually becomes useless. Because they can win by just running R&D. Try something jammy with DRM to get the Stegadon? Yeah, let's try one more, but I don't think you're wrong. I, I think getting the Stegadon out is so important, we should play DRM. We'll do one more, though, like this. Cyber Sands seemed bad. They seemed bad. Uh, just because they don't do anything. Stegadon with Thimble Rig. Uh, Thimble Rig's not a bad idea, actually. But David, you notice like the more and more we go further away from AP and Destroyer Ice, as as is gonna body us. As is a really rough matchup on the basis that Boomerang beats our entire shtick. Uh we don't like this hand because it has an echo on it, but it has hedge fund and ice for centrals. That's not too bad. Thanks, you too. So there's some really cool decks. I think Seb played at the MT, played uh as Seb. So like as meeting of the minds, get into DJ Fenris. That's a cool deck. So like we'll probably have to play around Iru, Ayase Pessoa, stuff like that. Feels like my virus is needed in the meta. I think it is. 
I think it is. How are we doing on time today? Oh, it's only one? Hell yeah. We started early. Okay, hedge fund. Hogan on HQ is fine. It could maybe eat a chess or something. Uh, what do we want on the remote server? Magnet doesn't beat Boomerang because it's only programs. Uh, I've also seen like Trojan as. Hogan on the remote server is good into Fizerum and Tangler. There's a chance as is on Fizerum. It's just like we don't have no ice that beats Boomerang consistently. We don't really need ice up centrals. This plays around like Chesva prognostic, but all of this ice gets boomeranged really hard. Stego the ID. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to res this. This is a good face check. I like this face check a lot. Like drafter is the worst case, but in Thunderbolt, right? You're not scared. I'm not scared of the, uh, the old, what's it called? Sice and Tan, huh? Like I, maybe we just have to play Sice and Tan because some players do this. And like, if we call hardware, there's a chance that as is dead. Like, is this correct into Thunderbolt? I'd argue that the opportunity cost of calling this wrong is not worth it compared to other HB. Thunderbolt helps with Boomerang. Yeah, but not really. I don't think we can afford to go down here. We just have to hope that they don't hit the Ikua. If they hit the Ikua, Blade is on, so that's fine. If he takes it. Yeah, 5 credit is a big price for Sice and Ton, mind you. It will end the run. Like, in theory, this ends the run. Obviously, it does. Even a tithe here would end the run. Hagen, best hit. Got lucky. Class I cast. Nice. You shouldn't risk Sice and Tan because you're winning slow game against Thunderbolt. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like Thunderbolt doesn't seem powerful that you need to take that risk. That's not a good top deck. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I think we draw here and we get a Cyber Send down. So at least the face checks are bad. Now we have to res the Hagen, unfortunately. Ideally, we fix this hand soon. We do Hagen, Tithe, Stegadon next turn. Actually, probably that's what we do next turn. I don't care about the Axis here. Admittedly, Aquas are safe, but there's only uh, six agendas and 39. It stops a credit, but like going down, we need our money to res this Hagen, this Hagen, so we can't really spend this money. That being said, we could res Cyber Sand, but that like actually brings us down to four credits, which makes things really ugly. Hagen, Tithe, Stego, Remote next turn. Yeah, it's the best we got. Now, this gets blown out by HQ pressure because, again, Hermes, but when in Rome. Res Cyber before the ice? Yeah, if we're going to res the ice, we'll res Cyber, but not always. Because there are some cases where we actually need, like, five credits to res this, and resing the Cyber Sand ducks us below five, so we actually can't. So you end up resing the Cyber Sand and cracking it. Like, actually, in the early game where you have to res your ice, paying two on Cyber Sand can be wrong. It's, like, really unfortunate that it actually genuinely can be incorrect. Like, here we can't res the Cyber Sand. I'm happy that we can res this, though, into Hermes. Because, like, Cybersand isn't credit positive until later on. So, Tehran can't really beat this unless it's Inside Job. Inside Job actually beats this. And if we res the Cybersand, we have to crack it immediately before Skagadong. Like, I just want to make it very clear that Steg Cybersand Harvester is way clumsier than it looks on the tin. At least we have it. Because if we res a cyber sand for two, showing what it is, we have to immediately trash it because we can't score at the agenda. Like it's really ugly uh, in a lot of cases, unless you have good money up front. Okay, so now deresing tithe is okay. We need to get something res on R and D. These are not great deres targets, and a blade of here would be okay. Again, if Tron didn't pressure HQ, choose a deres. I'm good. Thanks. Uh, I think we're okay with Tron trashing that if he wants. And Miss Bones will come down sooner than later. But like we like to have one of these in the bin because of Ablative and Restore. Like I don't always shuffle my Spin Doctors back. Or sorry, RFG them. Yeah, that seems right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, not like that. You're good. Let's see how long we can take to recover from the financially ruined cause by scoring a 1-3. Yeah, it'll take a bit. It'll take a bit. Yeah, do it up. Because next turn we inst like top deck greasing palm would be the best possible. Mind you, again, Hannah, if we pop the spin doctor, the run is not considered unsuccessful. Uh, this is fine. We'd love to top deck a tithe for R&D. That'd be the best case. Because it's a really cheap res, D-Res. Heading off to my locals. Thanks for the stream. We'll catch the rest of the VOD later. Oh, Manuel. Yeah, this is going to be the Seb deck. Enjoy your, uh, your uh, locals, Lucille. Glad to hear you're going out and playing some games. Hey, Daniel, how's it going? Hope you're doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you. I'm playing Thunderbolt, so I'm a bit crabby, <laughs> but I'm doing okay. We're like, we're looking into the card pool. Let's say that. 
it actually might have been correct to risk R and D open and then just like go server three. Yeah, hot pursuit. This is good. Uh, Hagen, nothing to derez. Still relatively expensive, but we're gonna get here, mind you, nine credits. We paid two for it and a tag. So Ikka was risky on sell was a good hit. Why are you seeing two cards? Oh, because you're tagged. Yeah, that's really good. All right, Ablative is online. Tehran probably, like, I don't know. You probably clear the tag here. Yeah, this is brutal. We just don't have the economy to sustain this. We just simply don't have the money to sustain this. And we're, like, having Asa group. Like, this is quintessentially it, and I'd argue, obviously, I built a deck that's better into Asa than Thunderbolt. I think building a Thunderbolt deck is nearly impossible. But, like, if we were Asa group, we'd actually be uh, a fair bit better on board than this. Oh, that's not a good draw. Okay, so we're going to draw once. We're going to ice R&D. We're going to put Rashida in server three. Oh, that's even better. Ignore it. Ignore everything. Ignore everything. Rashida. Vovo. So Tithe, Cybersend, Vovo actually is credit positive. I don't know if we can risk Hagen, though. We probably can't. Uh, another, uh, what's it called? Hot Pursuit would be a problem. Manuel with Hot Pursuit is kind of cool. I know Jai's deck is on Hot Pursuit. I'm pretty sure for Criminal, uh, for, for Seb. Uh, I'm not on it. But I think if you're playing actual, like, real breakers, it's pretty great. Okay, here we go. So how do we get out of this? We have too many cards on hand, but we have a Spin Doctor, so it doesn't really matter. The Lycian is pretty good. It's reasonable here on R&D. The problem is, again, Lycian's not good with Stegodon, because we want permanently res dice for, obviously, the things we want to do. We don't have seamless launch in the deck, which we definitely should fix. So, like, installing offworld behind Tithe Hagen is really difficult on 15 credits, a breaker, and then, like, boomerang. Uh, so that's hard. Here, we probably want to throw two Ikuas into the bin. So we can install here two cards. So we need ice up R&D. None of this ice is particularly good into Boomerang. We need to get a second ice on HQ. Is Elisha on HQ good enough? Not really. We can move the Vovo over if we don't jam. Elisha with no subtypes forces an Amaku or Boomerang install though. You can't choose no subtypes. It's one or more. Yeah, Michael, this came up before. If you could choose no subtypes, Elisha would be interesting. Uh, but the fact that you can't choose no subtypes means that it'll always have at least two subroutines. Yeah. Yeah, it says one or more. Yeah. So you can't pick... If it's an up to three, then you can pick zero. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Lyshin could go on top of Cybersand. Ideally, we're never icing the Cybersand. And if we do ice the Cybersand, like, we just threw out the ice. I don't know if we have to ice this up. And I was terrified of seeing it out in the wild. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. I don't think you're going to see it. Ugh, okay, I'm just going to put this on R&D. I'm just going to put something on HQ. If this hits, I guess it's okay. And then we'll just click for credit. We'll throw out two Ikuas. It's a shame that we're not developing the board here. Uh, we want to throw the Ikuas because we don't want to score them next. There's the Thunder Art Gallery. There's DJ Sebastian. We didn't have to do uh, Beating of Minds. And so now it begins. Amaku is a problem. Uh, we don't have him a virus, but eventually everything will be broken. Uh, the Stavka seems to just genuinely be our best card on many board states. Mind you, this deck is on Hermes. It's not a Masterwork, so I don't know how many Boomerang it would be. I was wondering when someone would do DJ Seb. Yeah, uh, Seb K was playing it at the MT. Oh, Iru. Disgusting. So we can de res the Hagen? Oh, man. Again, they're not resing. If we can't res our ice, Stegodon's not very good. So this is going to see three cards on R&D because we're on threat three. The chance of Hermes bouncing the offworld office is so grossly high. We don't have the Spin Doctor because Iru is not a, an optional ability. All right, it held. Putting a tithe over Cybersand could be good because Cybersand will pay you back for resing it. I just don't know if Tron's ever going to run this. In fact, I don't know if we're ever going to res this because it looks like Tron has a way to beat us without having us res ice, which obviously that's a Thunderbolt issue. And now we have to score this out and let R&D get bounced. Carmen's down. Okay, so we went too slow. All the breakers are there. We just have to score this out. We can't really... Well, we could consider leaving it, actually. Because the next two in R&D are entirely safe, unless Tron forces a Spin Doctor Shuffle, which I'm assuming he should, because he wants the Eero every turn. He sees one new card. Yeah, we just have to score it out. So many Anarch connections. Isn't it cheaper to splash Hot Pursuit and Tag into Seb? Uh, yes, probably. But then you can't play all the cool criminal cards like Bravado and like Diversion and stuff. 
uh, and like this breaker suite. It's cool though. It's cool. As my G does work with connections. Like Seb as together is really good. You can't DJ for as, unfortunately. Okay, on cell MIC. Both of them four strength, technically five strength for one turn on Ancel. Gatekeeper looks okay, not into boomerang. Magnet seems the most middling. We're not gonna see any Trojans. You have a stake down, they'll never run the cyber send. Yeah, they actively should not be running more than one server. <laughs> like the NR card pool, so shallow, I know. I don't think this one's playing our Saris crew, which is great for us. So again, C3 on the top of RD. That's bad. They're on game point. He's going to bounce something. The ice on HQ. Mind you, six points out of the game. You definitely want to be shuffling a Spin Doctor before you're doing those multi axes, especially because they he knows the top two cards of the deck. He definitely should run the Spin Doctor first because he could have seen more cards there, if I'm not mistaken. Hot Pursuit. Okay. And we've got bodied. We've got bodied once again. Stegon just doesn't matter. Feels bad. It feels good against Shaper that's actually running through ice. But like, we have to ice up archives, I guess. Rogue trading. Wait, he has a tag? You can't have a tag. Tron, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm going to do that anyways. I have a Lycian. Am I more scared of him having 18 credits or am I more scared of him having multi-axis? I think I'm more scared of him having multi-axis. I don't think you want to float a tag there. Like Seb has text. Yeah, this is what you want to do. You need to you need to pressure this. Uh no. Thank you. Yeah, six points were out of the game. It's hard to win on R and D as much as he's on game point. This is where you end the line, sir streamer. Yeah, tell me about it. That's Degadon prompt every run. It oh, okay, okay, there you go. Yeah, it's good that he shuffled that back in. Hey, good game. All right. Does having the ability that fires when you res your ice matter? Doesn't look like it. It just genuinely doesn't look like it. Thanks for the game. Mind you, if you want to see this deck, it's posted on our NDB, assuming this is Seb's deck, Seb's Seb deck. Uh, it's, uh, it was at the AMT. I think Seb did quite well with it. Yeah, I don't know. Do you want to try and build a Thunderbolt deck that just plays like all the mean AP and Destroyer stuff? Score with Greasing the Bomb? Yeah, we actually have two in the deck. Yeah, I, 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 I see it being cool. You only res one ice this game? Yes, we only res one ice. It was a, th a destroyer, though. It had one more strength. <laughs> but yeah, this is kind of the issue. An ID that's about resing ice feels a bit rough, especially when you can't afford to res every ice everything. What if we had a Manuensis? That would have been sick. If he had a Manuensis, I think Hermes would have done way more damage to us uh, than a Manuensis. Like, if he was drawing, like, floating tags, which, like, a bit of a spoiler to our tier list video that's coming up next week that Jeff and I did together. Like, I don't know if a Manuensis is a good card. Because floating tags is actually really bad. Because while you protect your connections as Seb, you have a lot of cards that are not connections that are actually incredibly important. Uh, so like trashing the connections is sometimes correct. That the payoff from Emanuensis versus floating tags does not seem to line up. I've played against, against zero credit meetings. It's wild. I've never seen this game before. It's pretty cool. Yo, a bunch of bees. How's it going? Welcome to the game. The game is really, really sick. It's one of the best games easily I've ever played. Played a lot of games in time. Welcome to it. Mind you, I need to shout this out. This last weekend, uh, the board game YouTube channel, Three Minute Board Games, put out a Netrunner review talking mostly about like NSG Netrunner. And uh, there might be a lot of people who searched Netrunner after watching this that ended up on this channel. Apologies that I've been a bit grumpy at the beginning of the stream, but hey, how's it going? Please ask some questions if you want to. Uh, uh, the guy here, I don't know his name, but I've been watching his stuff for a while now. Um, he's pretty effusive about Netrunner. Hey, Yeti, how's it going? Thunderbolt feels like slightly better than Stronger Together somehow. I'd argue that I'd like Stronger Together better. Oz, Byroid, comma, Stronger Together. Oh, that works. That was a shot in the dark. So this was like a very derided identity when it came out. And admittedly, because the other HB identity in early Netrunner was so much better. But at least with this one, all ice permanently has plus one strength. Which like obviously NSG is going for more like situational resing and situational power moves. Uh, but this to me is just going to be stronger. It's just going to be stronger. <laughs> like I'd rather just consistently have better ice than on one turn when you res the Hoggins a bit better. 
because Hagen also does just fall out the later the game goes. Eh. Even if Thunderbolt worked with every ice, it would not be that good. Yes, if Thunderbolt was on every ice, I still don't think it'd be worth playing. I'm good. Meeting up with some friends in Cambridge to play Netrunner. Yo, what are you playing? I got a GNK in like three hours. I got to figure out a deck or like four hours. I got nothing. You got an, uh, got an idea? Hey, Tron, good game. For how heavy the game is, he did a really good job for three minutes. Yes, yeah. In three minutes, it's, it's really hard to talk about Netrunner for sure. I'll mention that I felt a safe face checking because I had a handful of resources instead of events or hardware and I knew you weren't on site sometimes. Yeah, I knew you do. I knew you knew. Uh, but that is the thing. But like, do you just play like awful face checks and then hope that's good enough? It's hard to say. Titan Bloop with MVP and Thunderbolt, do you have to figure out how to reload it? Yes. Like, Bloop is good. I think Bloop is a good enough payoff, but then all the other harmonics don't work with Thunderbolt. Yeah, and everyone's playing Flip Switch right now. It's it's really hard. String 5 Eli versus Crota was miserable. Yeah, it was honestly, like, not good. People made fun of it, but the math, like, we did the math or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. I do not know. Okay, let's do some news really quick. We can maybe do some more Thunderbolt after. I just want to show some stuff. Apologies again if we go to negative space again. Welcome to the negative zone. I wanted to shout this out again. Welcome to the game if you've seen from this. Uh, Thunderbolt. Sh try out Thunderbolt if you're new to the game maybe. Do you think just using Brazilian Vova with Harmonic Ice and Acer Group is good? Hey Spark, I'm kind of up in the air as to whether there's anything at all to the ice dancing stuff. I do. But I think if you're going to do it, Brasilia Grid doesn't need to be in Thunderbolt. I think Brasilia Grid is like kind of to me representative of a lot of the cards, but not a lot of cards, but there's like a very, there's a substantial subsection of cards in uh, Rebellion Without Rehearsal that are on this like fine line between being unplayably bad and potentially toxic. And I think Brasilia is one of them. Brasilia can be really good. Like you saw, we built this weird board state, which was a blade of a barrier into uh, Stavka. And so we res the blade of a barrier. We install Spin Doctor for the bin. If they continue, we res the Stavka, de-resing the Blade of Barrier. We have like 11 strength Stavka, and we use the Stavka to trash the agenda in the bin, which is entirely safe to Spin Doctor. As long as we can consistently de-res the Stavka, which we don't have full control over, for better or for worse, that is an unrunnable server. But I think the places that you're going to see Brasilia are like in NBN decks that are just constantly resing and de-resing pings and like returning a Blade of Barriers to get B1001, stuff like that. Right? Like, I think if this card is good, it's because they're playing the worst face checks that if you hit them, you lose the game, which is not my favorite Netrunner. Or they're doing some recursive nonsense with like ablatives and pings and stuff like that. So it's the sort of card where I think if it's good, it's probably not good. I do think some of the best use cases are like echoes and some waves. But the problem a lot of times with those cards is like with Brasilia, you need to de-res a different ice. It doesn't have to be on the same server, but it comes down to like still the runner has a lot of control over it. And I'll show a clip in a second, but like that's the issue with Stegadon is like the runner allowing you to res certain ice. When you have a Stegadon scored, they should tunnel a certain server, usually. Just because if there's only res ice on one server, Stegadon doesn't do everything. And the same idea that if Brasilia is up and for some reason Brasilia is a problem, and mind you, you can just beat Brasilia by having more money, uh, you probably should just stop running centrals, right? Like you just shouldn't have them have more ice to de-res. But I do think Echo is good until somebody hushes it, and then obviously it's really bad. I can see why they play it. I can see why they banned Formicary. Yeah, Formicary would be, like, pretty unfortunate into this. And, like, for what it's worth, Formicary is actually really, really good in Stegadon because it solves a couple of the Stegadon issues. Not only, obviously, is a Stegadonable card with Mana Garm, not that that was unbeatable, but it moves around a lot. Having ice that moves around is really important for Stegadon, as much as it does also incentivize you just to tunnel. Because if all the Formicaries are on one server, they don't do much. Uh, so that's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, Brazilia also triggers Stegadon. Yeah, it's nice that it triggers Stegadon because, mind you, Stegadon says when anything was been derezzed, as long as it doesn't have to be through the Stegadon. Mind you, if they derez your ice with like window of opportunity, technically it fires. Uh, it's hard for it to make that matter though. Half of the ice you want to use with Brazilia doesn't do anything with Thunderbolt. Yeah, pick one. That's our big issue. It's like half the harmonics ice, all the harmonics ice besides uh, Bloop doesn't work with uh, Stegadon at all, which I would argue that like the harmonics ice are probably worth revisiting more than uh, Thunderbolt is. Hey, Creed, many thanks for the awesome content. Got back into the game and there's a lot to learn. Your vids are very helpful. Keep it up. Thank you, Creed. We streamed a lot last week, mind you. I got a good feedback on the recap we did on Friday at the end of the stream. Mind you, it is time marked. But on Friday at the end, we went through like every deck we played and what we learned about it. And then you can use that to see what you think is interesting and then jump back to the right VOD of where you want to watch it. I think that's pretty cool. Maybe doing a, a recap at the end of every video to say like, this is what we learned today to go over it is worth something. Um, but yeah, last week was a lot of fun. As much as I, I was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty bitter at the beginning of the week, kind of the same way I am right now. Awesome idea, yeah. I, I hope it's yeah, it's useful. Um, okay, new stuff. NSG is hiring. 
well, recruiting, I think it's more accurate because it's a volunteer thing. Keep that in mind. I mean, they're looking for an EDI team lead and media team lead. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved, always reach out to Null Signal Games. They do great stuff. And even if you don't think you're qualified or you have enough time, and I think they do a good job at like indicating how much time of the week they are expecting out of y'all. Uh, you can say like, I can't do that, but I'd be able to help out. I want to help out. And you can get involved in some way that is like, helpful like nsg definitely likes volunteers they want volunteers so if you don't think you're qualified for this still do it join us <laughs> uh this one is actually a very interesting one a leading new team which will sit as a sub team of the community team be in charge of all media creation including commentary tournament streams podcasts obviously like i'm very interested in understanding what's going on here for sure i think nsg has been doing a better job at running their youtube channel more stuff is being posted on it i don't th i think what they're doing on youtube is and obviously amt streams are fantastic i think what they're doing is functional but it just seems like they're putting stuff up there and there's not a lot of like strategy or like marketing behind making it look good or attractive to people, which like I think there's a really big ceiling to making like NSG's YouTube channel make a lot of sense. Uh, so I'm really excited that there's a uh, effort to put somebody into this exact role. So check that out for sure. Um, mind you, you can find the links to all this stuff on nelsignal.games, let alone in the description here. Hey, Kat, I woke up after a red eye back from Seattle. How you doing? I'm doing OK as much as we're playing Thunderbolt. How is an NPC? Hey, Veronica, how's life? Life is good. I almost got into a game with you yesterday. Someone sniped my spot. How are you doing? So this is the next thing. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but speaking of, of keys right there and also PyCat, is that this weekend was the first NAN PC event. And for those who don't know, NAN PC is a grassroots tournament series across North America that's being run by a bunch of folks. White Blade, I think, is the big force behind this, of course. There's a lot of people helping out, like Cinderin and Chad as well. And the first ever NAN PC event happened uh, just this weekend in Vancouver, the 23rd of March. It seemed to be a huge success. It was a one day event. Uh, mind you, there is about 30 to 40 players, 32 players cut to top eight. Single elimination is pretty wild, but a lot of people traveled out and I've only heard good stuff so far. The stuff wasn't live streamed, but it was filmed and I should be receiving the footage and we're going to edit it together to some extent. I can't tell you how much of it, but that sort of stuff, especially because it has new cards, will be up on this channel, hopefully in the near future. Uh, there's more NPC tournaments, and I have no doubt people who went are pretty excited to go to something else. Mind you, there's like tournament tracking and ongoing prize support, and it's like a very like well thought together circuit. The next one is in Toronto at 420, 421. Uh, it is a two-day event, it looks like. A lot of them are. Mind you, Vancouver actually is one of the few ones that isn't a two-day event. Now, you can see the standings. You can see who won. You can look at the meta report, all that sort of stuff. I don't want to do that on the stream because I want it to be a bit of a secret so that when you put up the finals, it's a bit of a surprise. But shout out, the top eight was stacked. Um, a lot of nice players came out there and hopefully had a great time. If you have any feedback you want to put in your in the YouTube comments you're watching right now that you went to NPC, would love to hear it, whether it's positive or not positive. Obviously, it's the first tournament in the series. So any sort of feedback, I have no doubt the organizers would like, unless it's just like, I don't like White Blade, in which... He's a nice guy, actually. He's a really nice guy. I can't believe that was the stream game. I didn't know they filmed it. Yeah, they filmed it. Toronto and an NPC, April 20th, 21st. Thank you, Z-Bag. One of the coolest plays I did all day was done by Cat. I can't believe that was the stream game. Also, I borrowed that card from him. Where was the Vancouver event? I was just there and didn't know what was going on. Oh, ArcV. It was in Burnaby. Yeah, it was in Burnaby, which is, from my understanding, uh, like a suburb of Vancouver. It was at Bonsor Recreation Complex. I do not know what that is. RWR card is pretty good. Yeah, there's going to be, we're running one of these events, mind you. I'll put the date up once I lock it down. It should be later in the year. I need to figure out when the nationals in Canada are happening, uh, but it should be around September. It'll be one of the last ones in the year, but there's more coming up. If you want to plan, you know, around it, I'm trying to make it down to Boston. Unfortunately, I cannot make it to Toronto, which is a bummer because like uh, Toronto folks are my homies. I'm from Ontario, uh, but yeah, Montreal will be having one. And then there's a bunch of other, like two big events in San Francisco this year. Mind you, Worlds is in SF in October. Seattle, LA, upcoming Philly, Twin Cities, which Twin Cities is Minnesota. Uh-huh, that's, that's a place. So streamed? I want to see Pike Game. It wasn't streamed, Diogen. Uh, it was recorded, from my understanding. All good. I would not have been able to make it. Ah, bummer, yeah. But do keep in mind, check us out on NPC.games. Ask around. People are traveling out to this stuff because it is sick. Organized play. Like, this is the thing that I want to make very, very clear. I would not be interested in NPC games if it was just a tournament series for competitive grinders. I think it's very easy to look at this tournament series and think like, oh, this is for competitive players who are playing for tournament points. I promise you, specifically if you're watching this and you've never been to organized play, go to one of these events if you can. 
because Netrunner, organized Netrunner play is kind of magical. Having this many people in a room that care about the same thing, you'll realize everyone is super, super nice, super kind. They're stoked you came out. They're here to help you. They're to push you on, to cheer for you. At the end of the day, if you come in and you get bodied because you play against, imagine White Blade won the event. That'd be really weird. But imagine you play against White Blade round one, you get swept, that's fine. Round two, you play against someone who also got swept. And as the day goes on, you play against people at the same like skill level that you are at. Maybe round one will be rough if you don't think you're a competitive player. We ran nationals here in Canada, one of the nationals last year. We had people come out. It was their first ever event. And nationals sound scary. And mind you, some of these will be national events tied in with uh, with uh, Null Signal Games. The most important thing is actually to come out to the biggest event you can come out to. Because the bigger the event, the more likely you're going to meet nice people constantly, make more friends, but also to find someone who's in the same shoes as you, who is worried to come out to their first event. And then you realize how pleasant it is. And it's more like a, an excuse to hang out with Neverner players from all over the world. And then some players are vying for the top cut. So keep that in mind. If I didn't think this had value for like casual Netrunner players, for players who've never gone to organized play, I don't think I'd be excited about an NPC. But because it is, and I promise you it is, I'm so excited about this stuff. Because just having more organized play, that is my favorite thing. Not that I care about tournament ladder points. More organized play, this is it. And I promise you, if you come out, you'll have a great time. The Spikey's Netrunner players are the nicest people. Yeah, it's a weird thing. Like if you come from other backgrounds where like you can sit across a player maybe and think like, oh, they're there just to win. Everyone is there. Some people are there to win, but everyone is there to have fun. So even like, you know, the hardcore, most competitively minded Netrunner players are the nicest people and they'll actively happily talk to you about whatever you want. It's great. My favorite part in tournaments seeing people. Yeah, like the fact that like, you know, like Kat and, and Ian flew in, like that's awesome. It's really cool. I played two Jank decks, still had a great time. Yes. So let me know how it went. Any feedback is great, but I promise you this is going to be more important come, you know, September, specifically when we're running event. Organized play is for everyone. Organized play is not for grinders. Well, it is, but it's for everyone more than that. And I will not run a tournament if it's only for competitive people. I promise you. They finished first, second, and third in the main event. <laughs> what did? In the team event, UK Nats 2022, I played White Blade round one, Extra C round two, and MJP round three. They finished first, second, third in the main event. Did you have a nice time? It was still a blast. There you go. My first big competitive event was Toronto Worlds a couple years ago. Yo, JK, you probably had a good time, I hope. Worlds in Toronto was sick. Met someone at Worlds 2019 who was there for the first tournament ever and had a great time. I played against multiple people at like King of Servers, Crown of Servers, excuse me, back in like 2020. It was their first event. Oh, I forget their name, but they wrote a really good article about like going to my first Netrunner event. I've been playing for a couple months and I believe absolutely lovely opponent but there's a lot of people more than you think that they're going into their first event even at something like worlds i wish worlds was kind of called like netrunner con because it's mostly a like a hangout place for netrunner players and then like maybe 80 players are competitively vying for it while the other 120 are that's just there to hang out as well so do check it out it's kind of sick the npcs for everyone yeah yeah it really is it really is there might be a focus on like the you know player circuit it's it's just organized play it, it's all great I'd love to, but I would have to travel and I'm wrapping up uni. Yeah, might be. Next year, I reckon there's going to be more things. I also do like, we've heard, you know, in the UK and across Europe, more people are doing organized play circuits like this because people realize it's, it's sick. 2021 Worlds was my first. There you go, Sophie. Okay. Ian bullied me <laughs> into flying in. Uh, also ran into someone at Worlds 2023 who was really on the fence and wasn't very competitive and walked them into playing and they wound up having a great time. Yeah, for sure. There's there's like a lot of stories like that. I don't know if I've heard stories of casual players who've gone to an event and had a bad time. Um, they probably do exist. There's enough people out there. But like every time I've heard a player who's like, that's my first event, they always leave to be like, I can't believe how the sense of community is here. I'm so glad I went. I know I was scared. But like after you get the jitters out of the first game where your hands are shaking, you shuffle your deck ugly and it spills like after that, you're just coasting and you realize how fun the stuff is. Everyone's there just to have fun. We should pitch it to you. <laughs> New players, of course, more than welcome. In fact, I'll have some special prize support for anyone who's first event. I'm running the first CO in my cafe on Saturday. North UK players should come to Birkenhead near Liverpool. Yo, let's go sauce. The real problem with not being able to go to Worlds 2024 is that I won't be able to defend my place as the world's most average Netrunner player. We can send a proxy. Like, you can send a pitch hitter, I think. Pinch hitter, I think it's called. Really need to figure out how I can make it to Worlds this year since it's close to me. Hard with pets and no one available to look after them. Oh, JK, yeah. Definitely, if you're in GLC, ask around if someone can, like, help. And they know someone that can help out. Um, but I have no doubt people want everyone to come to Worlds. It wasn't Worlds, but I brought a friend to East Coast Nats in Philly last year and they had a blast. Yeah, there you go. Okay, um, I think that's all I have for news, really. How are we doing on time? 
still if you have a deck idea of what i can bring into the, the event that's like casual gnk in like three hours let me know you want to see something do you want to go back into the negativity pit with me <laughs> this stream has been a trap um you want to see something this is the thing that i was the most worried about when it came to mercury and i played it i played it and i was really unhappy in it i'm just in time okay Ares. let's go oh apparently there's a thing there do you want a 50 list cold lava i'd like to look at it whoa is this video playing the whole time what's going on that's a video of me how do i make it pause okay so check this out i'm gonna move this over here that doesn't break the stream just so i'm making better eye contact this is a video i recorded yesterday when i was trying to play thunderbolt and i want to show you something that happened i'm just gonna cover my face so we don't have to look at it twice over um something happened where the thing that i was worried about existed and so i want to see how strong it is how consistent it is double andre i know um i'm doing this in obs which has its own media browser now which is like not the easiest thing so i'm going to show you two things firstly this is one learning and mind you lakurgos was in chat before i don't know if they were no there are two of them uh if they're still in chat but this is what i mean with stegadon we'll just stop at this talking point for a second so lakurgos is playing a really cool melandrigam uh padma deck the combination seems pretty rough. You see Melandrigam there. When you charge it, it gets a power counter. Once per turn, you can use the power counter to bypass a piece of ice. Uh, that's kind of nice because you just like send it centrals over and over again. Now, you also notice the deck is on Cataloger. Cataloger runs R&D and reorganizes cards, and that's really important. And then you can run back and win. I'm on game point right now. Being on game point across from Cataloger is really difficult because at the end of the day, you just see the thing that's going to get you. It's like Chekhov's gun on the other side of the table. You're like, how do I beat that? And it's hard to beat that. But luckily, we have one thing that does beat that. We have a Blade of Barrier in R&D, which means as long as we can derez the Blade of Barrier, mind you, we haven't scored a Stegadon yet, but if we can score a Stegadon and get the derez a Blade of Barrier to work, any time that Lakurgos runs R&D, we can get a Spin Doctor from the bin. That seems good. Immediately, eventually, we'll have to crack the Spin Doctor and then, like, it gets a bit ugly. We talked about how there's, like, it's really hard to play around a Spin Doctor because you want to put the card... Like, no matter what, the corpse should shuffle, even if you bluff, um, probably. But this is what I mean about Stegadon, where like, unfortunately, the play patterns around Stegadon get a bit ugly. So as the game progresses a bit, I score out here a Stegadon. So now we're Stegadon gamers. Our opponent here has a Revolver. There's a Tithe into Stavka. So he's dealing with it pretty well. And there's an Ablative. And there's a Cataloger here. So this, despite having a Spin Doctor on the table all the time, it's really hard to beat this line. Because no matter what... He's getting in. It doesn't cost him that much. This is the problem with Tithe. The Tithe doesn't do anything. But at least we have a Stegadon. That's the best we got. So I'm not sure exactly what happens on this turn. Again, the scrub feature on this is not that great. I wish I saved replays, but he goes in here and I think he whiffs. We get lucky, he whiffs, and then he runs this remote server. And this is the problem with Stegadon, is that running this remote server, literally running any other server, is one of the worst plays you can make into a Stegadon deck. Because now as soon as this run has been initiated, as long as I haven't used the Stegadon ability, I can now go ahead and de-res the Ablative Barrier. Derezzing the Blade of Barrier is the most important thing because now I can get a Spin Doctor back from the bin. I imagine past Andre is, is twirling his mustache and thinking about that. But this is what I mean. We're like, these sort of plays where as soon as you like stray off the like, I'm going to tunnel path, it blows the game open in a really, really bad spot. So apparently I res a Magnet. I don't read the D. Maybe I've used Stegadon already this turn. I'm not sure. I think there's a better example of this in a turn where in a following turn where the, I'd, I'd assume that our opponent here has lock on R&D and can just catalog her. Our opponent runs HQ. And because our opponent runs HQ, we can now derez the ablative. And now derezzing the ablative is going to cost our opponent the game because the runner now cannot catalog her through ablative barrier because every ablative barrier until it's hushed gets you a spin doctor. This is all I'm trying to show is that one of the big issues when it comes down to getting uh, onto the table. Uh, I couldn't figure out if that was replay me or not replay me. One of the biggest things about Stegadon is you should tunnel. And I just don't like the play pattern of Stegadon where like the right play is just hammer R&D and ignore all this sort of stuff. Because as soon as we talked about this after the game, Lakurgos was very nice. As soon as he ran HQ and allowed me to derez the Blade of Barrier, he kind of lost the game. Another thing I do want to point out too, and like this is something that came later. This is eventually game point. So I get to a point where I score, put an off-world office in the remote server. He knows all the ice here. This is probably Spin Doctor in the remote server. The remote server has some amount of known ice. I think he knows that this is a magnet here. Can you see my mouse cursor on the stream? But I don't think you can actually. You can't see my mouse cursor. You don't know what I'm pointing at. Wait a second. Has this all fallen apart? Okay. I have to not rely on the mouse cursor. There's a magnet, right? It's labeled. 
it's right there on i guess that's called like spot three on our on server one but our opponent knows there's a stavka here a tithe a blade of barrier our opponent knows there's a spin doctor if you res run the spin doctor here with stegadon we can derez the blade of barrier on r&d and then if we derez the blade of barrier on r&d we can get a spin doctor for the bin which beats cataloger how do you deal with this board state What I'm trying to focus on here is, to some extent, a combination of Thunderbolt, but mostly on the extent of Stegadon, this board state is nearly imparsable. In terms of like making Netrunner puzzles, figuring out what to do on this board state is almost impossible. Like, even for me. Like, I think our opponent here first click runs archives. I kind of remember that. I'm not sure exactly why. Probably to flesh out a potential Spin Doctor. But just like the combination of this board state and Stegadon, this is nearly imparsable because our opponents should take about 25 minutes to sort this turn out. Like, no joke. Because what happens, right? If you run the Spin Doctor, you have to flush the Spin Doctor out. But that means we can derez the Blade of Barrier. If we derez the Blade of Barrier, it beats Cataloger, but you can still probably go for two Axes. But what if I derez the Stavka? If I derez the Stavka, it'll come in as an eight strength Stavka. Is that a problem? Can we beat an eight strength Stavka? Do I run the remote server? If I run the remote server and we don't get successful run, this ablated berry comes down. Like this is one of the most genuinely complicated board states I've ever seen in Netrunner for both players. Like even here, if the runner like runs archives, do I use a blade of bear? Do I use Stegadon on this run or do I wait to Stegadon on a different run? Like it is so, so our opponent ran archives here. And the question was, do I Stegadon? Here on this run, I could have Stegadon the blade of barrier. I didn't. Because I was thought thought I would be more necessary to use the Stegadon while running server one. But like the fact of the matter is, I think this is incomprehensible. I think with Stegadon in the square area, this board state beyond approachability. I do not know what to do on this board state. It is just buck wild. You pin all RD to kill the spin doctor is probably the only really good line, or just have to force a spinny pop. Yes, one way that beats us is pinhole R&D. And mind you, R&D is not incredibly cheap because Revolver does get eaten on this run. So you take the tithe net damage as a tithe problem. But like that's one of the lines. It's like pinhole R&D and then run back with a cataloger. I'd argue just running R&D and seeing one card, heaven forbid, like a, a trick shot is probably right. But like just understanding to what to do on this board state is like, it's so absurdly complex. More than I think I've seen on almost any board state of all time. And it is a Stegadon issue where like, this is what I worry about Stegadon is like, it slows the game down to where I think I would take 20 minutes in a tournament to figure out this turn. Cause obviously it's game point for both players. Well, maybe not for both players. If you think seamless, maybe it could be game point for you as well. But trying to figure out what to do here is very, very difficult. By the way, Bob, how's it going? Okay. This is my next story. Cause this happened in on the following game. If I'm not mistaken, we made some changes to the deck. We put Tukana in it. I walked through it and we played against this really nice person named Sweatlord. Now Sweatlord is playing. I think the deck that kind of a lot of the Mercury cards in the set really encourage you to do. And so we have a lot of bypass, a lot of just send it central stuff. Uh, so this matchup mind you is like the exact sort of problem where I was worried that Mercury games would work into this. And I'm not sure if that's true or not, but we got so bodied from orbit that I think we should look at this a bit. So this is our opening hand against Mercury. You want some amount of ice to obviously keep Mercury out in the early game. Is this the hand we keep? I don't think we want to keep this. Sweatlord, mind you, super nice. This is not any sort of criticism to Sweatlord. They played it well and they had a good deck. This is not to be like, you shouldn't play this. It's just, it's a matchup. I also, mind you, always ask if I have consent to record these videos. So they should know that this was going to be up on the channel at some point. And so this is our hand. I think we mulligan into this hand. So what do you do with this hand? Let's talk this through. This is Mercury. What do you do with this hand? We have one Stegadon in hand. We have a Hagen. I think the core of my argument here is that there's so many tools right now in Criminal that basically trivialize a single ice that like pushing out Regolith, pushing out a Stegadon behind a single Hagen is very unlikely to work. Firstly, we're weak to diversion of funds. I'd argue that some Mercury decks can't play diversion of funds. I just think we're getting at the point where the amount of tools that criminals have to bypass a single piece of ice is astronomical. It's kind of at the point right now where like I feel we have six simul chips. Like we have six simul chips with Muse that it's it's just like it's there's so many things that you have to play around that it's almost impossible to play around all of them at this point. Back in the day it was just inside job. At some point it was inside job and boomerang, but now it's inside job, boomerang, Malandragam, Fazerum Entangler, and then uh window of opportunity. So correct me if you're wrong. I think it's nearly impossible to push out something behind a single ice. 
And even if we do, Sweat Lord should face check into it. Maybe you're scared about Thunderbolt, but I just don't know what the play here is. So my plays don't get diversioned. We'll open with a Spin Doctor, hopefully. This can go bad for us. And then we'll ice up HQ. Then we'll ice up R&D. Oh yeah, Spear Fishing was a card. Thanos, how's it going? There was other cards, but they, they didn't see play. All of those cards I mentioned are consistently seeing play. So we put Hagen on HQ and we put Tithe on R&D. Isn't that good though? You need to guess the meta? No, I don't think it's good. This is the thing is I don't think it's good. I think there's too many ways to trivialize Singleton Ice to the point where as a corporation, you stop making good decisions. I think this is like an extreme example, but like check this out. We mulligan, we spin doctored. We have now gone through eight cards. On average, an agenda is one in five cards. So here you're assuming we have one and a half agendas in HQ, which is a really good played pattern here. So we're going to put two ice on the table. We don't have to ice up R&D. We definitely want to ice up HQ because of many criminal things. So we're going to put the hog in on HQ. And then the question is, do we ice up R&D or do we play the hedge fund? If we don't play the hedge fund here, or greasing the palm works too, once we res the hog in, we'll be clicking for credits next turn. So maybe it's right here to greasing the palm, the hog in on HQ, install the tithe, and then ideally next turn we can still hedge fund. I think that's fine. This is to play around Mercury. We could have taken risks that we didn't ice up R&D. For what it's worth, Tithe and Mercury don't interact very well because you don't have to break the subroutines. But this is our start for now, right? If I hit the right arrow button, no, it doesn't move forward, does it? No, it doesn't. Bummer. So our opponent, seeing that we have four cards in hand, we're assuming there's one agenda in every five cards. We've nearly gone through 10 cards. We've gone through, what, eight cards. So the chance of Mercury getting into HQ and if Mercury doesn't break subroutines, they say two cards. I would say you're more than 50% chance here to get an agenda. I think you can argue that if the opponent mulligans, maybe their hand is on average worse. I don't think that actually makes sense. I feel like that's a bit of a, a gambler's fallacy. I think what is more true is if the opponent keeps, they're less likely to have multiple agendas in their hand. But on average, a mulligan hand is as bad as an average hand, right? At least when you keep, your hand is on better on average than what you have. So our opponent here can do a lot. The first thing they can do is just send it HQ. They do Mystic and Bravado, okay? So in theory here, there's no respect for Sice and Ton, which fine. And here we have an ugly spot. If we don't res the Hagen, they get a hit half our hand. We probably lose an agenda. We could lose the regular third two Kana. It's not the end of the world, but we probably have to res here. This is a really important thing with Mercury. Like Mercury can force you to res. This is a really good play pattern. If we had Soraka been played, would we eat the Mystic Miami? Yeah, we would. Do they want to trash this if this was a tithe to get the access? Maybe not. But here we kind of have to res, or we can hope to get lucky. So we're down to three credits. This is really good criminal pressure. Now it's a 50% chance to get through. Hagen will end the run. It doesn't have a face check. That was great. Install daily cast. They move on to their turn. Okay, cool. Now still here with this hand, now on three credits, we're going to be having now eight cards in our hand, or sorry, we've gone through almost 10 cards. You're assuming there's two agendas in hand, and we are nowhere near having the ability to push into a remote server, let alone against criminal. It feels like you need to push into a remote server with two ice. Because again, inside job, boomerang, melandrism, fazerum entangler, you can't safely score behind a single ice. And in this deck, it's even a bit worse because if we're scoring on off-world offices, we have to advance it. An advanced card is usually an agenda. We're not playing NGO front. That's on us. That's our deck building issues. So what do we do here? We can't really push out a regolith. Maybe we can install regolith, res it, click it, click it. It ends up giving us four credits on the turn. It's not terrible. They'll probably trash it, which keeps them busy. I think that's a line. I think the line I went for is credit, credit, hedge fund, just to put us back into the game. It's obviously very slow. Doing that on your turn is not good. Maybe that's why on turn one, we shouldn't have greasing. We should have hedge funded instead, and this would have changed. That's actually a pretty meaningful decision. It's nice to understand where the decisions you made, you could have done something different, whether it would be better or worse, because you want to have be in a board state where you can make as many different decisions as you can. I think Corpse feeling that you can safely score behind 1-2 Ice is something we won't have for a little while. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have it. And I think that's my thesis here, is I do not think... I think right now the Criminal Card Pool is an absurd spot that you cannot feel safe scoring behind unless you have like 2 Ice and a defensive upgrade. Which you flood an HQ before that happens. I was looking to finally start playing actively again. I can feel a bit less excited now. Can you sort of talk me back up? No, Tinai, definitely play right now. It's a really good time to play right now. In fact, play a Mercury deck. <laughs> I think just playing this sort of deck might not be great. Mind you, this is a bad Thunderbolt deck, so I'm just kind of showing what the criminal card pool is doing to play right now. But the game right now, startup, standard, it is quite good. I just want to explore a bit what the criminal card pool has done. Corpse can still score even if it's not a guaranteed score when you jam. Yeah, don't play bad ideas to start. What do you mean, Solomir? Okay, so check this out, right? What is our next... What is Strawman? What, this argument? about this this corp deck what is our play here right we, we don't really have a play so we have to do credit credit hedge fund 
So now our opponent has a really good start. They have Mystic down early. They have Daily Cast ticking. They're on six credits. They haven't got their card draw down yet. So they're playing with their opening hand. They draw a card. Fantastic. They install a Melandre Gem. This is where the game gets buck wild. Now, this is a mistake. The runner's going to have to take it back. I wonder if we're going to show Melandre Gem on the screen. Oh, Andre, you're the best. So Melandre Gem is a new card. It comes down for four, which is expensive, but it will bypass two ice. The first ice it always bypasses will be three strength or less. This is a mistake because Hagen obviously trashes Melandrejem and is also six strength. So our, our opponent here is learning the new card. So they did take it back here. But now with a Melandrejem on the table, firstly, R&D is messed up because the chance of R&D being higher than three strength is very low. And now how do we score on a remote server? We can't. The magnet is now next to useless. So they install one card, which puts us down to now having to have to build a two ice remote server and a defensive upgrade and have enough money for both of those. You see, they played one card for four credits and now we're so far behind. Because not only can we not ice this R&D anymore, like R&D is useless, technically it's tight, that was still kind of useless, is our magnet push with the regolith now is not a great trade. Right, like this is what Melandre does. I was really surprised about this. Is with the Melandre on the table, we still have to play around Melandre inch that job, Melandre Fazerum, Melandre Boomerang, and you can't play around all that stuff. You just can't play around it. Like Rush Wayland just puts an ETR in an Oak Town. What runners can definitely push through with tools doesn't mean Rush Wayland is bad. I would argue that we're at the point that I don't think you could push in remote server against Criminal early at all. There's just too many tools. Is Sengrin's video called TI Meta one of the best in history? Never. The game is seems to be in great hands. Yeah, TAI was one of the best metas. Now, this is very specifically a cherry pick deck. It just happened yesterday, but I want to show you what this does and the numbers behind it, right? So obviously they, they blunder into HQ. We take it back because Hagen's going to hit like a truck. Mind you, having higher strength ice is relevant into Melandre. I would say higher strength ice is not well distributed across the format. Having ice that matters on the early game you want to res that is three strength or higher. There's decks that do have it. Sandstone, sort of. Uh, Border Control, not really, but it's its own problem. Envelopment, okay. Hordum, great. But in, in HB, it's like early Hagen. Gatekeeper for one turn. Like it's there's ways around it. It's just still tricky. We're still in a point where if the first thing your goal is to score an agenda, it's very, very hard into this. So our opponent's really nice. They take it back. They still have a Melandre. What do we do? They inside job HQ. Okay. This is my biggest point. Why I don't like Mercury is uh Melandre Gym doesn't work with Leech. No, Philip. My biggest problem with Mercury is that to me, it highly incentivizes their ability, highly incentivizes inside job centrals. And inside job centrals to me feels so bad, but this is a really good play because looking at the numbers of the situation, we've spin doctored, it's turn two, they're pressuring us, inside job costs them two credits, in fact, one credit with Mystic Miami, they're going to see half our hand. On average here, we have two agendas in hand. While I'd argue that they should respect uh, Ikoa project and they're not, and turn two inside job, Mercury HQ should on average steal an agenda in almost every game. You can look at the like hypergeometric hyper distribution. It's hard for me to change from the video scene to the other scene, but somebody run the math here. Inside job HQ against this, we're like, it's going to take us three turns. Seems correct, right? Like we're likely to have two agendas in hand based off the numbers. Like this just seems really good. Like I want to play a deck that just inside job centrals and ignores all ice. And their deck might not have icebreakers. It turns out they do. They don't actually have to install them. But this is where it's really tricky. It's like the amount of pressure the sort of criminal cards are putting down. Inside job centrals makes sense because where the agenda is going to go. How do I beat this? Should I have drawn up and discarded, maybe got the agendas out of hand with Spin Doctor? I think so. But for that, we probably need more efficient draw cards like, uh, I don't know, Planner Game, something like that. But this, on average, steals two to three points. And there's no way to play around inside job centrals. Could we got two ice there? Yes. Could we res two ice? If we put three ice on centrals on turn three, how do we build a remote server? This is what I don't get. Is like there's so much support. How do we do Melandre inside job? How does the remote server beat that? We can't. I feel like you can build a criminal deck that only runs all this sort of nonsense that consistently can just stall corporations. And the problem is that like it stalls out, you know, average mid corporations, like score out and remote corporations, the corporations that you learn to play the game with. But like against asset spam, maybe it's a bit different. Is this more pressure than criminal used to be by just being Leela from turn one though? Well, yeah, I think it is because they're going to play Hermes as well. And Hermes is better when you're accessing two from HQ on an inside job, like two from HQ on an inside job is significant. I don't want to dis NSG or anything, but IMO, what makes a meta great is not just its design, but the creativity of the players in the meta. What do you mean by that, D? How's it going, by the way? Can't we just see Melandre with Flux and Leech? Um, Melandre doesn't work with Leech, but it works with Flux, it works with Padma. This is what I don't understand. So, so how, what, what is it going to take me to score out in the remote server against this deck? It's going to take me another four turns, right? And so inside job HQ is really good. So this goes on, right? 
They unfortunately steal Stegodon, which they have, I think, over 50% chance to steal an agenda here. Heaven forbid they had a Hermes, because then we have to redo R&D. They don't have a Hermes. I get salty about it. And then I draw. This is my hand. We've now gone through 11 cards, so you're assuming there's another agenda in hand. What do we do? Do we put another ice on HQ? As soon as we do another ice on HQ, how do we push into the remote server? We can't. So what's the play pattern here? We can do Stavka. Mind you, Stavka is cool because it's eight strength, so it beats Melandrge. Notice me moving my mouse around to do that. But what do I need to do here? I'm drawing up again. Mind you, this deck has slightly more positional ice than you'd want, but now it's Stavka and Tahagen, so that's kind of safe for now. But I'm so far from a remote server. The best remote server I have possibly that I can build next turn is Magnet into Stavka. That server cost us eight credits, and it still loses to Boomerang and Inside Job. I don't know what to do. This is the game that when I left it, I thought this was like, notice my, my, <laughs> my posture. What? Like, I don't know generally what to do in this matchup. I can't figure this out. They draw. Mind you, they've done enough damage. They have a mystic ticking. Early mystic is obviously turn one. That's sick. They draw. They just draw. Up. They install another daily cast. They draw. Great. They don't have to do anything. Legitimately, they don't. And so now we push out our remote server. This is where I made the first play is that I put a Brasilia behind a magnet. Because what I'm hoping happening here happens here is that they spend a Melandrige charge on the Magnet to access a card that doesn't matter, or they reveal the Boomerang or the Window of Opportunity, something like that. Like here, this is where I start making my first play of the game. Mind you, it's turn four. My first play is putting something in the remote server to bait out some of their tools. That's cool. And I think that's an important thing to understand is you have to put cards in the remote server that don't look like an agenda. Here, I'm using the Brasilia Grid. I could have done the Dukana or the Regolith. Arguably, I think Regolith is better because it holds. I can do something with it. Brasilia, mind you, is, is garbage uh, on this board's but this is the first play that I make. Keep that in mind. Let me catch up on chat. By this, I mean that I think that the player base we have TI could have been a 65 blank cards. So we would still have had a possibly the best meta of all time. Uh, I don't know. I think D TAI is like notably really cool. Central pressure is set is, is wild. I've been feeling the same way playing against the Lobo kit decks with burner spam. Yes. The central pressure to me is so hard to respect while still trying to score in a remote server. I'd argue that in this matchup, I was dead before the game started. I'm playing a bad deck, though. Let's notice the bypass tools are slot hungry and require good economy. No, they don't. I think Melandrige doesn't require good economy. I think Melandrige is wild. It's four credits to bypass two ice. How much do you generally pay to break a drafter? How much do you generally pay to, uh, to break a magnet in the early game? You're right. You can play Boomerang and stuff like that, too. But like, it's a generally an economically viable card. And what does it matter when you're inside jobbing through ice anyways to see two from HQ? Like, this is what I was really worried about Mercury is if the right Mercury plays ignore the table and largely just like inside job to Brado Centrals, it's really good. And it's very hard to beat. It feels like there's not a lot of counterplay to like S to Brado Central. Like what happens if they, heaven forbid, play multi-axis and like go R&D or go HQ here? Like an S to Brado and HQ, again, I think this is more than a 50% chance to get another agenda because this probably isn't agenda. Like it's also on our opponent to understand that this thing in the remote server is probably not an agenda because there's no way we feel safe scoring behind a single ice. So maybe they don't have to run it, right? Feeling good about hopefully growing card pull once rotation slows down with some ridiculous power cards. Hey, Jeremy. Getting remote started and trying to tax their clicks resource in some ways seems crucial early. Yeah, it seems crucial, but it's very hard. I think this is a good play because it forces them to spend a tool on nothing. That's great. The deck is too honest, probably can't play honest game plan. And I agree. But like, are honest decks impossible to play right now? Because that wasn't usually the case. Isn't the play just to force out the power counters, have stuff that isn't agendas you can jam? Yes, bah, we can. But you'll notice it doesn't work out. It does not work out. Mind you, Melandrige is once per turn. It's hard to make that important because it compounds really well with like other stuff. We're in a place where there are a lot of amazing players pushing the format to newer and weirder places and the rotation of these cards provide the spark they need. Yeah, the rotation was arguably more important than TI coming out. What is an honest deck? An honest deck is something that plays like system gateway, for better or for worse. So it has agendas they want to score out that are part of their game plan. How's it going, Axu? They have enough economy. They have ice and probably one or two defensive upgrades. It is the narrow you learn on day one, as opposed to like horizontal. Yeah, PD. PD is honest. PD is super, super honest. Okay, let's continue with this replay, right? So I'm hoping that they bite here. They have good economy. They have a mystic here, so they need to play an event. Making Mercury a viable idea is a good thing. I think it's awful. I really don't like the design of Mercury. I've been clear about this the whole time. I think having the play be inside job HQ, oops, I stole Hermes, like to me is super, super not, it's slot machine. It's literally slot machine. Like Neverner inherently is more slot machine than we wanted to believe, you know, accessing centrals is, but like it's just full slot machine now. And again, no disrespect to our opponent. Our opponent did great. 
Our opponent is playing a good deck. Recursion ain't honest. Yeah, recursion spam isn't honest. The sort of prison decks are not honest netrunner. Asset spam is not honest netrunner. Grinder is not honest netrunner. That is obviously not a, a value neutral statement. That's just what a lot of people say. When they think honest netrunner, it's like ice agendas. How system gateway you win in system gateway. Admittedly, there are traps in there. So our opponent draws here. They run the remote server. This is what we wanted. We've raised the magnet. Now they don't have to melange here, but they can. So they can bypass this if they want to, to see what's in their remote server. They do. So we made a play, forced the counter out. That's good. It's a Brazilian government grid. I'd argue they probably don't need to trash this. Plus three strength does actually matter into Melandrige, which is kind of cool. We could have made the magnet unbypassable as much as derezzing a Hagen is financially ruinous, but they trash it. I'd argue they don't need to, but they do. Fine. Then they draw a card, install a Carmen. They notice here that their Mystic is full. We, this is the first breaker we've seen. I was surprised they're on breakers and they install it for three, but they're going to undo this just so that they can put, use their Mystic Miami, which I think is totally fine. So instead, they window of opportunity R&D. <laughs> this is buck wild to me. Um, they laugh about this play because it's kind of nonsense, but this is what I mean. It's like, how do we score out in a remote server when they have Melandrige window of opportunity? I don't think you can. I don't think you can. So here they're running into a tithe. They have also installed the cupulation on the window of opportunity. I've actually been impressed by the click compression you get in these sort of decks because they play a lot of weird things like cupulation, melandrige, and fazerum. It's really nice to get that all with a single click. I think window of opportunity is better than it looks. Obviously, they didn't derez anything, but at the end of the day, they're putting us in a situation where we now have six credits. On average, this ice costs three to four credits. If it is a drafter, it will fire. Like, Melandrige is only once per turn. I don't think I realize that, but it is genuinely only once per turn. So there is some risks taking on here, and I'd argue that I probably wouldn't make this play because if it's a drafter, we get back, I think, Rashida. I'm not sure what's in our archives. Maybe it's not that good, but they're going in here. Unfortunately for us, it's a tithe. And we talked about how tithe is kind of good and also not good in Thunderbolt. And unfortunately, it's not good because they can go through this if they want to. They have to trash one of their installed cards, take a net damage. And then they did not break subroutines, and so Mercury fires. And so that's what happens, right? Like, obviously, this is on us for playing Tithe. This could have easily been anything that ends the run. At the end of the day, this cost them nothing and installed accumulation. So it's not a bad click, but they'll trash it a daily cast because why not? And then they'll get two card access here. So now they've locked the top of R&D. They've seen two. They could accumulation. They steal a luminal, right? So now they know there's a Tithe here. We have a remote server with two ice. One of them is Melandre Gammable. The other outermost, who knows? HQ is its own problem. And they've locked the top of the deck. Do you see the issue here? <laughs> if they have window opportunity, if they have boomerang, if they have inside job, this remote server is trash. It's trash. We cannot push into it. And we're now on game point. Every turn they can run R&D and see two cards because they can just fire tithe because it doesn't matter. And then HQ is just going to, you know, get bigger in agendas and eventually they'll inside job or Estabrado it and then we'll lose the game. There's just so much absurd pressure where basically what our ice is doesn't matter. And Again, I'm repeating my thesis. It's really hard to stop this. Like, Stavka Magnet's a sick remote server. Against this, it doesn't do anything. They just have to boomerang or inside job. And if we inside job it, like, we have still have the rest of Stavka or they get through. Like, I don't I don't know what to do. RWR pronunciation guy is up. Oh, thank you, Mango. Hey, Ryan. People talk about how good TI meta was, but I think a lot of that was the Borealis was very good and just needed a few bands to shine. That might be true. It's hard to say. It's like clearly the TII meta was good. I like Ari a lot. So not that Ari was the biggest part of the meta. I do think FFG's flashpoint leaving was the most important thing. So it's all over the place. It's definitely a lot of things for sure. Now runners most fun when risks are being taken by both sides. Bluffing agendas as Rashida's runners face checking because they need to pressure against the score. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the thing is like a lot of decks built like this don't have things to push in remote server that look like agendas. It's the worst case for us because we don't have seamless. So off world office, we have to show it's an agenda, but we have to do off world advance. And that's even a bad line against Hermes, which heaven forbid a Hermes came down by now. But at this point in the game, again, we've drawn about 10 cards. They know there's an agenda in HQ. We can't really defend any server relatively well. We're playing a bad deck, but we're at the point where like Mercury by basically making all our ice unrelevant and we're respecting it is crushing us. It's absolutely crushing us. Thunderbolt into Mercury seems like an inherently bad matchup. Yeah, it's not good. The game plan is to manipulate strength numbers on ice when the deck doesn't care about ice numbers. It technically could to Melandry Gay, but I don't think you're you're not wrong. Do you think it's modern runner breaking the mid-tier corp? Is it just because corps are bad? I don't know. At an PC corps had a higher than 50% win rate, but like I'm not playing a good corp. Okay, I'm not going to harp on too much longer on this. We push a regolith, we res it, maybe a mistake, and then our opponent draws up and puts down Pretty. I don't like Pretty De Silva. But Pretty the Silva for one influence and for one credit means every inside job in R&D sees three cards. 
this is a deck that's going out of the way to make our ice not matter. And every single now run on R&D is three cards. I think our opponent here first should have contested the Spin Doctor. We probably wouldn't have shuffled, but with the Spin Doctor, you're not locking R&D here. But with Pretty coming down for one credit, it's just another card in the toolbox of inside job R&D over and over again. Inside job HQ every once in a while. Because now they know unless we shuffle the Spin Doctor, we're never going to win the game. Because we now need to get an ice in front of the Tithe, because obviously Tithe was a terrible ice to play into Mercury. For one credit, one influence, now every single run on R&D with Mercury is a maker's eye. There's a couple of cards like this in the set where it's just like incidental multi actions attached to something. Play Seamless, not Cybersend? Yeah, well, we didn't play Cybersend in this one. I think you do play Seamless. It's just like, don't play Thunderbolt is the real answer. Uh, but like for one influence, now every single, and they, they talked about this at the end of the game, like pretty coming down for one, every inside job into R&D is a maker's eye. How do you play around Estabrado R&D to C3 with Hermes? I don't think you can. I don't, I don't think any corp is equipped for that. So they access, they steal an off-world office. They're running a bit hot here. Like, I don't think on average they should have got five points by now. Obviously, they're on game point. Uh, they should know we have an agenda in hand. We're down to three cards. We're on seven credits. We still don't have a remote server we can feel safe about. Because again, Melandre now can bypass any ice, so they can just boomerang the magnet run. They're 100% in. If it's a border control, okay, maybe not. Uh, inside job. What's it called? Window of opportunity. We no longer have a remote server, and they're on game point because they've just smashed centrals. They should understand that if they can cupulation Estabrado HQ, they will nearly 100% win the game because they see all of HQ. And at this point, we just don't have a game. We regular three times. It's not correct. We probably should have just put the Spin Doctor down, but that makes pretty see deeper. Uh, and then I think here they do a really cool... Well, they don't do anything. This class act. That's fine. We res a Spin Doctor to try and fix our hand. We put something in their remote server to try and bait out the ma the, the Melandre Gem. We've now gone through 20 cards, so you're assuming about five agendas. We've shuffled none back, so you still seem, think there's one in HQ here. And our opponent does something I didn't realize you could do. They run archives. You can cupulation from archives. I don't think I realized that. They steal the cupulation. And now, if they just Estabrado HQ, let alone the window of opportunity with a Melandre, um, yeah, they win the game. They're going to see four cards from HQ. How do you stop them seeing four cards? Oh, and they Fazerum, right? Like, this is a cursed matchup. Our ID ability was never relevant. None of the ice mattered. They did one risky face check the whole game. But now, they window of opportunity, so they know it's a Hagen. They're going to see four cards from HQ. There's probably two agendas in here. This is, I left this and I was actually pretty upset about this matchup. Not to our opponent, our opponent was lovely. But this sort of deck in which our ice did not matter, in which there's so much pressure attached to like, just every turn for the rest of the game, inside job R&D is a threat, that they see three cards. Like, I don't know what you do against this. But the thing I really wanted to focus on, why, how does Hagen not end the run? They have Gem it. Melandre Gem can bypass any ice because they're on uh, threat four. Right? Like, Mel Melandre Gem is really weird because the threat text to me is on the opposite. Like, it feels like the later the game is, the less I want that to do the thing. Maybe it's because they want early game your ice to stop the run, but it doesn't work. What did Mercury play for money other than Gamble and Cast? Gamble and Casts. Just it. Uh, they had, uh, when left, they had, um, on turn one, they had, uh, what's it called? A companion, which, like, that's its own thing. This feels like Val blackmail turning wheel. Yes. They played two Bravados, but they had an early Mystic on turn one, and they played two Daily Casts, and I think a sure Gamble, but two Bravados. Yeah, to me... This felt like we had no winning line and none of our ice mattered. Obviously, we're not playing an ID that actually had text. That's not good. We're playing Tithe on R&D. That's not good into Mercury. Tithe is its own problem. We made two pushes on a remote server to bait them out. It didn't really matter. And they ran fast. Surely they run out of steam fast. No, I don't think they run out of steam fast. I don't see how they run out of steam before like we win. Like Estabrado HQ here, you see four cards. Like the chance of them winning on a four card run on HQ is very, 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 very high. But with Val, you had Titan. Yeah, I don't know. I left this thinking like this is this is absurd. But it's not so much that like hitting centrals and multi-axis seems to be a winning line. I think we need to do the math to be like, Banhar and Audrey have made ice near useless for quite some time. No, they haven't, Diogen. This is the big thing. Is Banhar you see coming? They install it, and then you know they can only interact with the outermost ice. Here, they have a Melandrigem on the table. Any ice now they can bypass for the rest of the game. We have to be scared of cards from hand. This is actually like a really big deal. A lot of card games I do not like in which the power cards come from hand versus on the table. Now, obviously with Banhar, there's some downsides and upsides to it because it actually costs them cards in hand in a meaningful way. They can lose random cards. They can make it work for themselves. But we're just constantly playing in fear that they have an inside job, a window of opportunity, an Estabrado, like a boomerang. There is like... They can easily build a deck, mind you, they could be playing backstitching, of like 
15 to 18 cards they can put in their deck that just doesn't care what your ice is. And then you have to play around the fear of them having that in hand. I'd actually like this to be more if it was on the table to some extent, as much as Laundry Gem is terrifying. Fear is the mind killer. For real, it is. But generally with this deck, we didn't have a play. Maybe if we had a Mana Garm, and that's what it's coming down to. Like, we just put a Mana Garm in the remote server. Can they deal with a Mana Garm? Maybe not. Um, it's the same thing with Ice Destruction. Mana Garm's good. You sound like a person who wouldn't enjoy MTG. No, I don't like Counterspell. Like, I'm, I'm not, I don't like Counterspell, that's for sure. Backstitching is just as frightening. Yeah, backstitching is just as frightening. This is a replay, yeah. I mean, you Thunderbolt is so you surely have enough ice to double ice each central and blank their ability. No, let alone we can't afford it. It's like by the time that we're comfortable to score out against this deck, it's like turn nine, <laughs> right? If only Hermes left, we could go back to playing sports metal. We could win desperate at your money and axes. All blue decks are evil. Yeah, like heaven forbid Hermes came down. Like imagine if Hermes came down, like we would be behind another two turns. Now, again, I don't know. So much of this more is not to be like, wow, the game is not good because Thunderbolt is bad into Mercury. That's not the point. Obviously, Thunderbolt's going to be bad into Mercury. But I think it just made me reconsider. It's like when a Melandrisham hits the table, how do you score in a remote server? You have to play around Fizerum, Inside Job, Boomerang. That's very difficult. That's very, very difficult. And let alone Diversion of Funds, Mercury, Hermes, like the amount of pressure is absurd. What you're saying is 3x and Nancy and HB? No, I think if you resonate on Nancy, it's probably game losing. Admittedly, right? Maybe it's bad for them. People are playing flip switch. You can't spend eight credits on an NC. Back stitching on the table and telegraph, but the mark roll every turn changes how you evaluate as a threat. Yeah, you can just get a bad mark roll and it can cost you the game for sure. The less frightening thing about them using back stitching is that they have to pay a deck with back stitching in it. Hey, Milanomi, it's not that bad. Back stitching is okay. Boomerang breaks subs, so reduces to single accesses. Yes, but I think they keep boomerang for the remote server. Right? Like this is our the best remote server we could have made in a couple turns, which is Stavka into Magnet. They boomerang either of these ice, Melander Gem gets them in. Okay, let's talk about the math here, right? Sorry, we're going to go back. If we're going to strictly talk about the math here, like how good is inside job on centrals? Sorry, it's going to get to a white screen in a second. Uh, Hypergeometric calculator. You went into Andre Thunderbolt is bad into Mercury should be Thunderbolt is bad. Well, we already did that earlier today. Okay, sorry, I got bright there. We flashbanged you. Sorry about that. So check this out. Our population size is a deck of 49. We're playing 10 agendas, which is still a lot. Sample size is an opening hand of six cards. After we've mulliganed, it's a random card. So number of successes in sample, we're looking for at least one. Uh, let's look for, yeah, one, right? So the chance of having an agenda in your hand, in any opening hand after mandatory, in a 10 agenda deck is about 76%. Now, in most opening hands against criminal, you'll install ice against Mercury, right? Like you'll install ice on HQ. You'll install ice on R&D, right? And so the chance of finding an agenda off of an inside job C2 on HQ is actually a fair bit higher because you're probably only holding four cards of which two of them are agenda. Or sorry, one of them is agenda and four. So Mercury sees half the hand. So all I'm trying to say is like the chance of inside job turn one HQ after you force the res into Mercury, how often is that correct? It's actually probably correct more often than not. This is why I don't like Mercury. Inside job HQ turn one is a pretty silly thing to be like first order optimal and i'm getting to the point where inside job hq with mercury is first order optimal i think the math supports it unless they do something really aggressive and spam three assets and even then like maybe in some matchups you don't want to steal agendas because they're bologna and oppo and stuff like that but like i think the math supports that inside job hq after you force them to spend money on the res is almost always correct and that bothers me again mercury hasn't been competitive is melanderge and fazerum going to make mercury competitive no but even if a deck isn't competitive if i find it so frustrating to play against or if somebody finds it frustrating to play against that doesn't mean like just because something is bad if there's a bad deck that's miserable to play into is it a problem maybe i think asa style thunderbolt might be better than pd style midrange i agree solomir but at that point you should just play asa i totally agree though thunderbolt makes more sense if you go horizontal but then you should play asa I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell. But I do think the numbers support that just like inside job Mercury turn one, especially after a mulligan, is like the right thing to do. And that that gets me real bad. That gets me really, really bad. My experience with Thunderbolt was trying to build a deck immediately realizing I had just ice and none of the good upgrades. And then I most ace list that I ever he said, yeah, yeah. No, Spark, that's what we got today. The work I've seen Cybersend do actually turns Thunderbolt on enough seems like a fun idea granted bad matchups. Yeah, I don't I don't believe in Cybersend. We played it. It's really awkward. I think Stegadon is kind of a bad deck. It's miserable to play against. I agree, Mushin. I don't think Stegadon is a healthy card for the game. I think it's miserable to play against. And we talked about this in the earlier replay. What it incentivizes you to do is tunnel a single server. I think it's miserable to play against. And I think it encourages bad play patterns. Like, just not fun play patterns. I agree with that.
but you don't see stacked on a lot. So like, that's my thing. Is, is it a problem that Mercury is annoying? I don't know. Maybe between Love Summon and Mercury, ice stocks are falling. It feels in some ways it is. That's always concerning. Played Black, Vial, Blackmail, Recursion for one day and then put the deck away and never picked it up again too toxic. That's what I lost to a Can Nats back in 2016. And I don't like that was the deck, right? Like people played the heck out of that deck. You fired accelerated beta tests and hope you got ice. But if it, it feels like that just with built in central pressure, I just like my ice to have text that matters. It doesn't seem in that matchup. The text on my ice mattered. It gets me. And maybe on the controversial opinion that Hermes sort of warps the game against scoring in a very negative way. Scoring is a lot is a very hard. Yeah, Hermes, like, I don't know how I feel about it. It's good because it's interesting. And it like gives pressure and it can be exciting. But uh, there's a lot more matches where I put things in remote server and just hope Hermes misses, which like maybe that's exciting. Issue with Mercury is more that it can only draw events so quickly and falls a whole turn behind on a net damage face check and bypass d folds to 2-3 gear checks and upsides like ping. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Like I, I think we showed the worst case scenario, but like that scenario was terrible. We had no place to make it. We just lost. To centrals bring back guard and kakugo to punish the strategy i was like really surprised i assumed that we would get like some sort of magnet type tech card that had like guard-esque text on it and we didn't which is weird i thought we would i thought we would get something that like soft dealt with bypass but the set gave us like so many ways to bypass ice and no ways to deal with it very strange yeah ping is good right like you don't de-res ping anyways that's my rant. I recorded a lot of gameplay yesterday from uh for uh Thunderbolt to try and get a video together and I just I don't have a video unfortunately. It just didn't work out in a way that was like interesting. And a lot of the results are stuff like that for sure. Okay. Still don't know what I'm bringing tonight. Cold Lava, you posted a deck a long time ago. I don't know if you're still around. I'm going to see if I can find the list. It was meant to be a cool epiphany list. I found it. Hold on. Why'd you post a link like that? Epiphany? Okay. So the ice suite that you end up playing. Uh, our Epiphany deck, I know that we played on channel, played slightly more ice than this for sure. Bologna stoked the ambush headline. Okay, so we also played a very similar seat, but instead of Bologna, we, uh, Beal, we played, uh, what's it called? Uh uh remastered edition which was pretty cool so you got sudden commandment still don't know exactly what this card does it seems more like a combo card than a value card but it can do some pretty good stuff have you seen or tried decks posted with sable or jaychinyo looks really cool i'd argue that diogen if you want to play uh jaychinyo i think sable sable is what i'd play i'm pretty sure a deck that did really well at nan pc which is kind of frightening if jaychinyo is really good we played a really bad jaychinyo deck last friday it was miserable it was a pretty bad deck um yeah, so it's hard to tell. But like the very, very straightforward Jay Chinyo deck, uh, Sid7, I believe, played at the event on, on uh, Saturday. And it did really well. So things that are cool. Kakarembo, ugh. But Kakarembo Holloman sort of works. With Kakarembo Holloman, what can you do, actually? I guess you'd have to like sudden commitment Kakarembo, right? So the idea is that you can do that. You can get a click back and then you can advance it once more and score out of Beal or Tomorrow's Headline. That's cool. Mind you, when we did this, we played with Cohort Program, which if the deck is playing restore is a really good way to use um both a uh, holloman that cares about installing from deck obviously so that's cool we have one restore i think restore is like really really good with holloman and agendas kaku combo <laughs> yeah are you saying this would happen versus any given corp deck or are you talking about this specific matchup uh this specific matchup was really bad tonight i think the issues are pronounced in this matchup but certain points are relevant for all corps yes i think the points are relevant against most corps some corps have better ways to deal with it like ag infusion you can just trash your ice right like that face check is a bit scarier faster uh but very specifically like just straightforward corps scoring remote server which most people end up playing when they get into the game seem very very difficult you can score below with the kakarembo sudden commandment and a holloman on board yeah so the idea is that you kakarembo the the Bologna from the bin you install it with two advancements and then if you get a click because you pay like a lot of money immediately with this sun commandment you can get a click back and then you can go ahead and hit the hollow man uh, I think that's actually less consistent than just playing three copies of restore from my testing I think restore is just really good the problem is you need more ways to get cards into your bin which is why we play cohort you could play Hanse review abstractly but it's a bit scarier but uh Kakarenbo definitely works as well for sure it's a lot of money. It's really just a biotic. Yeah, it's a lot of money. It's flashier maybe than straightforward. 
Now this one's on Oppo. We did not play Oppo in our version because we are tag punishment. We're just Starlit Knight. I think that's interesting to see how that works out. We only have one shipment from Full Disappears now that they know it, and we have Starlit Knight. But paying seven for that actually seems really difficult because the deck is lacking money. Wage Workers is pretty cool. You actually can like advance, advance, advance Wage Workers Holloman and score at never advanced five threes, which is kind of cool. I don't know if there's any better play patterns, maybe triple install. We have Marilyn, not bad. The deck needs more money. It's a hard thing to trash sometimes. Two Gaslight, that's cool. That means you can pull your combo pieces like the single Cracker Rainbow and Restore. I think that's actually worth considering for sure, even in our version. And then of course, Federal Fundraising, the best uh, card in the deck usually. Uh, yeah, I know in our version we weren't playing Mavirus, which we probably should, but we're also playing either Saint Saiyan or Shipment from or Vladisabirsk City Grid, which, mind you, works pretty well with Stoke the Embers, and it works better with Cohort, where you can put the advancement on the Vladisabirsk, which is kind of cute. So this is like a very similar idea. Let's try it out for sure. It seems fun. Shout out to Cold Lava, who posted this. Starting fast events, NBN would spend eight influence on Biotics, so getting it for free is nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you would back in the day. But mind you, back in the day, scoring, like, this is the weird thing. Is if you asked me two months ago, do I want a fast advance out of 3-2 Beal, my answer would be no. But modernly, it actually seems to be like surprisingly tenable. And maybe it's because we just want to rush out runners. But playing 8 back in the day to score out a card made a lot more sense when we had Astro Script Pilot Program. Because of course we did. This, mind you, limit one per deck was added way later in the cycle of the game. So every Astro Script he scored out for 7 with a Biotic became another 3-2 and another 3-2. Hey, David, I don't want to dogpile on attempts to defend uh, design sensibilities, August bias, but I definitely do think that Mercury runs out of juice fast. If they're trying to set up a commie simultaneously, really rough game, though. Yeah, David, but that's that's the thing that, like, gets me. It's like, I'd rather have a... It, it's kind of like always be running, and obviously people like always be running. Mind you, alarm clock another card to that. But I'd rather not have matchups in which, like, you lose early and lose hard or not at all. Right? Like, that's the worst way to lose. Right? Like, I'm super stoked you're defining the... the of, defending the design sensibilities and i think that's great i think my opinion is honestly not that important i should be careful with my opinion because there's an audience here and if people think what i'm saying is canon you should reconsider that to some extent i'm just a guy uh but i never liked abr as well it's just a design sensibility that i don't like where it's like oh run hq i steal the agenda the game entirely shifts based off of that and i just don't like that like i don't like early pressure criminal i don't like turn one hermes it, it's it's what i don't like doesn't mean it's correct How's it going, David? Others noted a single defensive upgrade really, really hurts. Yes. Defensive upgrades seem to be a fair bit better into a lot of stuff going on. And then it's up to us to like switch into that, right? Like, would I play three Mana Garmin HB modernly? Yeah, maybe I would. Uh, because the ice is getting destroyed by Iris Sarah's crew and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. The folks, the Myth of Legends, Andre. Hey, Lazy. Hope everyone's having a great day. Hopefully you're doing well, too. We have a couple, maybe another hour of stream before we have to go to an event. How about Epiphany with Holloman to score Kingmaking? Add an Ares to the score pile. So... You got to be a bit careful with Aries. That's not going to work, is it? That work? No, that doesn't work. It's actually funny. You search things like DLR and it does autocomplete, but Aries doesn't because there's unfortunately another card with that text. Uh, but what was it going to say? Yeah, with AR enhanced security, you have to be a bit careful because if you put AR enhanced security online, they never trash your stuff. You do want them to trash some of your stuff because some of your stuff turns on Epiphany. So you have to be careful. Obviously, it's good, but it turns off your ID box, which kind of feels bad. Would you rather have untrashable assets and no ID box? Honestly, maybe. But if I was going to play Kingmaking, I think I'd sooner play um, the 3-1 that gives a tag because you just don't want to score it. Or Superconducting Hub. Yeah, Superconducting Hub is like maybe defensible in this sort of deck if you're playing Kingmaking. But yeah, Ares to me is like, obviously, it sounds really good. But then in play, I think it kind of falls apart a bit because you, you eat your deck a bit. False leads also matters, but you have to build a certain deck around false lead. Like, this deck doesn't want false leads. If you're playing false leads, you have to play, like, end the line mindscaping, which I think is relatively bad into the modern meta for disruption reasons. Prana works well with that, too. Oh, Prana seems really good with Superconducting Cub. Yeah, that card definitely needs that support. support. Having somehow more hand size is really important for Prana. Uh, new Corp deck. Yeah, YDLs as well. That's true. That's really cool. Yeah. Seven Ice feels scary. Let's see what happens. I've been working on Holloman Asa that's gotten a bit too strong to play with my casual friends. That card's going to break some hearts. Yeah, I, I want to play a bit more Holloman and Asa because I think Restore is just like one of the best cards possibly with Holloman. The question is, how do you get your agendas in the bin with HB? And it's like, is it play Cohort Program? I don't know. Maybe. But it's like, it's unfortunate a Holloman is like inherently just a really good card when played alongside Recursion, uh, which like, that's a strange place. Hey, it's Chris. 
How you been? Air is great. You get the still Epicanos on steel. Yeah, you do, but the deck only has nine agendas, so it's not that common. I guess you have more agendas because you're playing the three ones. Doing well. Okay, so we have to ice up R&D against Pudma. That means we need to draw ice. I think we only have nine in this list. This hand's not bad. We can put Rashida out. Sometimes you don't want to put multiple assets out because if they trash both of them, you don't get epiphany value. The question is like, is Pudma going to be playing? One of the worst things into asset decks is actually like Trick Shot. Trick Shot's disgusting. I think we can mulligan this hand uh, for like just having a Starlit Knight on R&D might be fine. Uh, that hand got a bit worse, but at least we have a Spin Doctor. Ah, that's not a good hand. This is pretty pretty bad. Do we sudden command in for value? I don't think we want to pay credit for that. Because we have no operation to play. Yeah, that seems pretty rough. This is not a good start. This combo deck you got there. Be shame it got burned. Yeah, it's going to get burned. I'm just putting this out there. We have another spin doctor. If they trash it, if he trashes it, so be it. But we want to do some respect here. The thing is, on the outermost ice, you also want something that actually has teeth. Because sometimes it does make sense for you just to face check into this to trade like a power counter for a click if it doesn't have a punishment once it's rezzed. Could have got a Rashida. Feels bad. Uh, it's a Fetty. I think we trashed the spin doctor to get another spin doctor on the table. Okay, really bad opening. Uh, very, very bad opening. Yikes. This is going to be a hard thing, too, with things like Oppo. Obviously, it's not the worst, but not we can afford it. And like Sudden Commandment is they take up hand slots in which like most acid decks want most cards to be playable on most board states. So like, can we afford to just play this to draw two cards? Probably not. Do we just put a Beal on the table? I don't want to score out a Beal. It goes down to no credits. I think we draw and discard two agendas. Obviously, ordering there was super scuffed. We want Stoke the Embers in R&D. This is going to be a Mystic Onicom deck? Yeah, for sure. So a big difference I'm also learning with NBN is there's almost nothing on the table that you have to check right away. So if they install two cards, the only blowout really is Rashida, but everything else you can res, let it fire once, and then interact with it. We got an Epiphany counter, so that's cool, because we have a Holloman. So if we had slightly more money, we actually could potentially face, uh, like, rip off the top from the Holloman. Oh, there's a Holloman as well. So do we want to oppo for two? Kind of think we have to, right? Just to slow them down a bit. Like it slows us down. Feels bad when you pay money for that. The deck really doesn't like you. Yeah, we drew really ugly there. We probably shouldn't have mulliganed. So he needs to clear the tags here. Checking that. I don't think he's going to trash Maryland. We don't have to res it. We don't want to pay two. Then he'll probably trash it. Just clear the tags. Okay, so I don't know who that was better for. Lobby Somu. Again, I think this card is just worth main decking. I don't know if you have to play Kid and Spark. And Kid's really good. Oh, we have Market Forces. I realize we have another Tag Punishment card. So do we Epiphany for value? I think we don't. I think we Sudden Commandment just to push ourselves forward. Imagine we had an event. Wait. I'm so bad. That was so bad. I wanted to do it. Oh, that was terrible. Oh, no. That was so bad. What are we doing? Yeah, we're cooked. We're super cooked. <laughs> I probably should have realized we need an event. But with this deck, too, like how many events do we have are playable in all board states? I think we need to keep that for combo, right? Because I think we're like, we don't have Planogram, we don't have Hedge Fund, not that we could play it. So we probably don't ever play Shipment from Commandment because there's no card that you can play on multiple board states. I think they make Sudden Commandment a tempo card. Like you just need YDL. Mind you, YDL Sudden Commandment, it's, it's not bad. It's not amazing, but it's not bad. Orca is down. Was that sparked? It was sparked. Yeah. This deck hates you. Yeah, I know. That being said, we can maybe score out. This is not the set of draws we we're hoping. Yeah, this is really, really quite bad. Now, if this sticks on the table, like, I don't know what Gaslight for Oppo. If we get enough money, we can. I think he probably has to trash this. Uh, but we can consider hollow manning off the top rope next turn. The runner might be doing the test of lob orca outside of kit. Yeah. Uh, so cataloger is a hard thing to beat. Spin down the table. Dirty laundry will check server six. Gotta trash the wage workers. So win condition. We're running archives. Yeah, that's legit. It's cataloger respect. Getting these agendas back in the deck is fine because we want them to get off the top with epiphany. 
flip switch that's the tech you want clears tags let alone makes you know another reason not to play thunderbolt so we can gaslight here don't have a huge incentive to do it the question is whether we ice up the holloman we have to watch out starlight knight will now be broken for two credits forever forever it will be two credits oh that's bad so this cost eight and we have to do two advancements so it's 10. let's epiphany and see if we get it we miss we totally whiff <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is bad. Uh, this is really bad. Uh, fundraising and remote server. We need to not draw this. I think we can ice up this, but it'll attract attention. Like, maybe we just build oppo credits. The deck only has two Bologna's, which I think there's a reason to play three Bologna's if you are playing oppo. You just need to get to threat three as fast as possible. And it's actually one of our few tempo positive agendas. Uh, Starlight Knight into Orca is just really bad because we pay five. I just, I think we throw it out. There's some respect to having an unresed ice as like a threat. Gaslighting for hedge would be good. We don't have hedge fund in the deck. We have no economy operations in the deck. He's not checking installs. You can maybe get away with stoke on the table and any next turn. Uh, he's going to check every once in a while. Like every two turns, he seems to check. So it's a hard call to make. You're right. We could maybe take an ambitious play. We have an epiphany here, though, which is good. Mandatory. Shuffle that back. Mavirus. Top rope. Stoke, good. Stoke, server two. No clot. Mind you, clot is a problem. So wage workers, we actually can, we can't triple advance, right? Res, pay four, score. Oh, I wish we had a mess in Chesso here. Hey, Game of Droids, yeah, we're still, we're still going. Hey, you were casting the AMT a bit, huh? Judge Game of Droids, how you doing? I'll advance this. <laughs> So he'll check it. This is where getting just an ice on the table would be worth something. Uh, we can put this out. Maybe he'll check trash this and not that. Maybe. That SDE was one card down. Yeah, I know. A bit huge. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, he's checking everything. Yeah, that was ambitious. In theory, he has to trash the Holloman. So maybe he's going to run everything because he's going to trash things. Maybe we should have seen that. Is that with the Holloman on the table? He has to trash everything. He has to trash this. He didn't trash the Holloman? What? Just chance to do a copy of Doomtown Reloaded. Stumbled across your old April's Fool video when you played it. It was a fun watch. No, Natto. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Doomtown Reloaded's been pretty good. Why didn't he trash the Holloman? All right. Hope. Oh, we knew the top of the deck a bit, huh? So having a spin doctor to the table matters for the cataloger, but he's going to contest it sooner than later. Uh, we don't really want to oppo here. I think a spin doctor is probably better because I'm assuming he's going to cataloger. We might have wanted to do install, 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 then epiphany, but then you can't hollow in. It's only a matter of time before burner really turns this game off. Restore coming up. You can bank on a skateboard trick. Yes, but we don't have any agendas in the bin. I have to give it a shot. Do you still get it to the table? It's been a minute because my partner's been a bit busier. I generally play 1v1. I'm trying to get the expansion, but it doesn't really ship to Canada well, so I might have to bother some American friends. But um, it's been a busy year for other stuff. Mind you, Marvel Champions comes out this week. I totally forgot. New set. Sick. Uh, I think if we trash this, yeah, we have to pop this to bring the other Spin Doctor back. And then I think, like, maybe Oppo? His money's doing good. He's just coasting. So now the problem is like restore doesn't do anything. Unless we put our agenda in the bin. Doesn't Holloman just straight up score the stoke from hand? Uh, install stoke. No, it doesn't. Because Holloman cares about not being advanced. Oh, we lost the Holloman. Yeah, I don't think it does, right? Because like the text on Holloman says... Place two advancement counters. So we install the stoke. Its ability doesn't fire because it was installed from HQ. Then we do Holloman advance. It only gets to three counters. So now here we can thinking. So we could epiphany. Mind you, notice how he's batch trashing. We can epiphany into server two. Try and find an agenda. If we do, we restore the Holloman from the bin. That play, mind you, cost us seven credits. Ugh. Um, seven credits. 
Yeah, not HQ specifically. So it can come from archives. It can come from R&D. I think this is the best we have. I just hope. The thing is, like, federal fundraisings are getting trashed on site, so Epiphany is a bit awkward because you have to just, like, hope. Now, we've been getting an Epiphany counter once per turn. Estabrado Centrals, this is what I mean. What the hell? Like, how are you meant to play around this? You can't. With Cataloger, Estabrado Centrals is just, like, kind of a thing. We're going to lose the Holloman, too, so maybe the worst place to put it. Like, there's no counterplay against Estabrado Central, especially with Cataloger. Like, it's obviously three influence, but is it correct? Yeah, probably. Hollow can get five advancement on a stoke from deck, but only three on a stoke from hand. The difference is two extra clicks a little tricky. Yeah, it's hard. And it's hard that, like, none of those lines really work well with uh, Wage Workers. So we don't have a Spin Doctor on the table. If we did, this play is a bit harder. At least the Cataloger, he's not accessing the Holloman. That's kind of cool. Got a tag, uh, no action. So he could win right now, like steal Bologna, steal two pointer games over. We could have epiphany this card, Beal. Still no action. It's not safer there. Uh, yeah, apparently not. And he accesses it with the cataloger. Oh, good game. Oh. Yeah, the power level between a bad deck and a good deck seems incredibly high. We had a bad draw, mind you. I don't mean to diss the deck entirely. But, like, I, there's not much you can do against Cataloger, is there? Ah, uh, okay. So, at least Cataloger's down. <laughs> yeah, Simpad is Lava Somu. It doesn't really matter when you Estabrado Centrals. Um, so, VSA doesn't do anything. So, we can restore... The hollow in thinking. Okay, so money. The issue too is like if we spend all our money on uh an oppo, of which we don't actually have access to, we do. Oppo's yeah, but I'd argue that oppo was worse for us than him. Like he can just take a whole turn off and clear four tags. We cannot pay seven. Right? Like we oppo, we go down to admittedly we have a Maryland, which is nice, but if we oppo, we go down to what, six? I have a great success losing against catalog or my strategy leaves my opponent stunned. It's a, it's an option. It's definitely an option. But like the difference between catalog and indexing, right? Like it highly incentivizes things like Astrobato. Like you just have to make one run. Heaven forbid you have to run back. Chrysium is a click trade if you're not able to keep them out of R&D. Yes, I agree. Chrysium is really, really good right now. It's really good. You still can like Debrado it, I guess. The fact that you can't break a ping, though, on, like, turn 10. Seems like it's its own problem. So, restore into Holloman. Has a Holloman. We have to go off the top of the deck. If we go off the top of the deck, what can we find? If we find a Bologna, that's one click. We restore a Holloman. Then we can add four. So, that's not good enough. This is where like I like remastered edition a fair bit. Because it actually allows you to do these like really absurd lines. Guess install Rashida ping on HQ and Oppo. I don't think we can survive Oppo. Maybe we can. It's just like, how do we win? No, you can you can suggest for sure. Sticking with Epiphany. Oh, uh, this sideshow, how's it going? This deck was suggested to us. It's like a similar idea to what we do, what we did in our in uh, the deck that we played. We'll try it. I don't think this is a line. I just want to see what happens. Because like going down to six, at least with Rashida Maryland, it's doable. We can throw out an agenda here, which actually means we can restore. But that's not great because we don't have a Holloman on the table. Have a Rashida in server two. Oppo is good. I just think that our opponent doesn't have to deal with the table. Right? Like he's going to win with the second cataloger. Like for sure. The amount of work we have to get to seven points before he just installs a cataloger is like seems to be an issue. So we'll do Rashida first. Oh, what a Maryland. Rashida. Then look at the top three of R&D. So Bologna, Spin Doctor, Bologna. Hmm. I just published a list playing Open Forum to put agendas back on top of the Epiphany. Lots of them. Oh, oh, pouch. That's really cool. That's really cool, honestly. Wait, I'm into that. That's sick. 
Does he have the money to steal Bologna? He probably does, yeah. Maybe actually not. Maybe he doesn't. Okay, so we'll do server two. Server two. And then we have to put this out there. So our goal is to restore the... Uh, I think we can fast events if we restore... Restore four, five... No, we can't even. Oh, I did the math wrong. I think I did the math wrong. Yeah, I don't think we can score it. Tried a similar deck and found I didn't really have credible threats. Runner can either trash all your things or just close the central pressure so fast. Yes, I agree. NBN Valley Assets are hard to make work. I think so when we played this, we had like really wild draws where we closed the game out incredibly quickly with Holloman. Where like we were winning on like turn six or turn seven. Uh, this is the last spin, Doctor. I think we should use it. I think restoring this is not worth it anymore, that we probably have to put it back in the deck. That being said, why would he check it if we shuffle back two unknowns in? So I think we'll do... We'll leave one Holloman in the deck. Maybe Wage Workers is right. Maybe we just need another Oppo. We have one in hand, though. Like, maybe Sudden Commandment Kakarenbo. Let's try that. You can do if you Sudden Commandment the Restore. That's true. Creative. Okay. So... This Bologna, for one click, we can get the thing on it, the Holloman. For two clicks, we can put three advancements. For three clicks, we don't have three clicks. Huh. So how do we score out here? We can't. We, can, we can't never advance a Bologna in this? Wait, what's our game plan here? How do we score out a Bologna from the table? Hey, Nana. Commandment gets you there, I think. We don't have one. Commandment gets us there because we could Commandment Restore, pay four credits. Epiphany the Hollowman? Yeah, it's the same as Restore, though. It doesn't change anything. But if we Epiphany the Hollowman, we have Hollowman. Then we pay four, we advance once. We can only get it to four advancements. We're also going to mill ourselves out eventually. Uh, start over. Okay. Restore agenda. Uh, we threw out our agenda. Oh, sorry. It destroys the Bologna. And we have no more spin doctors. You're right. We could score the Stork the Embers if we restore the agenda. But then we have a Bologna in the bin. Like, this clearly is a Bologna. I think it's the only play we have. Like, maybe Analyze Chris doesn't see it. Wait, can we use Stoke the Embers to Fast Advance in another server? Wait, what? Yeah, but then this is on the table. Hey, Jester, I'm on Cali testing. Epiphany the Holloman that does... Oh, how do we do this? Stoke the Embers? Don't overrate the Blown Up? Yeah, what are we doing with this, though? How do we score both? How do we score both? I don't, I don't know how it is, Pouch. I can't figure it out. Thinking... So we store the Stoke the Embers, it puts an advancement. Restore the Holloman and Epiphany a second one. So we restore the Stoke the Embers. On an, I'm going to trust you, Pouch. I'm going to walk new remote server. And so we put the advancement on Bologna, right? Chat delay. Epiphany the Hollow. Wait, wait, yeah, but we're putting the advancement on the Bologna? Oh, we're fast advancing this? Oh, yeah, 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 that, that works. That works. I thought we were going to score the Bologna with and this for some reason. Epiphany, Hollow. We know the Beals coming up. Problem is we still have to score a uh, Bologna to win. Which we can do. We actually could have advanced the uh, ice to maybe play around Mesa Chesvo. Yeah. Uh, but now he has to run this, which I think he's able to do. But if we advance something else, we can always shift the Holloman over. He's going to trash the Holloman, though. Discard down to five cards. Uh, I'll get rid of the cheap trashables. And Rego? Yeah, putting the advancement on the Balloon actually might have been wrong. Because if he doesn't trash the Holloman, we could shift it over. Do three, one, one. He's going to trash it. 
maybe that stops him from trashing the Bologna as well. But we actually can't score at the Bologna. It's your respect, respect. <laughs> so we have to epiphany the third Holloman off the top of the deck to have a win here, right? Yeah, we can win here. We have to epiphany the, the Holloman. Do you have some mod add-on that's showing the hidden cards in your game log? Yeah, Sinlacial, how's it going? Jinteki doesn't do it. There's a plugin called Cyberfeeder that Rahi, she made for um for Firefox. You can search Cyberfeeder Jinteki, it'll find you it. Stoke advanced something, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have a chance of winning. We shouldn't shuffle the Maryland back. Do we know wait, we know the top of the deck. We should shuffle the Maryland back. Because we know the top of the deck is Messinchesville Project Beal. How is he bringing he'll break a ping by turn 14, I think. I hope. So mandatory draw, we're not shuffling Maryland back because then we can federal fundraising. Maryland, no. Oh, yes, because we want to see new cards. Yeah, 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 yeah. The answer is yes. Look at the top three. Not a Holloman, but we still could. So we do Mesna Chesvo. We want to draw that. Rashida, Maryland, Mesna. Done. Draw one. Okay. Yeah, it's only Firefox right now. Is there a chance of mods coming to Chrome? You'd have to ask Rocky. I think she said she was considering it, but she d develops for Firefox. So if Epiphany hits here, the Holloman, we get it. Damn. <laughs> that would have been sick, though. Did he trash something on his turn? I don't think he did. No. This is where getting a fork would be good. So do we just hold formation? Wait, can we Epiphany again? No, it's not enough. Oh, he trashed Holloman. You're right. Huh. Can we afford this? Probably. F it. Fork. Generated fork. Fork successfully generated. Don't forget the advanced Bologna. No, no, no. We're going to top deck it. Either we win on shipment or we lose here. We don't have to advance this. If we don't advance this, it's not a Bologna. Like now he just draws, installs a lot of Somim and runs and we lose. Like that's the issue. But if he misses, we can uh, shipment this. Mind you, Estebrado is only centrals. We might have this. Uh Oh, oh, that's, that's good to see. He can clear two tags. He can't clear three. Oop. Ah, I think we won. I think we won the game. Throws at Airblades. Throws at that. I'm not going to do anything. All right, we got this. GG. The mighty ping. Did you have another? So burner would have messed us up because burner had a chance of putting that into the bottom of the deck. That's a problem. Uh, that's definitely a problem. If we looked at the top of our deck, would we found a uh, Holloman? No, it's the last card in the deck. That, just, that will just happen. Uh, but if burner happened, we could have lost. Obviously, the Bologna steel could have lost. So there's a bunch of ways that Chris could have won that turn. 2x perk, 2 lobby left yet. Ah, oh, bummer. If we simply played two false leads as an operation, 15 or 16 hollow, uh, res all, neither. Just, just garbage. Hoping to epiphany for the last hollow. Uh, yeah. Unless I top deck, uh, hollow. Hey, you, thanks, you too. Yeah, there's like a bunch of lines that Chris had out there, right? Like, burner would have been a problem. Catalog or getting through R&D somehow, like, Estebrado wins the game. Uh, because there's Beals on top. So there's a bunch of ways that we could have lost from that board state. We got a bit fortunate there. But yeah, he didn't draw a functional breaker. When you spark for your Orca, it feels pretty bad. That's for sure. If you are not playing, well, even Kit. Padma didn't matter, right? Like, Padma fired once, maybe? On a cataloger, I guess? Which actually did matter. The third axis on the Padma stole four points. Yeah, wild. Really wild. Okay, it did a thing. I haven't seen the commandment combo. We messed up our early tempo too by commandmenting, which we definitely shouldn't have. Let's give it a shot. Hey, it's Fixby. Essa. 
Okay, that could be tricky. I saw a lot of people playing Essa yesterday, and Essa didn't specifically get new cards. Thanks, you too. Uh, but I, I played in a fair bit of Essa. So Essa, Spin Doctor on the table is fine. We need to ping on HQ. This hand is just good enough. Restore and Kakarendo, mind you, like this is where playing three Restore and playing Cohort is really good because you can use face down, weaponize face down cards. The question is, do we do ping on HQ? I think we do. Just put things on the table. Whatever fix be, he can trash. He can trash. Epiphany counters. I'm not worried about finality. You can't really play around it. Fitting a predictive in the deck would be nice. Yeah, it slots for sure. Um, I think I would really just like value having more playable cards and more board saves with Sudden because Sudden seems like a brick. Okay. So a bit of a tempo clear there. How's Epiphany treating? Yo, Jeff, how's it going? Uh, okay, we played against Chris and we squeaked out a win. Sorry for spamming chat. Not at all, Pouchy. I have to apologize. How are you doing, Jeff? Jeff, by the way, I got your audio and like... I don't know. It was, it was, uh, the audio was not great. It was like echoey. I really liked the audio you sent me. That last audio was like, did you do something different? I had to end up using my audio, which actually sounds really good, but I feel bad that you did all the effort and then we're just like, sorry, I'm going to use my own. As it seems good when people don't know how to pilot the corp decks yet. Yeah. S is like the aggro deck, which is good when people are starting things out. So I don't think we not need an oppo. A VSA and a wage workers is good. Okay. When I added two Gaslight, I probably could have wanted down to one Sudden since it's a combo piece. Yeah, I think that might be a good idea is play one fewer Sudden. And just having an Econ card here would be fun. Uh, okay, so we should probably Ice of R&D. A second Ice here matters if it's like Botchless Chastushka. Getting Chastushka, I'm not that upset because we have a Spin Doctor and some like bad cards in our hand for this board state. This on R&D seems fine. I don't want to show the Wage Workers. I'll just click for credit. I thought I solved the Echo. It was super echoey. Yeah, I feel like maybe you exported the wrong thing, but it was like, like normally when I get your footage, yeah, this is what we're worried about, Shastushka. Oh, legwork. Oh, that's not good. Do we spin doctor? They can't steal Bologna. I think we do spin doctor. It's unlikely for this to be worse for us. Yeah, we made it better for us. Commandment, you can trash that if you want. Turns on Epiphany, right? Yeah, it's not installed card. It's just a card. That's cool. Yeah, but it was fine, Jeff. It totally turned out fine. Starlet. Okay, one more. Oppo. Lucky. Got lucky. Now they should probably trash the Spin Doctor, which will let him trash it, which means we turn on Epiphany. Uh, Ghost Dung. I don't love installing Sabotage cards when there's Spin Doctor on the table for, you know, reasons. We lost him a virus, that's fine. That was a boomerang, right? Yeah, it was a boomerang. Okay. Why's my phone going off? Seems fine. All right, another federal that's sick. Even with federal, we know what we're sabotaging there. I think we knew that was a virus, so worth keeping in mind. This is very important. Shipping from Vladisibirsk, we have the oppo, but we haven't had a trash yet. I don't think we want to draw that. Holloman Rashida seems really good. So the question is, what do we ice up? We can do a triple install this turn. So we can do res wage workers, go down to two, install Rashida, install Holloman, install Starlet, click for credit. I think that's fine. We don't have a much ice to res or stuff, money to res or stuff. They don't exactly know that this looks like a ping, uh, but I'm okay. Whatever happens here, I think. And obviously Holloman out here, you think why not? I think Rashid is more important. Whoa, what happened there? Did you see that? But now there's a lot of stuff on the table to trash and still you have to contest Spin Doctor sooner than later. I think Fix really here wants, you know, economy events. So top of the deck is... Uh, Nice. Okay. So I think we can probably haul him in here if we needed to. We don't have Epiphany yet. We'll do Rashida first, usually. Kakarembo. Whoa. Look at the top three. So we can draw Bologna, Messinchesso, Regolith. Okay. Messinchesso is going to be hard to deal with. Starlight Knight's not a great remote ice, but a ping in front of Starlight Knight is actually like kind of interesting. Getting our money up so we can do nonsense seems pretty good. And if we sabotage, we can get the Bologna in the bin, which means on the following turn, we can like do the Kakarembo combo, kind of. Uh, so I'll put Rego, Mesno, Bolono, and then we'll do that. Okay. I did that wrong. I wanted to not have the Bologna in hand. Is that worth fix fixing? Yeah, it is worth fixing. Sorry, I messed that up. Yeah, Jeeves is doing work. Jeeves is out there. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Mandatory draw. Uh, Rashida first. Top three. So wrong order. 
So reg is on top, done, nice, thanks. Okay, so we want to triple install again. I went 2-1-1 with the Pivoting or CO last week and Cohort is so good in the deck. I love Cohort. I wonder if people are going to trash it. Um, cohort is really, really fun. It's cool that it has a nice home. So we have a Hollow Man there. So we don't have the Epiphany counter. We can Kakarenbo, but Kakarenbo Hollow Man doesn't work, unfortunately. Like you need the um, the Sudden Commandments. So we want to put three on the table. We can also just put Stoke behind a Mess and Chespo, which is actually probably defensible. Just click for a credit, I think. Yeah, probably. I like the Arden Cohort. It's uh it's frightening one. It's Ollie, right? Ollie Bolidor. It has a nice color to it. It's pretty color. Spin Doctor, you can trash Spin Doctor. We know the top is Bologna. But I'm gonna force you to Epiphany. There's the marrow. So we can sabotage from the top of the deck. I don't think we need a shipment. We don't need this Holloman. Bologna is safe on the top. Like federal fundraising is super important because now we know what we're sabotaging. We know these cards. I don't think this is worth checking. Every single card here was a card from hand or the top of the deck after we knew it. So that's a hard thing to keep track on JNet, but do keep that in mind. So mandatory draw, uh, federal will fill our hand. Look at the top three. So we'll put blown in hand. I think we want the Rashida more than the gaslight. Actually, gaslight's really good because it gets our Kakarembo combo. So we'll do Rashida. Gaslight Bologna will draw. And then we can do Quad Advance. Score. Stoke on the Mess and Chesso. Choose one card of trash from hand. So what's the top of the deck again? It's a Rashida. Uh, that's the worst card. So now we don't know the top of R&D. If there's like Boomerang, just douche guy stuff. We should get a second ice on HQ. We're drawn, I think, four of like nine ice in the deck, though. So it's a bit hard from here. Oh, imp, sick. We have my viruses. Wage workers going down makes sense. It's another epiphany. We don't know the top three with epiphany. I don't think we purge out an imp. Yeah, you want to trash multiple things. That's good. Good for them. He's doing good. So now we just push out the balloon, I think. I don't think we do any nonsense. Oh, another sheet of sick. So here I think we two Bologna in the remote server. We have to install advance advance. We don't have to with Holloman. So we could do Bologna, Rashida, and an, an iced. Just keep the tempo going. Credit? We could get a regular that. I like keeping cards in hand though. We need to advance this. Otherwise, we have to do Holloman. Holloman does three, four, five, but it's very expensive. I think we'll just take a credit. If we do Gaslight, what we're getting into, like eventually it does matter because we can do Sudden Commandment into Kakarembo to win, uh, to steal the score the last Beal. We also have an Epiphany there. We might have just wanted Epiphany for knowledge. That's probably fine. You don't need to imp this. Fixby's on zero credits. Love it. Can't contest much. He should check this. He should imp this. That's fine. Our money is more important here. Okay, he is okay money too. So we have a Beal. So unfortunately here we have to like. Just keep him busy, like advance, advance, gaslight. Maryland will shuffle back in. That's fine. We don't have a spin doctor on the table. We might see like boomerang chestushkas within economic viability. But Mr. Chesso is hard. Mind you, it doesn't end the run if you can't spend the credits. He's struggling a bit. Now, like, if he just wants to, like, send Finality, it's a bit tricky because you're not threatening Bologna. But we were just keeping stuff on board, thinking, desperately thinking, yeah, no worries. Hey, take your time. So we don't have to crack Gaslight here. We could. I'd argue we could. And then with Gaslight, we want to go get Sudden Commandment. And then we can do Sudden Commandment into Kekarenbo, uh, and then advance the Beal from hand. So we can Fast Advance next turn. From enter, that's fine. So do we gaslight here to just make sure we have a sun commandment? I don't think we do because we discard. <laughs> that's not it. Uh, we will shuffle it back in. Another Beal. Okay, game point. Choose one to trash. Uh, we're going to go, I think the regolith. Just play safe. So he really has to crack the fermenter here to do something. It's just hard to do everything while also like trying to deal with Beal. Or trying to steal Bologna, sorry, from the bin. It's 
Uh, that's a bummer. We needed that. We probably could have cracked that, actually, let's be honest. We should have actually cracked that on the last turn, because I forgot we were going to sabotage the marrow. So we just lost our win condition. Arguably, though, we can just put a Beal in the remote server. We can even oppo at the same time, which we don't really have the punishment for it. So with Kakarembo, we can get any card from our hand on the bin with two advancements on it. So in theory, we could pay a lot of money to like... Oh, no. Yeah, I think we just put this in server four. Let's draw once. Just keep him busy. We could consider doing like a two credit oppo. That actually might have been correct because it makes Starlight Knight end the run. So he requires two breakers here. I actually kind of like that better than Wage Workers. That we do install, draw, oppo for two. Or just install Wage Workers, install this, oppo for two. Wage Workers just keeps him busy. It's not the most important. And even on the table, like this represents a Holloman. He has one click left here. I think we have it. Yeah, that should be that. Yeah, just score behind two ice, I guess. Sometimes it's hard for this deck, right? To get real breakers down. Air Blades. No Banhar yet. That's it. Oh, we could have Epiphany too, actually. We could have Epiphany for Holloman, potentially. We could have installed Beal Epiphany for Holloman. No, it doesn't do it. Hey, good game. Good game. Yeah, 23 to 29 credits. Like, pretty low value game, I guess. Turn 10. Yeah, uh, federal fundraising is super, super important. Hey, thanks for... Hey, cheers. That's super important for Sabotage. Because if we know the top of R&D, the Sabotage is half as impactful. Is this what I'm playing? Does anyone have a good recommendation? Again, I have a GNK. It's a casual event. There's a bunch of players coming in. this like their first tournament of decks we can play that will be fun. I need to close the stream in about half an hour. Uh, there's some really cool stuff on NarrowingDB. Mind you, AMT was this weekend, which is sick. Mind you, you can check out the VOD for as it's long there up to um, <laughs> Grug Grid. What was CDD playing in NAND PC? This is probably that. Cohort Asa is sick. I haven't tried it yet, Jeff. I haven't built it, but tribute to Cohort Asa with like Restore uh Holloman seems really cool. Check out the various NPC decks. Yo, Arizon, how's it going? I don't want to spoil the results because we're putting the video up on the channel, but I think we'll be spoiled. Have you seen the King Making Superconducting Hub as Mari? No, I haven't, Izzy. Is it posted somewhere? Holloman op. Holloman op is like a bit straightforward. It's just like good stuff op with Holloman in it. I feel like that's not the sort of deck I want to bring, maybe. Because you play against a new player, just like what happened. Wizard Stable stabs the president. That deck is like apparently surprisingly good. It was in QTM match stream we did yesterday. Yo, I haven't been checking out the QTM YouTube channel. They got second to see on the UK. Oh, that's really cool. I don't think I've seen a Nuvim deck that I think is cool yet. I think it's going to take a while. Win with words. Okay, SIDS. Is this going to be cohort? Oh, this is what I wanted it to be. Yeah, cohort. Active policing, corporate hospitality, fully op, managarm, tributary. This is what I want. So this is not Holloman. Influence is cohort, tributary, spin doctor, powers that be. And it's floating one influence. Cool. Jai's Nuvim deck is cool. Nice rush list. Yeah, let's check it out. I, I know I opened it. And I, I, uh, I don't know. Nuvim. Nuvim. Apparently it's Nuve or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I've lost to the deck like this. Big deal. I don't know if it was like somebody testing out and smurfing and stuff like this. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I want to play big deal ever. Fair Honest Netrunner? Yeah, sort of. Sort of. As much as like Advanced Blice Honest Netrunner. It seems so straightforward though, like to the point of being, you know. Oh, let's do the pronunciation guide actually. That's sick. Oh, thank you, Izzy. Okay, let's look at the pronunciation guide. King making Asmari, Border Control Brawn, Ping, Mesta, Piranhas, which makes sense because we're on Hub. Bologna King making Hub. That's a cool agenda suite. You still have to do a lot of work to score out. Government subsidy Hedge Fund Predictive, Holloman. So it's just saying that like Holloman and Piranhas is good enough to break. That's kind of neat. One seamless. Obviously, Holloman is seamless. This is surprisingly spelt. I I'll give that a shot, I think. Okay. Pronunciation guide without rehearsal. Rebellion. So. It's here. What I found out you can do is that you can actually, I can't do it on stream because my audio is not set up, but you can actually copy paste this stuff into uh, into uh, like IPA pronunciation guides and it'll actually tell you how to sound. Like you'll hear someone say it, which is fantastic. We very like to thank Igor Rayats, Masarentas, Tosias, Gustavo V, Vacholoto, Kelly, Michael Withington, David Withington, and Locks are helping us with pronunciation guide. Okay, cool. So these are some of the names, not always titles, but let's go through this to make sure we're on the same page, which is sick. Firstly, Sebastio Souza Pessoa is Sebastiao. Sebastiao. 
Sauza, Sauza, Pisua. Pisua came up before in the pronunciation guide. Pisua. Pretty cool. Boitada is, everyone thinks it's Boitada, it's Boitada. This one, yes, it's Aguaceras. Aguaceras, not Aruceras. Aguaceras. Great, fantastic. If you're hearing this and you can give me pronunciation help, let us go. This one's interesting. I've heard, yeah, this is a point of contention, this DE. Manuel Latish, la, no, so not Lates, Latish Gimaura. So this sort of Mao is like the same like the Sao. That it seems to be in Portuguese, you get a lot of the sounds, ao, mao, sao, you get that. So it's Manuel Laches Gimaura, Gimaura, kind of like a maverick, it's meant to be Maurich. Very similar idea, Maurich, Maura. Jechino, I feel like at this point we've got that one down from brute force from the community, which is sick. Uh, Jechino, fantastic. Maladraje. So the soft M shows up on a couple things like Nuvum as well and Labesomum. You don't actually say the soft M. It gets into this like je sound, like jeng. I don't know how hard you hit the G on it. Apparently it's to some amount of hardness. Maladrajen. Maladrajen. I don't know if it's jeng or... Do you say jeng? I guess you do. Maladrajen. Fantastic. Julie, no surprise. Murela Lee. Relatively straightforward. And then it's Labi Zomen. So the same way that you get Mao, you get like this lo this big O. I think it's Zo, right? Labi Zomen. Labi Zomen. Cool. This is great. Pretty Mary de Silva. Silva. Not Silva. As much as like this name you could anglicize, I reckon people would be like, okay, that's the same name. Garotinha. So Garotinha, that's the name. Mind you, that just means like it's a apparently a cute abbreviation for uh, I think a female name, uh, which is what Pretty is calling Arasana. Garocina shows up in the flavor text. This one can figure it out. Valencina, Valenci, so not a T, you got a CH. Same thing with Garocina. Valencina, Fajera, so not Ferreira, Fajera. Carvalho, this is like, this throws me for a loop. Carvalho, that's a horse. Isn't Carvalho a horse? It's Carv what does Carvalho mean? Portuguese to English. Oak, not horse. How do you say horse? Cavallo. Okay, never mind. Fine. Casador, not cachador. Casador. Boto is boto. Janaina, J.K. Dumont, Kindlane. So Janaina, Janaina, Dumont, which I'm assuming is French. Uh, Kindlane. Okay. And Nuvum. It's not Nuvum. It's nu. What is how? What? Noven. Noveng. What is this meant to be? New? I'm assuming that's new. New Veng? New Veng. How hard are we hitting this G here? New Veng. Wow. And Liberdade, Liberdade. Damn. Okay. It's going to take us a while to get this down. Liberdade? Botto uses an U sound, so you missed that. Botu. Oh, you're right. Botu. Yeah, good shout out. It's a two. Like two. Botu, not Botto. But you, it's sounding French the more I say it. Um, sick. Yo, this stuff is awesome. I love this stuff a lot. As much as possible, we're gonna try and say the names the way that we want to. I get like you can anglicize names for sure. It's gonna happen. But as much aquasera sounds so much cooler than araceras. Araceras. Okay. Caballo is horse in Spanish. Yeah, right. In French too, caval. Right, caval. No, that's Slovenian. What's French horse? Horse in French? What's horse in French? It's cavallo, right? Cheval. Oh, mate. Of course. Bien sûr. Let's try this. This seems really cool. I wonder how long the games are going to be in this, though. This seems like it'll be a long deck. King making is Mari. Cheval. Grand Cheval. New corp deck as Marie. King making. As Marie, as Mari, paste. Okay, let's go. We have only 14 nights, mind you, we are only on a 44 card deck. So uh, the ratio is only slightly below what I think is like mid rangey. I think you're expecting 15. Yeah, maybe 14 is actually right because you're playing generally 17 and 49. Uh, maybe slightly lower than we think. This deck is fun. Love me some quick NBA. I wonder how quick it is. Like, that's the thing that I don't know. How quick is it? Lat. Okay, cool. Uh, what do you call against Lat? Still program, right? Or sorry, event. This hand. We have hedge fund. Wow, we have Yodel. I guess that makes sense. We're on hub. 
Uh, what is our economy asset that we want to stick on the table? We don't have one. Normally, there's like something for the remote server, like a regolith or a daily quest. Apparently, this is just figure out how to score out. Uh, okay. I think we're equipped to do that. Money and hydrate already seems fine. Yeah. So like, are we going to get Bernard? Let's draw another ice. That's a good ice. Okay. Thanks, you too. Someone in an area with no real representation of any romance language, no Latinos, and generally very little linguistic diversity aside from Asian Americans is going to be a real hurdle. Yep, it's going to be hard. We'll do it. We'll do our best. Okay, so we can't respect Hydra on turn one. Like, we can't really res Hydra. Mind you, this Yodel is three credits. not worth playing. I wouldn't want Hydra on the remote server. I think we can left HQ to be open pretty easily. So our remote server should be Hydra. So we'll put this in numerous server. For, we'll put this in R&D. If you one-shot the blown in HQ, you do it. We'll call event. So even if you burn us, it's not the worst. We got our event credits. Two credits. Let's go. Eventually, Mess and Chess was broken for one with Turbine Buzzsaw. So we'll see how quickly we can jam their mode server. Levo should get Bernard. Yeah, it's okay. It's fine. We'll get two credits for it. On this hand, wow, they drew a lot. I wonder if they're like scared for uh, Neurospike. Like sometimes you just kind of go tilt fast. Daily casts, go and discard cards. Also, we played it on lat by emptying our hand to some extent. So that's good. Let's see what they discard here. That's a lot of cards they're discarding. They went real hard. They're going to be on three credits next turn. They only played one event too, which is the best for us. Deep dive. Okay, that's good to know. Played against this Mario while gunsling with Seb. They called resource every turn. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, okay, I think we'll do Spin Doctor to get another ice, ideally. All right. Server one. It's either Hedge Fund or Piranhas. Piranhas on R&D seems pretty bad on our board state, so we're just going to hope that this doesn't get pinholed to call event. Three cards in hand. Let's go. If we don't draw into our king-making combo, we'll just jam Bologna Swift. Okay, they're fully deep dive. Run HQ can't steal Bologna. Feels okay. Bologna, nice. They could go back for a click if they want. All right. Just don't get deep dove. Draw three. Oh, sh shit. <laughs> we drew Bologna. So, border control in central seems good. It's kind of mid into Swift. Like, it's not that good uh with piranhas we want to clear the tag bad publicity seems bad publicity i think we'll ydl bologna probably wheels and sable yeah i think it's just gonna happen luckily we're holding nine points so like good luck sort of so we ydl i think we just put bologna in server one i don't think they can break a hydra soon and we'll put a piranhas on hq like border control and HQ is obviously kind of good. I'm worried that they're going to focus centrals and not run their remote server. So I don't want to put a border control there, but border control into like, it's just something we can res here. It's obviously not great into Swift uh, and all the other click game they're probably going to have. Like they're probably on Julie and then some sort of run event too, or sorry, run resource like Hannah. DJ Sable as well. Yeah. So next turn, double advance, maybe put a piranhas there. I didn't want to score Bologna as our first. I guess we will. We have a lot of money. They haven't played an event yet. I think we've got an event on every turn. SMC, Cleaver. Okay, border control goes down now for one. It's still worth resing. Dirty Laundry, running archives. Okay. Got our event. They got three, we got two. They did get a click back though. All right, they got their draw as well. I think here we just build a server. Like this might be overextension. We might actually want Braun on HQ. I'm not that worried if they deep dive though. Like they still have to deal with Mesa Chess with SMC. Obviously, boarding control for one's not good, but just resing it so we have the value. If they steal the Blona on the HQ run, obviously we're gutted. Also, like burner just kind of works pretty well when deep dive because you can put the agenda on top of RD, steal it on the way to archives and RD. Like I could see us getting burned pretty hard. Buy a band's archives, two credits for us. Simul chip. We might want to triple advance this. just so that we can score jam. But ideally we score and just hold. We also don't have to score. Double simul chip, overclock. Oof. I think that Hydra is gonna be pretty good. Brian already. So if they want to turbine out, they mind you have 15 credits and they still need five for the blown out. I would be surprised if they can figure out how to get in here. Mind you, Brian's still good. Cause like some shapers here will actually pull a Fizerum and Tangler. They might Fizerum the Hydra. Again, another card that just like bypasses ice. Whoops. But here they probably put a turbine. Yeah, so they still have to break this for four. So now they have five credits. So the Hydra, unless they Fizerum the Hydra, they Fizerum the Hydra, they don't steal the Blown Out, which is fine. So let's see what they do here. I'm glad that they're wasting their money on this instead of Deep Dive. Continue. Action. I'll wait for their priority, because in theory, they could like hush this or whatever. In theory, you should always wait. Okay, Hydra. Res for 10. 
If this hits, we get five back. That's obviously sick. They take a tag. But here they could simulchip Fazerum. I think it's the only way they can deal with this. And they really have an incentive here just to simulchip to get an SMC back on the table before the turn ends. Fire Unbroken, love it. So they have to clear the tag. So they're far behind. Relatively far behind. It's hard to imagine a hard server. Hello from Seattle. Yeah. Esteban, how's it going? How's your Tuesday afternoon? Yeah. So they did that. That's right. I'm poor dead. No, you're good. Yeah, they're playing around this as if this is combo. It's not. So do we just score this out? I think we do. No, you're fine. You're good. But mind you, Holloman is actually really good in his Mari decks on the uh, the line of like kill with uh, Neurospike. I think somebody else published uh, Neurospike as Mari deck. That deck just got much more consistent for better or for worse with uh, Holloman. So they overextended on the basis that they thought they're going to lose the game there, which like, yeah, you do that. So we might just score at three Bolognas and not do anything cool. This is where having a border control here would be pretty okay. <laughs> Lad is like actually like really good into Branas in general. So I don't think we care what happens to this. With Overclock, they actually can run this. We probably should just get another ice on it just so it looks frightening. Uh, do we want to spin Doctor any of these cards back? Yeah, maybe. I ate the blown. I'm thinking about it. It's like, I think they can steal this. Right? Like an Overclock does break this. Echelon comes in at, at like, what? Four strength. So three, four, five, six. This is seven, eight, nine, ten. Like 15. They could actually do this. The question is whether it's an NGO front or something else. Like, I'd rather just, like, draw, put a Hollowman in the remote server and hold for a bit. I don't think this is the sort of play I would normally do. I'll do it for you, actually, though. I think I would normally hold. The game goes long and slow only if you play like that. Yeah, but I think they're going to, like, at some point get impatient and go for the, the deep dive. And when we're holding nine points, we're not that scared of the deep dive. That being said, we could be on game point. And then as soon as we're on game point, uh, having a Hollowman on the table is, like, pretty lethal. As much as they have to SMC claw it. Ooh, the creative click one and two and overclock. There you go. Yeah, they're going to call us on this. Don't think I love this. Yeah. So they creative. We got money. They got money. But yeah, we're going to lose this Bologna. And then they can win in a single deep dive. Not sure I wanted to take this line. I think we should have waited for boarding control. It's just like their deck has so much explosive event-based economy that like it's not hard for them to have the money to contest this. Is it credit perfect? Oh, wait. They have to take a tag here, right? I don't usually play standard, so I don't know the cards well, but couldn't get well if they broke the Braun with clicks. Uh, maybe. There's a chance. They're going to try not to because Braun already is only four credits, and generally three clicks is worth more than four credits to them. Oh, excuse me. That's on me. <laughs> we get IA again. You're probably right. Oh, wait. They did mess up. They can't steal Bologna. Okay. They could have let two subroutines on the Hydro Fire if they're respecting Bologna. Silent chip for SMC. Okay, the whole breaker suite's here, but their money's not good. That worked out for us. Credits are more important now because of the Bologna. Yes, but I'm just saying if they spent the three clicks on their turn, they can probably make more than four credits, right? Like, just play Sure Gamble, Dirty Laundry. It's easier for them to get the money in three clicks. Like, I think just on average, they get more than three clicks. Do you know what I mean? I think fam is still thinking it's Neurospike combo. Uh, yes, I think they are. So they want to play around re-education. Yeah. You're right. Sometimes it's worth it, right? Like Esteban, a lot of board states clicking through it is cheaper than breaking it. And this breaker suite, it's hard for a runner to not make more than four credits and three clicks. Are they a little hosed right now? Uh, it's not good. I think we want to get a Holloman on the table. Even a spin doctor in server one is probably fine. We could maybe IAA the Bologna. I just want to put another ice there. Like top decking a boarding control would be sick. So we have a couple options. We can IAA the Bologna. Third IAA. <laughs> it honestly might be correct. Like this is broken for six. This is broken for four. It's 10. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. If they steal it, I think we're in an okay spot. Yeah, Nuka. They need an overclock here really bad. I think we've got two credits every turn. I think we've got like 16 credits this game for free. The good thing about us jamming this hard is like they can't, it's hard for them to make the game plan about stealing, hitting centrals. Yeah, they overclock. They're going to get this one. Imagine it was an NGO front. That'd be sick. 
Get a hella large scoring window if they steal it. Yeah, if they steal it, we like basically just try and get a. Huh? I don't think they're running it. Uh, you just try and get a, a hollow min in there. There's like no way that you could have three balonas. Maybe the balona now, but I feel like they wasted overclock money, right? Are they running it last click? Are they just setting up? There's like there's no way you have three balonas, right? Oh, okay. Do we do have three balonas? <laughs> Good game. Thanks for the game. You didn't think that was the the third balona, right? Yeah, it's hard to say that's the third balona. No matter what we'd have, we install advance advance. But if it's any agenda, right? Like it's a problem. The only thing there is like NGO front is the obviously bait. And because they spent so much time not dying to Neurospike, which we're not on, they couldn't enact their their uh their multi-access plan. How would you have dealt with this with the Mercury list? Uh the Mercury list for this deck with Asmari is not that bad. Because most of Asmari decks are only on six agendas, so you can actually weather like the, the inside job on HQ is actually pretty bad. Because you can't steal Bologna. Mind you, like that's a really big deal. It's like Mercury inside job steal Bologna is much, much harder. I don't think it would have felt oppressive, but that's because the Mercury does like, look at all the Ice Weave Res. The Ice Weave Res is really good into Melandrige. Bronze really good into Fizerum. None of this stuff gets Melandrige. Admittedly, I mean, Fizerum and Hydro would be bad, bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this one, this one is on ink making. It's a QTM list. Hey, Martin, Triple Bologna. Yeah. Are you coming out tonight? Yeah, like, I want to be clear the Strawman argument about the Mercury game showed, like, the worst possible matchup. It was more so to show that, like, I do think you can make a Mercury deck where, like, scoring on a remote server is really, really difficult. Unless, of course, you play some of the biggest ice in the format. Got my jank ready for tonight. Oh, Martin, I haven't sleeped anything up yet. I, mean, I gotta figure out what it is. Thanks for the game, eh? I have no idea what to play. I have no idea. We're gonna close the stream down, I think, a bit early. Because I have to be somewhere at 5.30. I still have to make dinner and put together a deck. So this might be it. So event starts in 90 minutes. You, you telling me? You tell you think I, I, it's in my neighborhood, but yeah, no, I know, I know. I haven't figured it out yet. Okay, on that note, that's it for today. Thanks so much for hanging out. Sorry I got a bit pessimistic today. It feels like every early <laughs> early in the week, Andre unhappy about never later in the week, he's a bit better about it. But uh yeah. Oh, there's gonna be no stream on Thursday. Of course, I want to give a huge thank you to all these names here that help support the Much Ball Grid. And again, daily cast patrons, your names aren't here, but mind you, you're incredibly appreciated. That's for sure. Thanks for stream. Thank you, Cinderin. Thanks for hanging out, eh? Uh, I'm going to go to an event on today. We'll have, uh, what's it called? A, a tier list starting to come out, I think, next week. We're recording the corpse side with Jeff on Wednesday night, so he'll edit it together, and then we'll have another one uh, after that. Pessimistic streams, best streams. I think I need to pay attention, because if I'm pessimistic, like, I don't know. I know there's an audience here, so, like, I feel really bad. Having an emotional reaction to the thing is good, but listening to Andre and be like, the game is messed up. That's not the point here. So I need to keep that in mind. Like if people think that, like I probably, sh it's not worth even saying. Thank you tonight. If thank you for the stream, see you tonight. Yeah, Martin, see you tonight. It's been a minute. Uh, That's mostly it. There'll be no stream on Thursday. We are just not here, but we'll be back on Tuesday. Mind you, if you have events coming up, my, we had the first events this weekend. If you want to go check out twitch.tv slash null signal netrunner, the VOD for the AMT is up. Shout out to, I believe, Thrantar, Game of Droids, and uh, Eli. They're doing the casting for that. I haven't caught most of it. I saw a couple earlier rounds because it got late in my part of the world. Shout outs to everyone there. Uh, otherwise, we'll be back in a bit. Take care of yourself. Thanks so much for hanging out and hopefully enjoying Rebellion Without Rehearsal. Let me know what decks you're liking. Pay attention to our RDB because it's going to be interesting out there for sure. Thanks for watching.